Hello and welcome all of you to Math 2050 uh, Applied Linear Algebra. Um, I think we'll start off by talking about just what is linear algebra. Um, you actually are familiar with it somewhat. Um, you've had courses in algebra, I'm sure. Um, in general, what we think of in particular for this course is that uh, linear algebra is a study of systems of linear equations. So that begs the question, what's a linear equation? Well, a linear equation is one of this form, um, a1x1 plus a2x2 plus dot 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 anxn equals b. And here, uh, the x's are the variables. Uh, the a's are called coefficients. And b is uh, the right-hand side value. Here, uh, the all the A's and B are typically real numbers and uh, um, then you ask well what's a real number? Uh, well a real number um, is uh, basically you can think of that as any number that you can find on a number line so that includes uh, integers, um, rational numbers, irrational numbers, um, negative numbers, positive numbers, zero, um, just about any number um, or any number you can find on a number line, it's a real number. This is, is as opposed to complex or imaginary numbers. Yeah, those would not be real numbers. So for our purposes, we'll uh, not be dealing with complex numbers. We'll stick to just real numbers. Uh, in, in our equations, uh, the, the linear part means uh, that we don't allow nonlinear uh, expressions of the variables. So terms like x1 squared or x1 times x2, uh, those type terms are nonlinear and so we don't allow those uh, type expressions. So here's a couple of sample linear equations. Um, you know, those are uh, just typical. Um, first one has two variables here. Here's one with three variables. Um, this one, uh, first one, you'll recognize it's got two variables, so that just defines a line in the plane, uh, in the, the x-y plane uh, here. Got three variables, so that actually defines a, uh, a plane in three dimensions. So we'll talk more about that as we go along. Um, so we're back to um, um, what is linear algebra. So we've talked about what's a linear equation. Um, and uh, linear algebra is study of systems of linear equations. So what's a system? Uh, that just means you have multiple equations. So for example, uh, let's go to the drawing board. Here's a system of two equations in uh, two unknowns. And uh, all of you have had uh, college algebra, so you're familiar with a system of this form and uh, you probably learned a couple of different ways to solve this system uh, when you were in algebra and so we're just going to talk about that first off here um, if I asked you how would you solve this system uh, then you might say well I'd use substitution because that seems uh, like a, a, a way to go if you look here You've got uh, the x2 term. You can solve this equation for x2. So let's do that. So from this equation, I can get x2 equals 28 minus 4x1. And then I substitute this expression for x2 back into the first equation. So that gives me 2x1 plus 3 times this stuff here, 28 minus 4x1 and that equals 24. So then I just simplify 2x1 plus uh, 3 times 28 is 84 minus 12x1 equals 24. So that gives me a looks like negative 10x1 equals 24 minus 84 would be negative 60. So it looks like x1 is equal to 6. And then if x1 is 6, we can go back and plug in here to figure out what x2 is. So x2 is going to be 28 minus 4 
times 6. So x2 is equal to uh, 4. So, oops, back up here. So x, ah, oh, do it again. x, there we go, x2 equals 4, x1 equals 6 uh, is our solution. So that's one way to solve this system. Uh, that's using the method of substitution. Um, another method uh, that's sometimes used is uh, to um, go back and look at the system and try to eliminate one of the variables uh, by multiplying uh, one of the equations or maybe even both the equations by uh, a constant and then adding or subtracting one from the other. So um, I'm going to try that method here. So I'm going to multiply this first equation by negative 2. Okay, and I'll just write what I get down here. So negative 2 times 2x1 gives me negative 4x1. And then negative 6x2. And then negative 2 times 24 would be negative 48. And then if I add these two together, these two that I have here, then notice that the x1s cancel out. So they're gone. I've eliminated x1. And here, if I add, I get negative 5x2 equals uh, negative 20. So that says x2 equals 4. And then to get x1, I could substitute that back into either of these equations. And we already know that x1 is 6, so I won't go through that process. Okay, so there we go. We have our solution and that's using uh, the method of elimination. Okay, you systematically eliminate variables. Um, so those are the two methods um, that uh, you probably learned back in um, algebra class for solving this system. Um, let's take a look at um, what we're doing uh, graphically. Let's take a graphical look at it. So I go back to my uh, equations and I draw them on a graph. Let's see if I can come over here. And I'll try to do this. Let's see. All right. So if I graph my equations where this is going to be my x1 axis, this will be my x2 axis. And let's see, if I look at the first equation, if x1 is 0, uh, well actually I'm going to start with this one because uh, if x1 is 0 here, then x2 is 28. So that gets us way up here. So there's 28. So I've got one point right there at 0, 28. Uh, then if x2 is 0, we get x1 equals 7. So I'm going to scoot us over just a little bit to give me a little more room here lengthen this out okay so it looks like let me I want to try to get my scale uh, as best I can so it looks like this would be about seven and so my other point is here at seven zero so I got one line comes like this. Let me see if I can do a better job drawing that. Apparently I'm not going to get a little better angle on that with my computer here. Okay, well that's not very good either. Let's try one more time. Looks like I am not going to be able to make this work. Let's see one more time. Okay, I'm going to just call that good. Let's call this 7 right here. Alright, so then let's do, let's look at the other one. The other equation is, uh, I've got uh, uh, this one. If x1 is 0, it looks like x2 is 8. So that's going to be along about right there. And uh, if x2 is 0, looks like x1 is 12. So that's going to be 
somewhere along about right here. I'm going to try once again, see if I can make a line. Oh, that one's not terrible there. All right, so, um, so this is about seven right there. Let's take that away. All right, so if we look, my scales better be better to see, but along about there, that's the point where those lines intersect. And so that's the point six, four. So my scale was better, it would look better, but you get the general idea. So what we're looking at here is we've got we're, we've got this system and we want to find x1 and x2 that satisfy both those equations. So since each of those equations represents a line, then when we're looking for uh, a point that satisfies both, then that means it's a point that's on both lines, so that's the point where the lines intersect. Okay, so in this example, um, we ended up with a unique solution. All right, a unique solution. That means exactly one solution. Okay, now let's think. Are there any other possibilities? You're all, are, no matter what your system is, you're always going to have exactly one solution. I think you know that that is not the case. Um, so what are the possibilities? If you don't have exactly one solution, um, how about do you have a solution every time? And uh, you probably know that the answer is no. And uh, that happens when you have a situation like this. There's one line, there's another, they're parallel, and so they never intersect. And so in this case, you have no solution. No solution in that case. Okay, so we've got uh, you have zero solutions, you have one solution. How about two? Can you, end up, can you come up with a system where you have two solutions? Let's think on that two solutions. Now in, in my class one day um, I, I had somebody say, well what if you drew another line here? So you had a line like this. Right? Then you got they intersect there, they intersect there, so there's two solutions, right? And uh, the answer is well no because here you've got three lines and so if you were trying to solve a system with these three lines, then that means that you, you need to find a point where all three intersect at the same time. So uh, in this case, there's still no solution because there's no point at which all three lines intersect. Um, I've also had students say, well, hey, what if you had a parabola? So you had a case like this. You know, there's a parabola, you got a line going through it. Look, there they intersect right there, intersect right there, so you got two solutions. Um, now this is uh, legitimate because you got two, two functions and they intersect uh, at these two places. Problem is that this parabola is not a linear function, right? The parabola is a quadratic, right? Not linear. So that case doesn't work either. Um, so it turns out that um, if uh, you don't, if you have a system of linear equations and uh, you uh, don't have no solution, you don't have exactly one solution, then you must have an infinite number of solutions. Okay, so infinite number of solutions. Okay, and uh, in two dimensions that's a little bit uh, tough to come up with a good example. The best you can do is two dimensions it is like one like this where you have something like uh, 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 10 and then maybe 4x1 plus 6x2 equals 20. Now on the surface, it looks like, yeah, you got two, you got a system of equations, you got two equations. Um, but when you go to graph this, what do you find? Well, you find that this is actually the same equation because I wrote it so that the second one was just a multiple of the first. So when you draw it, if you were drawing the graph, whatever it might look like, 
you graph one of the lines and then you graph the other one and it sits right on top of the first one. So that in that case, any point on the line would be a solution and so there would be an infinite number of solutions. Okay, so um, just to recap, let's go back uh, to our slide. Let's go to the next one. Um, so these are your possibilities. A system of uh, equations has either no solution, uh, exactly one solution, which, in which case we say it's a unique solution, or it has an infinite number of solutions. And uh, a little more terminology for you. We say a system is consistent. Okay, consistent's a word we'll use a lot. So a uh, system is consistent if it has at least one solution. So that means either unique or an infinite number, but it has at least one solution. It's consistent. Um, otherwise, we say it's inconsistent. So inconsistent means that uh, it has no solution at all. Okay, so um, I think uh, we'll stop there for this one, and we'll pick up with this uh, on the next uh, video. Okay, we're back now. We're talking about uh, solving uh, systems of equations, and uh, we, we need a systematic method because uh, probably, as you can recall from your days in, in college algebra, um, once you get up to even a 3x3 three three system, then things start to get a little messy. And so uh, we're going to talk now about how to, uh, an, a systematic method, okay, a method that will work no matter what size your system, no matter how many rows, how many columns, or how many variables, how many equations. Um, it's a, uh, an algorithm that will work no matter what. Um, before we do that, I want to go back and look at that system that we were talking about earlier. Um, which I uh, have on my notepad here. Um, so remember, I just want to refresh your memory about what we did there. Um, the second way we, we used to solve this system, if you recall, was we, we decided to multiply this equation by negative 2, and then we uh, added that to the, the second equation. So let's just go through that quickly again. So we end up with negative 4x1 minus 6x2 uh, equals negative 48, right? And then we added that, so the x1's canceled out. Um, then we ended up with negative 5x2 here equals um, negative 20. So x2 is equal to 4. And then um, we didn't actually do it because we'd done it before, but I'll go through. At this point, to find x1, you have to plug back in. You can plug into either one. Let's just go back to the first one. First equation, we'll have 2x1 plus 3 times x2, and we know that x2 is 4, so we plug that in. Equals 24, so we get 2x1 equals... Uh, looks like 12, so x1 equals 6. So there's our solution that we found uh, in the previous uh, video. Um, to do this uh, in uh, a systematic way, we set up a matrix. Okay? And a matrix is just uh, a, a, a rectangular array of numbers. Okay, So in this case, uh, we would be interested in this matrix, okay, where I take the coefficients. Right, and so I just write it like that. So the first row here represents the first equation. Second row represents the second equation. Um, this matrix is uh, called an augmented matrix. And it's called augmented because um, it, um, it has this uh, right-hand side column included. Um, a lot of times we're only interested in this matrix, which we call the coefficient matrix, since it coefficient. Remember, think about how to spell that. Uh, since it includes only the coefficients of the variables, so that's coefficient matrix. If we augment or add on the right-hand side, then we get the augmented matrix, which is this one. 
And this is actually the one that uh, we'll work on most of the time when we're solving. If we want to solve a particular system, then we would uh, work with the augmented matrix. Now, what do we do with the augmented matrix? Well, it turns out that there are um, three row operations, three operations in our toolbox that we can perform on this matrix in order to solve the system. So to do that, let's go back to our um, slides here. And uh, here we'll talk about our elementary row operations. So number one is to interchange or swap two rows. So that since a row in a matrix represents an equation, that just means we're reordering the equations, which as you know has no effect on uh, the solution. Uh, we could also multiply all the entries in a particular row by a non-zero constant. No, uh, you can't multiply by zero because that would be essentially throwing out that equation and that wouldn't work, but you can multiply by any non-zero constant. And the other is Sounds kind of complicated, but uh, it's really not. And really, this third one is the one that you'll do 99% uh, of the time. Okay, and it is the replacement operation. It's where you replace one row by the sum of itself, and uh, oh, that should be a multiple of another row. Um, so you replace one row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row. Uh, it's an error right there. Um, so let's talk about how you do that. Let's go back to our example. Okay, and, and that operation is actually what we did here. If you go back and look, we replaced, uh, you can think of it as we were replacing the second equation by the sum of itself and a multiple of the first row. Okay, so we multiply the first row took a multiple of the first row, added it to the second. And so we ended up with this new equation right here. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing except in matrix form. Okay, and I like to use a shorthand when I'm doing these operations. Um, and so for the replacement operation, I write it like this. I'm going to multiply negative 2 times row 1 and add that to row 2. Okay, so negative 2 times row 1 added to row 2. Now this doesn't change row 1, so I'm just going to write that just as I normally would. Not, no change there. But row 2 is going to change. So I'm going to multiply each entry in row 1 by negative 2 and add it to the corresponding entry in row 2. So I got negative 2 times 2 is negative 4 plus 4. That gives me 0. So I've eliminated x1 from this row. Then negative 2 times 3 is negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5. Okay, so just a reminder there. How did I get that? I multiplied negative 2 times 3 and added it to 1. So negative 2 times this entry plus 1. Then I did the same thing in the third column. So I get negative 2 times negative 24 is negative 48 plus 28 is negative 20. So here I get negative 20 and just to make that clear that's negative 2 times 24 plus 28. Okay and so you can see if you wrote out the equation that corresponded to this row it looks exactly like this equation here that we ended up with. All right. And so at this point, now I have in my second row only one variable, and so I can solve. So I would say, okay, from row 2, I get negative 5x2 equals negative 20. So that means x2 equals 4. Okay, just like I did before. And then we do something. Let me get a little more space here. Then we... Um, do a process called back substitution. Okay, and that just means um, you back up to the next row and you substitute. So if we back up to the next row, then that would be backing up to the first row. And there I've got 2x1 
plus 3x2, but now I know what x2 is. It's 4, so that's the substitution part. Okay, so I plug that in, equals 24, and we know that we end up with x1 equals 6 at this point. Okay, so here we've solved the system um, using elementary row operations and then using back substitution. Um, let's see, just one more note on why this is okay to do this. Um, let's go back to our slides. Um, a little more terminology for you. Uh, we say two matrices are row equivalent if there is a sequence of elementary row operations that transforms one matrix into the other. So the way I usually say that is they're row equivalent if you can get from one to the other by doing elementary row operations. Okay, doesn't mean they're equal. Row equivalent does not mean the matrices are equal. It just means that you can get from one to the other by doing elementary row operations. Okay, and then here's the, the clincher. That's why this works, okay? So remember our goal is to solve a system. And um, so uh, we need to know that when we do these row operations, we're not changing the uh, solution or those solution set. Okay, and so this statement uh, gives us that assurance. It says if the augmented matrices of two systems are row equivalent, then the two systems have the same solution set. So that means we can start off with one matrix, we can do row operations, and uh, get to another one that we can solve easily, and uh, know that the solution that we get based on the, the last matrix is will be the same for the first one. So that's why we can do these row, row operations in order to solve a system of equations. Um, this leads us to, to two questions. Um, the first one uh, is, is the system consistent? Okay. Does it have at least one solution? And uh, if that's so, okay, if it's consistent, then uh, is that solution unique or are there an infinite number of solutions? So we'll talk about how to determine, number one, is the system consistent? And number two, um, if it is, then how do you know if there's a unique solution or an infinite number of solutions? Okay, we're going to stop here. And uh, I'll do one more uh, video that has uh, some problems uh, worked out for you. So that'll be next. Okay, now I want to do a few uh, uh, sample problems from section 1.1 of uh, the textbook. So first, let's look at number 14. So in the problem, they're giving you a system of equations and asking you to solve it. So I've already got it here in... Um, in the augmented matrix form. And so uh, we just need to do elementary row operations in order to try to solve the system. So uh, the first thing we want to do is make sure that up here in the 1-1 one, one position, that's the first row, first column, we've got a non-zero value if possible. Well, it's already non-zero, so we don't need to do anything. If this had been a zero, we would want to swap rows in order to get a non-zero value here. Okay, but we already have one, so then we can next turn our attention to creating zeros in the column below this leading entry. Okay, a leading entry is the first non-zero value in a row, so we want to create zeros below it. So we need to create a zero in this position here. So we need to figure out what uh, do we multiply by this one and add to negative one to get zero. And clearly, uh, we just multiply by one or don't multiply by anything. Just need really just need to add the first row to the second, and that will give us a zero here. So, uh, so I'm going to add row one to row two. Now that does not change row one, so I'm just going to repeat it here. And it doesn't change row three. Okay, so now row two, we've got our zero there. 
then we'll have negative 3 plus 1 gives us negative 2. 0 plus 5 is 5. And 5 plus 2 gives us 7 here. All right. So now we've got our leading entry. Zeros below it. We're done with that column. So we move on to the next column and down a row. So we want a non-zero element here, which we already have. And uh, normally we would just want to zero out below it. But given uh, that um, we have a 1 here, that's kind of a nice, uh, nicer number to work with. So, the, so I'm going to actually swap rows 2 and 3 at this point. Swap. Row two and row three. And so row one doesn't change. And row knee row two is the old row three. And the knee row three is the old row two. Alright, so I got that. Now this the reason I did that was because I this just makes the uh, arithmetic easier and I don't have to deal with fractions. Otherwise, if I left the negative 2 there, I'd have to figure out, you know, what do I multiply by this to add to 1 to get 0? And I would have to carry that out through the, the rest of that row. So this is just easier arithmetic-wise. So now I've got a 1 here, and I need to 0 out underneath it. So I need to multiply by 2 and add to negative 2 to get a 0 here. So my next operation is 2 times row 2 added to row 3. Okay, so row 1 again doesn't change. Row 2 doesn't change. And row 3, let's get my 0 there, and I'll get 2. Look over here, 2 times 1 plus 5 is 7. Then I've got 2 times 0 plus 7 is 7. Okay, now at this point, I'm done with the second column, and I move over, and I'm done, I'm done with the matrix because now in the third row, um, I've eliminated all the variables except for 1. So from the third row, I get 7x3 equals 7. So I can solve for x3. It's going to be 1. And then I do the back substitution. All right, so that means back up. So I back up to the second row, which looks like if I write down the equation corresponding to the second row, be x2 plus x3 equals 0. But I know what x3 is, so I plug that in. And I've got x2 equals negative 1. Okay, then I back up again to the first row. The first row, that equation looks like x1 minus 3x2 equals 5. I know what x2 is. Plug that in. So a little more room here. And so I get x1 is equal to, let's see, that's a plus 3. So we're going to over minus 3, so it would be 2. So x1 equals 2. x2 equals negative 1. x3 equals 1. There's a solution to my system. Okay, so this uh, system here had a unique solution. Just one. All right, let's, uh, let's go on and look at another homework problem. This time I want to go to um, number 12. Okay, so still in section 1.1, problem number 12. Well, actually, before we do that, let's, uh, let's, do, let's look at one thing. Before we do that, let's look at one other thing. Um, suppose I have a system that looks, uh, looks like this. 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 10. And uh, how about 4x1 plus 6x2 equals 12. Now if, if you examine that a little bit, you're going to see 
um, that to get this second equation, I just multiply the first one by 2, right? So 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 3 is 6. But then I didn't multiply this by 2. Or actually, I did, and then I didn't want to get this, that same value, so I changed it. So just based on that analysis, uh, it seems that this system should have no solution, right? And if you were solving it uh, using elimination, say, right, maybe you'd multiply, maybe you didn't notice that it's not going to have a solution, so you're just uh, merrily going along your way solving it. So if we multiply 3 by negative 2, we're going to get negative 4x1 minus 6x2 equals negative 2 times 10 is negative 20. Then we'd add that, and here we get 0. Here we get 0. So on the left, we've got 0. And on the right, what do we have? Negative 8. Well, 0 can't equal negative 8, right? So this is what tells us that this system has no solution. Okay, we get to this point where we have 0 on the left, and something not zero on the right. Okay, you've got a non-zero value over here on the right. Okay, so so if we had if we had thrown that into a matrix, we, it would look like this. Right, so we do one row operation, same one we did up there, negative 2, row 1 plus row 2. Right, so row 1 doesn't change. And row 2, get negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, plus 4 gives us 0. Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6, plus 6 gives me 0. Negative 2 times 10 is negative 20 plus 12 is negative 8. All right, so if you look at this, we're the same thing, right? We've got all zeros. And over here on the right, we've got something that's not zero, okay? This is the marker that you look for to indicate no solution. Okay, all zeros on the left, something not zero on the right. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're going to be using that all semester. Okay, so now let's go to number 12. Okay, still in section 1.1. .1. So number 12, 1, negative 3, 4, negative 4. Three, negative seven, seven, negative eight, negative four, six, negative one, and seven. Okay, and this is an augmented matrix. So we start, we do our row operations. So we look, we've got a non zero value here, so we want to zero out underneath. So the first thing I'm going to do is negative 3 times row 1 plus row 2 so that I can generate a 0 there. So I got 1, negative 3, 4, negative 4. All right, the first row and the third row don't change. And this one, I can get my 0 there. Then what do I got? Negative 3 times negative 3 is 9, minus 7 gives me. 2 there. Negative 3 times 4 is negative 12 plus 7 is negative 5. Negative 3 times negative 4 is 12 minus 8 is 4. Okay, so I got my 0 there. I need to keep working down, get a 0 in this position. So the next operation I'm going to do will be 4 times row 1 plus row 3. So again, row 1 doesn't change, row 2 doesn't change, and row 3, I get my 0 there, so I'm going to put 4 
minus 4 gives me 0. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. Plus 6 is negative 6. 4 times 4 is 16. Minus 1 is 15. 4 times negative 4 is negative 16. Plus 7 is negative 9. Alright, so that first column is looking good. Then I move over to the second column, second row. I've got a non-zero value here. So I want to zero out underneath. So I need to work on that 6 there. Okay, so I'm going to multiply row 2 by 3 and add that to row 3 because 3 times 2 is 6. Minus 6 gives me the 0 that I need right here. So 1, negative 3, 4, negative 4. Row 2 doesn't change. In row 3, I get my z. It's already 0. So 3 times 0 plus 0 is 0. 3 times 2 is 6. Minus 6. So there's my new 0. 3 times negative 5 is negative 15. Plus 15 is 0. Okay. And remember, we're looking this point you can see we got all zeros here okay and then we're ready to get the last position and what do we have here we want, uh, 3 times 4 is 12 minus 9 gives us uh, 3 so what do we have here we've got all zeros on the left and on the right we've got a value that's not 0 so as we saw before that means this system has no solution. Okay. All right. I want to do one more uh, problem from this section. Uh, and this one is uh, let's see. Actually, maybe a couple more. Um, about let's look at number. Uh, let's see number twenty-two. Okay, 22. 22 looks like this. Okay, we put it in in the uh, matrix form. Okay, now the directions ask you to find the values of H, okay, this parameter, for which this system is consistent. Okay, so to do that, you want to just... Uh, get an echelon form or actually we don't know what echelon form is yet well, let's just do what we've been doing um, so we've got our non-zero value here we zero out underneath it so we multiply by 3 so I'm going to do 3 times row 1 plus row 2 so that gives me a 0 there oops this doesn't change okay so 3 times 2 is 6 minus 6 gives me 0 here 3 times negative 3 is negative 9 plus 9 gives me 0 here. And 3 times h plus 5 is just 3 times h plus 5. All right. Now at this point, look, it looks just like the one previous, right? Look back at the one we were just looking at. We had all zeros and then something not zero. Well, here we have all zeros. Okay, so that's significant. Um, but over here, um, we don't know what this is because we're, we're asked to find H so that this system is consistent. So we want this to, we want 3H plus 5 must equal 0 for the system to be consistent. Okay, so that means that uh, 3h must equal negative 5, so h has to equal negative 5 thirds. Okay, so that's what we're looking for for this one. All right, because this has to equal 0 for the system to be consistent. Right, because if this is not 0, we're like this case up here where there's no solution. All right, let's look at one more. And I'm kind of going out of order here just because uh, I like to uh, kind of stick with the same theme. So I'm going to back up to number 20. And uh, it's a similar kind of 
uh, question is 22. But this time the H is uh, not on the right side. It's part of the coefficient matrix. So it's a little bit different. So again, we do our row operations. We got a non-zero here. We want to zero out this position. So we do 2 times row 1 plus row 2. So I've got 1, H, negative 3. And I got a zero here. 2 times h plus 4 and 2 times negative 3 is negative 6 plus 6 is 0. Alright, so I've got uh, this situation. Now remember the problem is to find h such that the system is consistent. Well, system is consistent as long as we don't have a case like we had be, uh, up here Right. System is consistent as long as we don't have a row that looks like 0, 0, and then something not 0. Okay? We'll notice that that can never happen. We can never have 0, 0, something not 0 because the right hand side is already 0. Okay? So that means this system, let's have a little more room here. This system is always, always consistent, right? Because we can never have a row of the form zero, zero, and then on the augmented side, something not zero. Right? Can't happen in this case because the right hand side is a zero. Okay, so this system is always consistent uh, yeah, irregardless of what H is. Alright, so I think that's about it for section 1.1. Uh, as uh, always, keep in mind that you can call me up, email me uh, anytime to uh, let me know if you have any questions. Alright, good luck with those homework problems. Okay, today we're going to be talking about uh, section 1.2, and really the main thing I want to uh, cover today is uh, to talk about a specific form that we want to get a matrix into when we're trying to solve a system. So we've kind of talked about that uh, a little bit up to now, but uh, at this point we're going to get very specific about that. So the form that we're trying to get at is called echelon form, okay? And echelon form is defined by three properties. So the first one of these uh, is that um, if there are any rows of all zeros, they're at the bottom of the matrix. So you swap rows to get those at the bottom. The leading entry, remember that's the first non-zero entry, so the leading entry in each row uh, is in a column to the right of the leading entry in the row above it. And I'll show you that in just a sec. Uh, the third one is that all entries in a column below a leading entry are zeros. So we've done that up to now. You know, we get our leading entry and then we zero out below it. So that's that idea. Here's an example. Um, the black squares here represent non-zero values and they're the leading entries in each of these rows. And so you can see here we have a leading entry and zeros underneath. Here we have another leading entry, zeros underneath. And notice that this leading entry is to the right of the one before it. And here's another leading entry and it's to the right of the one that came before it. Okay, so that second property is basically what gets you this stair-step kind of structure in your matrix. Alright, see, here's another one. This one's also in echelon form. Um, leading entry here, zeros below it. Uh, another leading entry, zeros below it, and it's to the right of the previous one. And uh, we have a row of zeros, and it's at the bottom, so we satisfy all the criteria. Now, sometimes you want to go a little bit farther um, and get your matrix in reduced echelon form. 
So if it's in reduced echelon form, uh, that means that it's in echelon form plus it satisfies two more properties. Okay, and these properties are that uh, each leading entry is a one. So you scale the rows to make each leading entry equal to one. And that one is the only non-zero entry in its column. So you zero out not only below it, but also above it. So here's an example of a matrix that's in reduced echelon form. Each leading entry is a one. Um, and it's the only non-zero entry in its column. So we've zeroed out below here, zeroed out above and below, and zeroed out uh, above in this case. All right. Here's another one. Uh, this one's in reduced echelon form because each leading entry, we've only got two, and they're each one, and we've zeroed out above and below each one. There's a row of zeros at the bottom. Okay, so that's in reduced echelon form. Now for for purposes of uh, just solving a system, typically you just want to get it in echelon form. Although there will be one particular case that I'll talk about later uh, in another section coming up where you want to get it in uh, echelon or reduced echelon form. It just makes life easier then. But for the most part at this point, uh, echelon form is fine. Now um, I'll show you a couple of things about these forms. Uh, one thing to note is that the reduced echelon form of a matrix is unique. So that means that no matter what sequence of row operations you use to get a matrix in reduced echelon form, uh, you'll end up at the same place. Not so for the echelon form. Okay, It's not unique. That means that all of you could be working on the same matrix and end up with a different echelon form of the same matrix. And that's because you can scale a row Okay, multiply row by a constant and get a different echelon form. Still be an echelon form, but it would be a different matrix. Okay, so the reduced form is unique, the echelon form is not. Okay, so you either want to uh, to get your matrix in echelon or reduced echelon form when you're solving a system. And uh, the latter, to get it in reduced echelon form takes more work, but when you do that, the solution is obvious. And so let me show you what I mean by that. Um, here we have a, an augmented matrix that's already in echelon form. Notice leading entry, zeros underneath. Another leading entry, zeros underneath. And uh, no rows of zeros. Each leading entry is to the right of the one before it. So it's in echelon form. Um, and then we do use back substitution to solve for uh, the uh, variable. So start with the third row and th equation for the third row we get 7 times x3 equals 7 so we solve for x3. Then we back substitute to solve for x2 in the second row. So second row says negative 2 times x2 plus 5 x3 equals 7 and we know that x3 is 1 we just solve for that so we plug that in here and we end up with x2 equals negative 1. And then we keep going back up again to the first row. Equation for the first row looks like x1 minus 3x2 equals 5. And we know what x2 is because we just solved for that. So we plug it in and then we end up with x1 equals 2. So that's the method that uh, we were using in section 1.1 and probably what you want to continue using for the most part. However, if you choose to get your matrix in reduced echelon form. Okay, So this is the same matrix but in reduced echelon form. Then notice that uh, you end up with the solution values of your variables just sitting in the right side, right hand column. Because if you look at each row, you know the first row says 1 times x1 equals 2. Second row, 1 times x2 equals negative 1 and so forth. So if you go back up, you can see we got x1 is 2 x2, negative 1, 1, so 2, negative 1, 1, and there's 2, negative 1, 1. So that's uh, one advantage of getting it in reduced echelon form, because then the solution's obvious and you don't have to actually do any uh, any back substitution. So it's kind of your mileage may vary, whichever you like uh, will be fine. Um, 
you get this point we'll stop here and we'll pick up here in the next video okay so picking up from the previous video um, let's talk a little bit about um, a couple more pieces of terminology that we'll be using extensively throughout the course okay so uh, Remember, the leading entry is the first non-zero entry in a uh, row, in a matrix in uh, echelon form. So um, it turns out that um, the leading entries in the reduced echelon form and in any echelon form are in the same positions, I mean, same location in the matrix. Um, so here's the one we were just looking at. Uh, there was a leading entry in the 1-1, one, one, first row, first column, second row, second column, third row, third column, and in the reduced echelon form, same positions in the matrix. So it's convenient to talk about those positions as opposed to the actual value. The leading entry is the actual value, but we really would are more interested in the position, and so we call that a pivot position. So a pivot position is a position that contains a leading entry. So the 1-1, one, 2-2, one, 3-3 two, two, three, three positions would be pivot positions in this matrix. Okay, so as I said, the leading entry is the actual value. The pivot position is the location. So the leading entry here is 1. It's in the first row, first column. So that's the pivot position. Here, this row, the leading entry is negative 2. It's in the second row, second column position. Okay, and then one other... Uh, term is pivot column. Pivot column is a column that contains a pivot position. So I'll be using the terms pivot position and pivot column till probably the last day of the semester. So uh, you will hear that quite a bit to make sure you understand what those are. Okay, two more terms. Uh, a basic variable is one that corresponds to a pivot column. And a free variable is one that corresponds to a non-pivot column. Okay, so for each column, uh, except for the augmented column, you know, uh, there's a corresponding variable. So if you look and in, in there's a, a pivot column, that means that variable is basic. If the column is not a pivot column, that means that variable is called free. All right, so let's look at how all this relates to solving the system of equation. So I've got a tail of three matrices. Here's number one. Now notice this matrix. Uh, if we, it's already in echelon form, right? Here's leading entry, zeros underneath, leading entry, zeros underneath, leading entry, you don't need to worry about zeros underneath it. So we start the process of uh, solving the system. So we start with row three. And here's the equation that corresponds to row three. And if I simplify the left side, it's just zero. So I end up with zero equals seven. Well, uh, we know that can't happen. So that is our clue that uh, this system has no solution. Okay. So if the echelon form of an augmented matrix has a row of this form, okay, where on the left you've got all zeros, then in the augmented column you have something not zero. Okay, so all zeros on the left, not zero on the right. That's what we have here. All zeros on the left, not zero on the right. Then the corresponding system has no solution. Okay, so that's the marker. That's what you need to look for to see if your system is consistent or not. All right, matrix number two. Change that first one just a little bit, and I put uh, a non-zero value here. And so we got uh, uh, leading entry, zeros underneath, leading entry, zeros underneath, another leading entry. So this one's in echelon form. So we solve, and this is the same one we solved earlier, so I'm not going to go back through that, and this was our solution. Um, and so this one, what? Has a unique solution. The system is consistent. It's consistent because it doesn't have a row uh, where there's all zeros and then something not zero. And it has no free variables. That's the key here for unique solution. Notice 
that there's a pivot position in every column of the coefficient part of the matrix. So pivot position in column 1, so x1 is basic. Pivot position in column 2, so x2 is basic. Pivot position in column 3, so x3 is basic. So system is consistent. All the variables are uh, basic, has no free variables, and so we get a unique solution. All right, one more matrix. Notice here that um, we've got a row of all zeros. This one is in echelon form, but we've got a row of all zeros. Let's look for just a second. X1 here has a pivot position. Uh, the column 2 has a pivot position. Column 3 does not have a pivot position. So that means that we have a free variable, right? X1 and X2 are basic, but X3 is a free variable because there's no pivot position in column 3. Okay, so if we try to solve it, um, here's what we get from row 2. Negative 2X2 plus 5X3 equals 7. We solve for X2 and notice that it's written in terms of X3. And then we back up to row 1 and uh, we've got x1 minus 3x2 equals 5. We substitute in for x2, and here's what we end up with for x1. Notice it's also written in terms of x3. Notice that that's all we've got, these two equations, and uh, so there's nothing constraining x3, and that's because x3 is a free variable. And so if we write our solution, here's what it looks like. Um, and in your book, that's what they call the general form of the solution. Okay, so this is just for x1, x2, what we just computed, x3 is free. This is the general form of the solution. Okay, so notice that we can plug in any value for x3 that we want. And any value of x3 produces uh, a different solution. So that means we have an infinite number of solutions to this system. Um, the easiest thing, if you want an, if you want a specific solution, uh, the easiest thing is to just plug in zero for x3. If you do that, then uh, you get x1's negative 11 halves, x2 negative 7 halves, x3 is zero. All right. Or you could plug in x3 equals one um, and get another solution. Um, I always tell my students, plug in your favorite number. So if your favorite number is pi, plug in pi for x3. And if you do that then uh, here's what you get for x1 and x2. Okay, so you, no matter what value of x3 you plug in, that generates a different solution, and so you have an infinite number of solutions. And so the bottom line is, oops, back up, that if the system is consistent, and that's a key, you got to make sure it's consistent to start with, and has at least one free variable, then you will have an infinite number of solutions. Okay, so let's recap. When you're solving a system of equations, number one, put the uh, augmented matrix in echelon form. Number two, if you have a row of this form, all right, and this form is, again, all zeros on the left, something not zero in the augmented column, then that means the corresponding system has no solution. At that point, stop, because you got no solution. If that's not the case, then that means the system is consistent. So at that point, you look to see if there are free variables or not. If there are no free variables, that means the system has a unique solution. If it's consistent and there's at least one free variable, then you have an infinite number of solutions. Okay? So that's really your algorithm there. Um, for how to determine how to solve a system and determine which case it is. Is it no solution? Is it a unique solution or an infinite number of solutions? Okay, and that is it for this video. All right, we're going to start uh, here with a graphical look at vectors. So we've kind of seen, we've played around. Um, with uh, matrices and augmented matrices and solving systems. But let's take a look um, at vectors from a graphical point of view. Before we do that, though, uh, we need to discuss um, some terminology. So we'll start with 
RN. So you've seen this symbol, the uh, fancy looking R. Uh, that stands for the real numbers. And um, when you see a superscript, like here with the N, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, indicates that you're talking about vectors. And so this, as I say here, you just read this as RN. Okay, so RN is the set of all vectors having N components or N elements, each of which is a real number. So from a um, set point of view, you can look at it like this, set notation. Okay, all vectors look like this, N components, where each one of them is a real number. A lot of times we'll just talk about R2. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in R2, the 2 indicates vectors with two components, so there you go. And there's R3, similar sort of thing. We've got three components where each one is a real number. So for example, here are uh, three vectors in R2. You know they're in R2 because uh, they're vectors with two components. Each uh, component's a real number. And uh, here they're vectors in R3 because they have three components. Um, there are two operations that we need to know how to perform on vectors. The first of these is addition of vectors. So if we have two vectors, x and y, in Rn, then we can compute their sum, as indicated here. Okay, here's x, here's y, both have n components. To compute their sum, you just add uh, components that are in the same position. So first position, x1 plus y1, gives you the uh, first position in the sum, then x2 plus y2, and so forth to xn plus yn. So for example, if here's x and here's y, to get their sum, uh, 0 plus 2 gives you the 2 here, 1 plus 4, 5, and negative 3 plus negative 2 gives you negative 5. The other operation that we uh, need to know how to perform on vectors is scalar multiplication. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, <coughs> scalar uh, multiplication of vectors um, is based on uh, the idea that you have a scalar, which is just a real number, okay, a single number, that you want to multiply by a vector. And so the way you do that is indicated here. You just multiply that number by each element in the vector. So we get cx1, cx2, down to cxn. So, for example, um, here's your x, and you want to multiply 4 times x, then you just multiply each component uh, in the vector by 4. Okay, now with that, we can start to talk about a graphical representation of vectors, and we'll restrict our attention at first, at least, to R2. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, a vector in R2, uh, also called the plane, uh, you're probably familiar with that terminology, is indicated by a ray that begins at the origin and terminates at the point defined by the vector. So here's a couple of uh, vectors, and you can see how they look on a graph. Okay, so it's a, U is 2, 1, so we have a ray that begins at 0, 0 and terminates at 2, 1, similarly for V. Um, analytically, we know we can compute u plus v in this fashion, right? Just sum the like terms, 2 plus 1, 1 plus 4, give you 3, 5. Graphically, um, we use the parallelogram method. You might be familiar with this from your physics class or engineering or, uh, or maybe even like Calc 3 if you had that. So the way that works is you go to the end of... Uh, uh, one of the vectors, and you draw a l line that's parallel to the other one. Okay, so this line here would be parallel to V. And we do the same thing for the other vector. So go to the end of V, draw a line that's parallel to U. See, this line is parallel to U. And where those two lines intersect, that is the sum of the two vectors. So this vector here would be U plus V. And you can see that it's at 3... Five. 
um, scalar multiple of a vector. Um, I did a couple of examples based on those we were just looking at. 3 times 2, 1 is just uh, 6, 3, and here's a half of V. If you look at that graphically, um, 3 times U is a vector that's in the same direction as U, and it's just 3 times uh, as long. So basically you got 3, three U's uh, stacked there, and so you can see that it corresponds there's 6, 3. And uh, one half of V is is uh, what you would think. One half of V. So you can see that it's a vector, same direction as V, but half the length. Um, we can add those two together. All right. So this is how we do it. Three times U plus a half V. We already know how to do these operations. And graphically, take our one half V a line parallel to 3u and do similarly over here and the resultant vector here is what we think it should be about 13 halves 5 okay so notice that you can scale u to whatever length you want you can scale v to whatever length you want and then add those two vectors together and if you do that then think about where the vectors would end up. Any vectors that you can scale u however you want, scale v however you want, and then add them together. And let's think about that. Um, so this would be any multiple of u, uh, any multiple of v. And for the moment let's restrict our attention to positive multiples or non-negative multiples. Okay, So let's think, uh, assume that c and d are both non-negative. If we do that, then the vectors that we can produce or generate um, are here in this cone defined by u and v. All right? Because again, we can scale u to whatever length we want, we can scale v to whatever length we want, and then when we, add, we complete the parallelogram, then we can end up with any vector in this cone area here. Um, if you allow yourself to take negative multiples of u and v, um, then think about where those vectors would be in the plane. The easiest way, I think, to think about this is to, um, instead of thinking about taking negative multiples of u and v, about thinking of it as taking positive multiples of negative u and negative v. All right? <clears throat> and if you do that, then it's a similar thing as to what you just saw. Okay, so here is negative v, here's negative u, and so when you take positive uh, multiples of u and v, uh, or positive multiples of negative u and negative v, and then uh, add those two vectors together, you end up with uh, vectors in this region here. Okay, so um, other possibilities for, for um, uh, C and D, let's think about that. Um, if we allow um, positive multiples of U and negative multiples of V, then we're in this yellow region here. And uh, if we allow positive multiples of V but negative multiples of U, then we're in this region here. And so what you see is that um, we can generate any vector in the plane that we'd like just by taking a multiple of u and a multiple of v and adding them together. Okay, so we're going to see in a little bit that this means that u and v span the plane. So we can take multiples of each one of those and add them together and generate any vector in the plane. That's what it means to span R2. All right, so I'm going to stop here for now, and we'll pick up this in our next. Okay, we're back uh, where we left off of the first video, and we were looking at this picture where we determined that uh, based on our vectors U and V here, we could take uh, multiples of each one of those and add them together to produce any vector in the plane. So any vector in R2, or the plane, can be written in the form C times U plus D times V for some values of C and D. 
um, let's look at that analytically now. Okay, so according to our graphical argument, this system is consistent for every B in R2. You can take some multiple of U, some multiple of V, add them together, and get any vector in R2. So if we break that down, um, we can uh, multiply C times U. This is U. This is V. Here's our generic right-hand side vector. We multiply through by the scalars. We end up with this. And then adding these two together gives us this matrix here. Now, what does it mean for two vectors to be equal? Well, it means that component-wise they're equal. Okay, so the first component here is equal to the first component here. And likewise, the second component. So what we have is a system of equations. 2C plus D equals B1. C plus 4D equals B2. So we can put that in an augmented matrix. And that's what I've got here. And notice that, again, according to our graphical argument, our picture that we looked at, um, this... Uh, system corresponding to this augmented matrix is consistent no matter what B1 and B2 are. And also notice that these are equivalent. Okay, So when we have a multiple of a vector plus uh, another multiple of a vector then uh, equals some right hand side vector, notice how this system relates to this augmented matrix. So the first vector here just goes in the first column second vector goes in the second column and the right hand side is just in the right hand side column. So these are equivalent. Okay, let's look at this system a little more closely. Um, I, I swapped rows to um, make the arithmetic a little easier to get the one and the pivot position here. And we can do a row operation to zero out underneath and we end up with this matrix. Now remember this has a solution no matter what the right hand side is. Okay, now how do we know that that's the case? Um, we know it graphically, but how can we look at this augmented matrix and tell that? Well, notice that there's no way to have a row of this form, the 0, 0, something not 0 uh, form. And that's because in each row we have a pivot position. We have a pivot position here, so that's never going to be 0. We have a pivot position here, so that's never going to be 0. So there's no way to have a row of this form here. Okay, so the bottom line is that your system will be consistent no matter what the right hand side is if you have a pivot position in every row of the coefficient matrix. Okay, now I'm, I'm talking about the coefficient matrix because I'm talking about just this part here, not looking at the right hand side. You don't want your right hand side to be a, uh, to have a pivot position because then that would indicate the system's inconsistent. All right, let's uh, kind of take what we've looked at so far and put it in the terminology um, of uh, the uh, text. Okay, so um, if we start off with a, an arbitrary set of vectors v1 through vp and scalars c1 through cp, then if we if we apply the scalars to the vectors and add them up and that's what we were doing earlier we only had two vectors but here we got an arbitrary number of vectors okay, this is called a linear combination of the V's with weights C1 through CP okay so um, this these when we've been multiplying by scalar and adding vectors together that we were taking linear combinations Okay, so a linear combination just looks like this. You've got a scalar multiplied times a vector, um, and you have that uh, for however many vectors you have, and then you add them all up. That's what a linear combination is. Okay, so we were doing C times U plus D times V. That was a linear combination of U and V, where C and D were the weights we were using. Okay, now here's a linear combination. Okay, but here the X's are being the weights and the A's are vectors. Okay, so this is uh, X1, A1 plus X2, A2 and so forth. Um, oh, that should be X, N, A, N. And uh, that has the same solution set 
as uh, the system given by this augmented matrix. Now, if you remember before, we started off with an equation like this. We just had two vectors, but um, then when we got it into matrix form, remember I showed you, you take your first vector here, it goes in the first column in the augmented matrix. Second vector goes in the second column and so forth. Last vector goes in the last column and then you got your right hand side. Um, here we see that uh, you've got uh, u ended up uh, c times u plus d times v and uh, we ended up with that augmented matrix that we saw earlier. Okay, uh, one more term, and I used this in the previous uh, video, but uh, we'll uh, define it more formally here. The set of all linear combinations of the set of vectors V1 through Vp in Rn is denoted by the span of V1 through Vp. Okay, so set of all linear combinations of vectors is the span of that set of vectors. Okay, and the span of that set of vectors is, is just uh, called the subset that is spanned or generated by those vectors. So if you recall back um, when we were looking at our example, um, we, uh, I talked about how you could span my two vectors, u and v, that we had, they spanned R2. We're going to look at that in just a sec. Um, here's another way of looking at it. The span of V1 through Vp is all vectors that can be written in this form. And what is this form? It's just linear combinations. Okay, So the span is just the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. And here's the previous example. Um, we've got C times this is u plus d times v equals b1, b2. Okay, so that means that these vectors span r2. Uh, let's back up just a little bit. What, what if we just looked at the span of a single vector? What would we get there? Well, back to the definition, all linear combinations of that vector and linear combinations of just one vector means just all multiples of that vector. And so graphically, what that is is just the line that goes through the origin and uh, that vector. So it's just all multiples of u. So anything on this line. Uh, here's another thing to think about. Um, the span of the vector 2, 1 is the same as the span of this set of vectors. Now, why would that be? Well, here's definition. A span of 2, 1 is just all multiples of 2, 1. A span of the two of them is all linear combinations of the two. Now, why would these two sets be the same? Well, the key is to notice that 4, 2 is a multiple of 2, 1. So it really doesn't add anything because you can take a multiple of 2, 1 to get 4, 2. So by adding 4, 2 to the set, as I did here, it doesn't get you any more vectors. Okay. And so you have to move off that line defined by the vector 2, 1 uh, to generate uh, more vectors. And that's in our example before we had two uh, vectors that were not collinear. And so in that case, you could generate or span all of R2. Okay, let's, let's look a little bit in uh, at a three-dimensional example. So if we look at the span of this vector, uh, that would just be all multiples of that vector. And graphically, um, we're saying that's that x has to be 0, z has to be 0, but y could be anything because you can multiply anything by 1. So essentially you're on uh, the y-axis. Alright, so x has to be 0, z has to be 0, so anything along the y-axis. If we add another vector to it, so I throw in this one, now we take all linear combinations of these two and notice that in this case you get all vectors that look like this. So it means x has to be 0, but y and z can be anything we want them to be. 
And so that gives us a plane, okay, where x is 0, but y and z are anything that, that we want them to be. Okay, so these two vectors in R3 generate a plane. We're going to start off uh, today talking about uh, multiplying a matrix uh, with a vector. So some terminology there. Um, let's suppose that we start off with an M by N matrix A, and we're going to let A1, A2 through AN be the columns of A. Okay, so each of these is, is a column vector and not a scalar. Okay, each a sub i is a vector in Rm. Since there are m rows in A, each column would have m entries. And uh, let's let x be a vector in Rn. Then the product of A and x is computed as shown here. Okay, so here's A. Remember, each of these is a vector, okay, a column of A. Here's x. And so to compute a times x, um, basically we just match up um, the components of x with the columns of a. So we end up with x1 times a1 plus x2 times a2 plus out to xn times an. So you'll recognize this as a linear combination of the columns of a. Okay, so here's the deal. ax is a linear combination of the columns of a using the corresponding entries in X as the weight. So here's an example. Here's a matrix A and a vector X. Uh, then to compute A times X, um, we've got the first entry in X times the first column of A, plus the second entry in X times the second column of A, and then plus the third entry in X times the third column of A. And we do the scalar multiplication, add them together, and here's our result. All right, so notice what we have. Here's a matrix times a vector, and we get this vector. Or another way of looking at it, here's a linear combination of uh, the columns of the matrix, um, yielding the same vector, clearly. And then here's another way to look at it. Um, if we um, looked at this augmented matrix, okay, so this is A here, the coefficient uh, matrix A, with um, this vector augmented onto the right-hand side, okay, so um, we essentially have the, uh, the augmented matrix here that corresponds to this system. So if we put it in a reduced echelon form, which I have here, notice that we get what we think we should get, right? The solution to the system is just the vector x that we started out with up here. So these are three different ways to look at the same uh, system. So let's uh, formalize that idea. So if we have uh, a matrix A, that's m by n with columns a1, a2 to an, and uh, if, v, if b is a vector in Rm, then these uh, equations, ax equals b, and this linear combination of the columns of a set equal to b, and the system corresponding to this augmented matrix, where you got all the columns of a with b tacked on at the augmented uh, column, all have the same solution set. So these all essentially mean the same thing. They're just different ways of looking at the same problem. So notice that the equation ax equals b has a solution if and only if b is a linear combination of the columns of a. Because since these are all equivalent, this is a linear combination of the columns of a that we're setting equal to b. So if that has a solution, that means ax equals b has a solution. And uh, another way of stating that is that AX equals B has a solution if and only if B is in the span of the columns of A. Okay, so 
if B is a linear combination of the columns of A, that means B is in the span of the columns of A. Okay, we're going to um, move over to um, a maple session uh, at this point um, because it's uh, easier to show you some of this with some of the graphics that maple uh, lets me use. And so um, also give you a little... Um, uh, little lesson in using maple as well. So um, I'm loading here uh, the uh, uh, student linear algebra package and the plots package. And then um, I'm uh, defining two vectors here, uh, a1 and a2. And then I'm, I'm creating with this command uh, a matrix A uh, whose columns are the vectors a1 and a2. Um, so you see the, the output that you get from that. Um, I'm defining these vectors um, because I want to look at the plane that they lie on. And um, as I explain here, um, this plane is uh, uh, defined by this equation, um, x minus y equals 0. So notice that both of my uh, uh, vectors here have uh, x minus y equals 0, and z can be essentially whatever it wants to be. And so what that amounts to is a plane that, uh, if you think about the line y equals x in the plane, uh, so it's kind of defined by that line, and then just straight up and straight down from that line. So... Um, Let's uh, kind of look at a picture. Here I'm defining uh, plots so that we can see what these look like. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like I've uh, changed this just... Uh, let me change this. This is supposed to be 222. Two, two. really doesn't matter. But just to be consistent, let me make that change. Okay, then, um, so here's what uh, those two vectors look like. And let me kind of rotate this to make it look like what I want. Basically, if you look, you can kind of see that uh, they lie on the same plane. Um, and that plane uh, is... Um, if you look at it, this is looking down from the Z perspective, and so uh, that's, if you look down in the bottom of that box, that's the line Y equals X, so they both lie on that line. Um, it's easier if you look at the plane uh, also, and then you can see the vectors as well, so let's do that here. You can see the plane, and you've got the two vectors that are lying on that plane. Okay, so you can see here's the x-axis this way, y going this way, and z's up and down. And you can see there's the plane, and looking from it from up above, you can see that we're cutting across on the line y equals x, and both those vectors lie in that plane. So if we look at any other vector in that plane, uh, any other vector where the x and y components are the same, it should lie on that plane. Um, so I've defined a new variable, new vector, a 1, 1, 3, and uh, then I've plotted it on this same uh, set of axes. And so if you look, let's look at it like this. Now, there you can see um, the new one, 113, uh, I made it black, so you can see it here. And then looking at it from above again, you can see that those are all on the same set of axes, or same plane. So all those lie on the same plane. So that means that B here is in the span of the original two vectors that we started out with, or it's a linear combination 
of the two vectors we started out with. So if we solve the system AX equals B, it should be consistent. So that's what I'm doing right here. Um, I'm forming the matrix, um, an augmented matrix here. So I've got my matrix A, and then I'm augmenting on uh, the new vector B here. And all in the same command, I'm reducing that matrix to uh, echelon form, or row echelon form. And uh, here's what we get. Okay, clearly this system has a solution because we have no um, rows where it's all zeros and then something not zero. You can see we've got, got a row of all zeros, but that's okay. And uh, in fact, we have a unique solution because there's no free variables. And uh, the solution says uh, that uh, x1 is 3 halves, x2 is negative 1. So if we take that linear combination, okay, 3 halves times the first column of A plus negative 1 times the second column of A, we should get B because that's the system we just solved. So if you look, indeed, this is uh, that linear combination here, and this is B. All right, now looking ahead, if we choose a vector um, whose first components are not equal, then it should not be on that plane. And if we solve the system with it on the right-hand side, we should get uh, no solution. So let's give that a try. So I create another vector, C, um, which uh, has the X and Y components are not equal. All right, and I plotted it. So here's that vector. Get a good view on that. There you can see there. Let me get there. That's a good view right there. You can see this new vector is um, the cyan colored one. And clearly it's not on the plane that the other three vectors lie on. Alright? It's coming off off the plane. So that means that it is not in the span of the other three. So it's not a linear combinant, I mean, of the other, well, the other three, but really we're only interested in the other two. Um, it's not a linear combination of the columns of A. So if we um, solve the system um, with C on the right-hand side, um, then here's what we end up with. Okay, so I didn't get it in reduced echelon form. I wanted to leave it like this. So this is just echelon form. But notice the third row. You got 0, 0, and then negative 2. So 0, 0, something not 0. So that tells us there's no solution. Okay, and then again, because that vector is not in the span, uh, it's not in the space that's generated by the columns of A. Um, and one more look. I just uh, created just a generic vector I call D. And then let's look at the uh, uh, echelon form of the augmented matrix uh, with A and D. All right, so it looks like this. This is a nice thing about Maple. It does the symbolic uh, computation, so you can... Um, do the computation with uh, variables or parameters instead of all just uh, constants. And so we can see, notice the bottom row, we got 0, 0, and then something else over here. And notice what that says. It says um, that if this system has a solution, then D2 minus D1 has to equal 0. Right? Because if this is non-zero over here, then we've got 0, 0, something not 0 in the augmented column, which means no solution. So for this system to have a solution, D2 minus D1 has to equal zero, which of course means that D2 and D1 are equal. And since those, back up here, those are the first two components, that's just saying that the X and Y components have to be equal for this system to have a solution. Or graphically, the first two components have to be equal for the vector to lie on the plane that is spanned by a1 and A2. Okay, I'm going to stop there and we'll pick up uh, the next slide in the next video. Okay, I want to start back here with Theorem 4. Um, 
this is a very important theorem in your book, so you want to play, pay close attention to this one. Um, so it says, let A be an M by N matrix. Then the following statements are logically equivalent. That means for a particular matrix A, either they are all true or they're all false. Okay, so that's a powerful um, theorem that we have here. Okay, first statement is, for each B and RM, the equation AX equals B is consistent. So that's saying no matter what the right-hand side is, for this particular matrix A, AX equals B is always consistent. Another way to say that is that each B and RM is a linear combination of the columns of A. Okay, because we saw just earlier that a times x, when you multiply a times x, you're actually taking a linear combination of the columns of a. <clears throat> this also means that the columns of a span rm, right? Because you can produce any vector in rm as a linear combination of the columns of a. And then down to the nitty gritty, um, how you actually determine whether this is true or not is by putting A in echelon form, and these are all true if A has a pivot position in every row. So we saw that in the last, in the maple uh, demo. Okay, If there's a pivot position in every row of A, that means of the coefficient matrix, then there's no way the system can be inconsistent because you could never have a row of all zeros and then in the augmented column something non-zero. Okay, we're going to look at one other way to uh, compute A times X. Um, but first, um, we're looking at the inner product of two vectors, because um, we're going to use that. So if we're given two vectors in Rn, say X and Y, then the inner product, which is also called the dot product of X and Y, is uh, computed as follows. Okay, it's just X1 times Y1 plus X2 times Y2 plus so forth, plus xn times yn. Okay, so just multiplying like components and adding them up. So here's an example. You've got x is 1, 2, 3, y is 4, 5, 6. Then the inner product of x and y, or x dot y, is 1 times 4, plus 2 times 5, plus 3 times 6. Okay, so now let's talk about two ways we can compute a times x. Um, we already looked at one of these. Um, that's by taking a linear combination of the columns of A. So here's an example um, to compute uh, the product of this matrix A times X. Then we take uh, the first element of X and apply that to the first column of A. Then second element, negative 4, times the second column of A, and so forth. So we generate this linear combination and uh, end up with this vector. Now the second way we use uh, inner products and the ith element of the uh, inner product of uh, the ith element of AX is the inner product of the ith row of A with X. Alright, so looking at that um, you look at um, to get the first element here, the negative 3, then it's the first row of A, inner product with X. So that's going to be 1 times 6 plus 2 times negative 4 plus 1 times negative 1, which is what we have here in this first element here. Okay, then to get the second component of A times X, it's the second row of A, inner product with X. So negative 3 times 6 plus negative 1 times 4 plus 2 times negative 1, okay, as we see here. Then to get the third element, it's the third row of A, inner product with the uh, vector X, okay? So um, those are two different ways you can compute the product of a matrix and a vector. For the most part, we will use this method, the linear combination of the columns of A, just because that fits in with the way I want you to be thinking. However, 
um, this method down here is probably quicker. So if you just need to compute um, the product of uh, a matrix or a vector, uh, you might want to just use this method, uh, using the inner product method, just because it's faster. So you should practice both just to make sure you know how to do each of these methods. Okay, and I think that's it for this lesson. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, homogeneous linear systems. And uh, a homogeneous linear system is simply one in which the right-hand side is the zero vector. The zero vector is just a vector of all zeros. So here's a, uh, another way to look at it. Uh, if we look at a times x as a linear combination of uh, the columns of a, as in here, x1, a1, plus x2, a2, plus dot, 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 xn, an, um, and we want that to equal the zero vector. Now, how can uh, that happen? Well, it's uh, if you look at it a little bit, it's pretty clear that if you set each one of these x values equal to zero, then you do the linear combination and you'll end up with the zero vector. So therefore, a homogeneous system is always consistent. It's x equals zero, okay, all x values equal to zero is always a solution. And since it's always a solution and it's obvious that it's a solution, we call it the trivial solution. So we know that the system's consistent and uh, so if you think back uh, to the two questions that uh, we ask when we're solving a system, the first one is, is it consistent? So now we know this one is. So we move on to question two, which is, okay, is the solution unique or are there an infinite number of solutions? So in our case, um, if the solution is unique, that means you only have the trivial solution. So what we want to know is, um, do there exist any non-trivial solutions? Okay, is uh, the solution set uh, an infinite set? Well, uh, the answer uh, is just like it would be for any other system. You'll have non-trivial solutions, or you'll have an infinite number of solutions, if and only if your system of equations has at least one free variable. So we're going to look at a system here and solve it and uh, we're going to write our solution in parametric vector form. So that's, that's something that's new in this section. Alright, so here's the system. Um, we want to solve x equals 0, so we put it in an augmented matrix, so we tack on the column of zeros, and we do some row operations, and notice that um, I have put my augmented matrix in reduced echelon form, not just echelon form, but reduced echelon form. And that is because that makes it easier to not only write the solution in general form, but it makes it easier to write it in uh, parametric vector form. So anytime your system has an infinite number of solutions, then uh, it tends to be easier to write out the set of solutions if you put your matrix in reduced echelon form first. So looking at this matrix here, you can see that uh, x1 and x2, um, they're pivot columns in the, in the x1 and x2 columns, it's pivot positions in the x1 and x2 columns, so those are basic variables. In the x3 column, we have no pivot position, so therefore x3 is a free variable. Okay, so that means we've got an infinite number of solutions, or this homogeneous system has non-trivial solutions. So what do they look like? Well, we can uh, look at the second row, and we get that um, x2, it must be equal to 3 times x3, and uh, x1 is going to be equal to negative 4 times x3. So we can write the general form of the solution as is given here. x3 is free, x1 and x2 are written in terms of the free variable. Now to get the parametric vector form of the solution, we start off with just a generic solution vector and basically just uh, copy down the general form of the solution. So this, uh, what you see here, comes straight from looking at the general form of the solution. 
and then to write it in parametric vector form, we simply factor out the parameter. In this case, x3 is the parameter because we can set x3 to be whatever we want in order to generate uh, as many solutions as we want. So we have it now in parametric vector form. Here's our parameter and here's our vector. Um, you should note that if you have more than one free variable, then you're going to have more than one um, parameter and um, vector when you write your solution in parametric vector form. So you'd have, uh, you know, if we had x4 that was a free variable, we'd have x3 times this vector plus x4 times some other vector and so forth. You'd have a vector for each uh, free variable. Okay, uh, let's think about the relationship between the systems AX equals 0 and AX equals B. So what we've done to this point is solved AX equals 0 for a particular matrix A. And now I want to keep that same A and solve the system AX equals B for this vector B given here. And we'll write our solution in parametric vector form. So we approach it the same way. Here's our augmented matrix. We do row operations. Whoops, sorry. Oop, backing up. There we go. Um, we're doing row operations um, to get the matrix in reduced echelon form. And if uh, you want to go back and compare with uh, what we did with AX equals zero, these are the exact same row operations. And that's because they were based on what was in the coefficient part of the matrix. Um, and so that hasn't changed. So we do the same operation. So the only thing that's changed is what's on the right hand side. Um, let me, um, whoops, I'm backing up again. Trying to get used to my mouse trackpad here. Sorry about that. Let me point out that um, when you're solving uh, AX equals zero and you have all zeros on the right hand side, then those zeros never change because when you do uh, elementary row operations, any of those three, uh, elementary row operations, they will never change. If you start off with all zeros, you'll end up with all zeros. Okay, so back to this example though. When we um, write out our solution, notice x3 is still free variable, um, and now x2, when we write x2, then it's uh, going to be 3, the 3 here, uh, plus 3x3. And x1 is going to be negative 5 minus 4x3. So here's our solution. And if we just write it in general form, here's what it looks like. And um, parametric vector form, we start out just like we did previously, write out uh, what the general form looks like in a vector uh, format. And then uh, we're going to separate out the part that involves a parameter in the constant part and then take it one step further and uh, factor out the parameter and so notice that um, what we have here uh, is exactly the solution that we had to AX equals 0 and uh, then with AX equals B we have that plus this constant vector now notice that the constant vector doesn't have a parameter associated with it it's just constant and it doesn't change but here we can multiply we can set our parameter X3 to be anything and scale this vector okay so um, in general the solution looks like this uh, here was solution to AX equals zero and notice that it's in this form. It's in the form some parameter T times a vector V. So in this case X3 is plain T and this is the vector V. So it's just a vector that we can scale any way we want. Whereas for AX equals B you still got the TV part right got X3 times this vector but you've got this constant vector so that's what I'm calling P. And so for AX equals zero, you just have a vector that you can scale. For uh, AX equals B, you've still got the vector you can scale plus this other vector. So let's look at graphically uh, what is going on there.
Yeah. Now for uh, for this, I'm going to just uh, uh, look at a case in R2. So I'm so what you're going to see here is not the solutions to the system we were just looking at because that was in R3. Um, but it's a little bit easier when you draw pictures in R2. So that's what I've got here. So um, for AX equals 0, it's the solution set is all vectors of the form T times V. So here's a vector V, and we know that T times V is just any vector on this line. So the line that you see here is the set of all solutions to AX equals 0. Now let's look when we consider the vector P, okay, so for um, uh, solution set for AX equals B is um, of the form TV plus P. And um, so remember all, all the vectors along here are the T times V. And then so for any of these vectors, any point on this line, you can add P and you'll have a, a vector of the form TV plus P. So for here's one, I just did V plus P. So one times V plus P. And uh, like doing the parallelogram method, you end up with this vector here. Um, we can do it for other vectors. So here's uh, P plus 2 times V. Um, here's P plus 0 times V. Here's P plus negative 1 times V. Okay, so notice though that they all fall along this line. You know, so right here would be P plus a half V, here P plus three fourths V, here P plus three halves V, and so forth. So, um, so for every vector, every solution to AX equals zero that you have on this line, there's a corresponding solution to AX equals B over here on this line. And so we end up with this um, approach where along the blue line, that's all the solutions to AX equals zero. Along the magenta line here, all solutions to AX equals B. So notice that uh, for AX equals zero, it's a line through the origin because uh, that's the trivial solution to AX equals zero. And for AX equals B, you're moving off the, uh, away from the origin, so off this line, but parallel to the uh, solution set for AX equals zero. And uh, if you look in three dimensions, let's suppose we have a uh, problem where the solution set is a plane in three dimensions. So for AX equals zero, um, it's a plane like this red one that's going to go through the origin. And then for AX equals B, you get a parallel plane that's moved off the origin. So for, the, for AX equals 0, you get this red plane that goes through the origin. For AX equals B, you get a parallel plane that's off the origin. All right, today we're going to talk about uh, the concept of linear independence. So if we have a set of vectors, um, let's say P vectors in Rn, the set is said to be linearly independent if we take a linear combination, set it equal to the zero vector, and this equation has only the trivial solution. So the only way uh, we can take a linear combination of the vectors and get the zero vector is if all the coefficients are equal to zero. Um, since this, this uh, equation here is equivalent to the system defined by this augmented matrix, then we also say that the set is linearly independent if the system corresponding to the augmented matrix where we put all the vectors in as the columns, augment on the zero vector, um, if that uh, has only the trivial solution. So these are equivalent. Now if this has only the trivial solution, then that means it has a unique solution, right? It has only the trivial solution. So um, all the C's equal to zero is the only solution. So it's unique. So that means it has no free variables. So uh, kind of the uh, typical method of determining if a system or if a uh, 
set of vectors is linearly independent is to stick them in the columns of a matrix as I've done here uh, tack on the zero vector for the augmented column and see if that uh, matrix has is if there are any free variables in that system if uh, there are no free variables then you know the, the uh, vectors are linearly independent if you do find a free variable then you know that there are an infinite number of solutions to that system and therefore the vectors are not linearly independent in that case we say they're linearly dependent so here's a couple of vectors and uh, if we want to find out if they're linearly independent then as I showed you before, you take a linear combination of them and set it equal to zero, as I've done here. If we put that into an augmented matrix, it looks like this with just the two vectors stuck in the columns and the zero vector tacked on as the augmented column. And we can do one row operation and uh, zero out uh, in this position. And notice that we have no free variables, and therefore that means that uh, we have only the trivial solution. And you can see that the solution is unique. And so these vectors are linearly independent. Uh, here's another set of vectors. Right? Uh, just change just a little bit. Let's see if they're linearly independent. So again, we take a linear combination, set it equal to zero stick that in uh, as an augmented matrix do one row operation and we end up with this matrix here and notice that um, we've got a free variable x2 here the second column uh, has no pivot position so x2 is a free variable so therefore these vectors are linearly dependent now if you look at the vectors that we had um, the first set if we graphed them looks like this uh, we had 2, 1, and 1, 4, so they look like that. They're linearly independent. Whereas that second set, um, I believe we had 1, 4, and 2, 8. Let's back up. Yep, 1, 4, and 2, 8. And so they're multiples of each other, so they're uh, indicated in this picture, and they're linearly dependent. Interestingly, you can see that these two vectors uh, um, do uh, if you if you think about the span of these two vectors, then you can take a linear combination of these two and produce any vector in R two. However, for these two, any linear combination of these two vectors only gets you vectors on the line that's defined by these vectors. I'm going back uh, in the negative direction here, but you get no vectors off that line. Uh, we're, we've been looking at the two-vector case, which is uh, at times can be misleading, but let's examine what we can say about it. Um, when you have just two vectors, then they are linearly dependent if uh, at least one is a multiple of the other. All right. So if there are multiples of each other, or one's a multiple of the other, then uh, they are linearly dependent. They're linearly independent if neither is a multiple of the other. So that works when you only have two vectors. Okay, so let's let's kind of expand our uh, scope here and um, look at a set with three vectors. So um, I took the set we were looking at initially, one, four, and two, one, and threw in another vector in there. Now, what do you think? Are these vectors linearly independent? Well, if we take a linear combination of them, set it equal to zero vector, right? this is just going back to the first definition we talked about, and then throw that in an augmented matrix, you end up with this, and what happens? Hmm, no need to do any row operations. Why is that? You know, let's think. How do we know if the system is, uh, or if the uh, system, we want to know, does the system have uh, only the trivial solution or not? Or another way is, does it have any free variables? Well, we can look at this one and say, yep, there's at least one free variable. There has to be because we have three variables and only two equations. So three columns, only two rows. So we have to have at least one free variable because we can have at most two pivot positions. 
right? So these vectors are linearly dependent. Okay, so here's a rule. If the set contains more vectors than there are entries in each vector, then the set's linearly dependent. And that's the case we just looked at. We had three vectors in R2. So more entries and more vectors than there are entries in each vector. Okay, there it is. Got uh, three vectors and uh, only two entries in each vector. Um, if we look at that augmented matrix and um, do some row operations on it, uh, we end up at this point. Now remember back here, just looking at this, you knew they were linearly dependent because you had more vectors than there were entries in each vector. But if we do these row operations and get this matrix in reduced echelon form, then we end up here. So if we wrote the solution um, of that system, uh, it looks like this, you know, from the second row you get x2 is going to equal 2x3, x1 is equal to negative x3, x3 is a free variable. Okay, so you can plug in uh, anything you want for x3 to generate specific solutions. For instance, if we said x3 equals 0, that's going to give us the trivial solution, right, because x3 is 0, and based on uh, what x1 and x2 are, defined in terms of x3, they're going to be 0 also. If we set x3 equal to 1, then we get x1 is negative 1, x2 is 2, and x3 is 1. Now, why do we, where, where does that apply to? Well, notice we're, we were trying to find a solution to this equation. Right? We were trying to see, can we find non-zero values for x1, x2, and x3, or at least one of them non-zero, um, so that we can produce the zero vector. And so um, this uh, general form of the solution tells us how to form uh, the values for x1, x2, and x3. So we can take our uh, values that we got for x3 equals 1, plug them in, so notice if we do that, we end up with negative 1 times 1 is negative 1, plus 4 here is negative 3, uh, I mean positive 3, minus 3 gives us 0, and in the second position we get negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2, plus 2 is 0. So we can find specific values uh, for these coefficients so that we can produce the 0 vector. Now notice from this, you could take that equation and solve it um, for negative 3, 2. So we can just take this over to the, um, the other side and notice that negative 3, 2 can be written as a linear combination of 1, 4, and 2, 1. Right? That's what we've just done here. We've written negative 3, 2 as a linear combination of the other two vectors. Another way of saying that is that negative 3, 2 is in the span of these other two vectors. All right? It's a linear combination of them, so that means it's in the span of those two vectors. And if you think back to our picture, that makes sense. Right here were uh, the first two vectors, 2, 1, and 1, 4. And remember before, I talked about how these span R2. Right? We can take a linear combination, we can scale each of them, and then add those scaled vectors together to produce any vector in R2. And uh, how do we know that? Well, just look at those two vectors, do a row operation, and look, we have a pivot position in every row. So by theorem 4, going back to section 1.4, theorem 4, that says that uh, the vectors span R2. Right. One of the things in theorem 4 is if you have a pivot position in every row, that means the columns of the original matrix span uh, the uh, space in which they live, which in this case we're in R2. Okay, so here's another rule that uh, relates to linear dependence. A set of two or more vectors is linearly dependent if and only if at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others. So back here we saw that negative uh, 3, 2 is a linear combination of the other two vectors. And in fact we could have solved this system 
for any of these three vectors. We could solve for any of these three vectors in terms of the other two. So any of these vectors is a linear combination of the other two. Okay, there you see it um, again. All right, moving on. Um, if Here's another rule, keep in mind. If a set contains the zero vector, then that set is linearly dependent. So if you have a zero vector in the set, then the set has to be linearly dependent. Here's an example of that. You got the zero vector. Notice that it's always going to be a free variable. Okay, the variable corresponding to the zero vector is always going to be free, and hence uh, the set would be linearly dependent. So, summary. Uh, set of vectors is linearly independent. If you take a linear combination, set it equal to zero, and you have only the trivial solution. So, so all the x's equal zero is the only solution. Equivalently, you throw all those, ma those vectors into uh, a matrix, tack on the zero vector for the augmented column, solve that system, and you get only the trivial solution. Okay, on the other hand, it's linearly dependent if the system has at least one free variable, because in that case you would have an infinite number of solutions. And uh, another way of characterizing linear dependence is a set's linearly dependent if at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others. Okay, and that's it for uh, section 1.7. Okay, we're going to start uh, today talking about linear transformations. Um, first, we're going to um, look back at um, uh, something you're familiar with from algebra or calculus. Um, and we'll just look at a, a basic function which uh, typically maps some real number to another real number. So we map the, the set of real numbers to the set of real numbers. So for example, um, here's a graph of a function f of x equals x squared. And so um, you um, input a real number, okay, x is a real number, you square it and you get another real number. So it's mapping the real numbers to the real numbers. Here's a little picture view of what's happening. Uh, here you're putting in uh, a real number into your function. And, and uh, for our purposes here, we know what the function does. It just squares the number. But you really don't have to know exactly what the function does. Um, you uh, know that what comes out, though, is another real number. So this notation down here at the bottom um, is red. F is a function that maps the real numbers to the real numbers. Um, now let's move to talking about uh, matrix transformations. And it's the same basic idea as a function. Um, it's just defined in terms of a matrix. So here T of X, T for transformation. Uh, so we, we apply our transformation to X. We multiply A times X, where A is some M by N matrix that defines this transformation. So Here's a picture view of what's going on. You have a vector from Rn that is the input to your transformation, and the output is a vector in Rm. Okay, so key here is that A is an M by N matrix, and the transformation occurs by multiplying A times X, so that means that X has to have as many entries as there are columns of A because a times x is just a linear combination of the columns, so we need an x component to match up with each column of A. And then each column of A has m entries, so when we do that linear combination, we're going to end up with a vector with m entries, and hence uh, we end up with a vector in Rm. Okay. So we say that T uh, maps Rn to Rm. So for example, here's a matrix A, and let's suppose that we have transformation T defined uh, on this matrix, so T of X equals A times X. So here's a uh, vector, X equals 2, 1, 
Then t of x is a times x, so we do that multiplication, take linear combination, and we end up with 1, 2. Okay, so we started with a vector in R2 and ended up with a vector in R2, which makes sense since A is 2 by 2. Here's another uh, example. We're applying the transformation to the vector 4, negative 2. So we multiply A times that vector, and uh, so we take the linear combination of the columns of A and end up with negative 2, 4. If we look at uh, it in a general case, so we just apply t to a generic vector x1, x2 from R2, uh, do the same way as we did the previous two, and notice we end up with x2, x1. So this transformation has just reversed the order of the elements. If you look back up at these other two, you know, 2, 1 went to 1, 2, 4, 2 went to or 4, negative 2 went to negative 2, 4. So that's what all this transformation is doing, swapping the order of the elements <clears throat> in the input vector. Um, if you look graphically at what's going on, um, here's one of the vectors, 2, 1, and here was uh, its transformation, which is 1, 2, and here's the other one, uh, 4, negative 2, which was transformed into negative 2, 4, and so if you can see from this picture that this transformation is uh, reflecting a vector across the line y equals x. Okay? Uh, this is uh, kind of a standard sort of thing that you see in computer graphics, and so um, matrix transformations are really the uh, fundamental element in computer graphics. So if you were to go on and take that course in the computer science department, um, you would be seeing a lot of matrix transformations. Okay, so to be a little more precise, we say a transformation T from Rn to Rm is a rule that assigns to each vector x in Rn a vector T of x in Rm. Now, more terminology. Here Rn is called the domain of T, and Rm is called the codomain of T. So Rn is where uh, the inputs to the, to the transformation come from. Rm is where the outputs come from. Okay, for a given x in Rn, T of x is called the image of x. Okay, so the image of x is just the vector that x maps to. If we look at all images, all possible images that we get under uh, the transformation T, this is called the range of T. Okay, so the range of T is all images uh, that we get when we map all possible uh, vectors x uh, through this transformation. Now you might be thinking that, well, isn't that the codomain? And the answer is sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Okay, in general, the range is a subset of the codomain. Um, in some cases, they are equal. In others, uh, they're not. There are elements of uh, the codomain that are not in the range. So not, in general, not everything in the codomain uh, is mapped to necessarily. Okay, so here's back to our previous example. Um, we've got uh, uh, this transformation maps R2 to R2. So the domain is R2, and uh, really the do domain is the first set that you see here when uh, you write down the transformation in this fashion. The codomain is also R2, so we're mapping vectors from R2 to vectors in R2 also. Now the range, let's think about that. Now the range, think of the range as just everything that gets mapped to under this transformation. And if you look at the picture, okay, that we had before, um, you, if you wanted to produce any vector, then you could figure out what vector you need that would map to it because you just need to reverse the order of the elements. So that means that the range of this transformation is all of R2. So the codomain and the range are equal in this case because any vector in R2 is mapped to. All right, 
Um, let's look at a different example. Okay, here's one defined by a different matrix A, still a 2 by 2 matrix. So this transformation also maps R2 to R2. Okay, so the domain is R2, the codomain is R2. Let's think about what is the range of this transformation. Well, let's play around with it for just a little bit. Um, let's take our uh, old vector 2, 1 and see what it maps to. If we apply the transformation to 2, 1, multiply A times 2, 1, and we end up with a vector 4, 8. Okay, how about another one? Negative 3, 2. A times that vector, take the linear combination, you end up with 1, 2. So let's look at the general case. What happens? We apply it to just a generic vector x1, x2, do that matrix multiplication, and we end up with this vector, which I can rewrite in this form um, to illustrate that um, the second component of the vector is just uh, twice the first one. And you see that in these other two that we did. All right here, the second component is two times the first. Here, again, second component is two times the first. So if we look at that graphically, um, every uh, vector that we can map to is of this form. Uh, the second component is two times the first. So that's actually all vectors on the line y equals 2x. Okay, second component is two times the first. Because here's 2, 1, and it maps to 4, 8. So it's on this line. Uh, the vector negative um, uh, 3, 2, I believe it was that we looked at, it mapped to 1, 2. So here it falls on the line. So no matter what vector you choose, it's going to be projected onto this line. So the range of this transformation is simply this line, the line y equals 2x, or all vectors of the form uh, x1, 2x1. So we're all vectors where the second component is just 2 times the first. So here, the range is, is not the same as the codomain. Right? The codomain is R2, but the range is just uh, this line, y equals 2x, so it's just part of the codomain. Okay, um, suppose uh, at this point we know, um, given a transformation in the matrix that defines it, we can compute t of x, okay? just multiply a times x. Um, a little more difficult question is this one. How do we determine if a given vector b is in the range of a particular transformation? Okay, so we're asking, is there a vector x that maps to b? Or is there a vector x such that t of x is equal to b? And since t of x equals a times x, we can say, does there exist a vector x such that a times x equals b? And now we're back into the realm of looking at systems of equations, um, and we're very familiar with that. Okay, so simply a system of equations to solve. All right, so let's go back to uh, that previous example. Um, and uh, suppose you were asked, is 612, is this vector 612 in the range of t? And we know that uh, since the range of t is all vectors on the line y equals 2x, then it should be, because the second component, 12, is 2 times the first. So let's solve the system of equations. All right, here's the augmented matrix corresponding to ax equals uh, b, where b is 6, 12. When we do one row operation, and here we go, uh, it's in echelon form, and clearly the system is consistent, so therefore, um, the vector is in the range of t. How about another one? How about 610? Now in this case, notice the second component is not 2 times the first, so you would expect this vector not to be in the range of t, which would mean that the system should be inconsistent. And as you see, do one row operation, and you end up with 0, 0, and then negative 2. So that's... Uh, Clearly, the system is inconsistent, so this vector is not in the range of t. Okay? So to determine if a vector is in the range of a linear transformation, you need to solve a system of equations. Okay, um, 
changing gears just a little bit, uh, previously we learned that um, uh, matrix uh, multiplication uh, has uh, certain properties, and one of them is uh, uh, this one, that if you multiply a matrix times the sum of two vectors, then you can distribute, okay? So A times U plus V is equal to AU plus AV. And similarly, if you multiply A times uh, a scalar times a vector, then you can move the scalar out. Okay, so A times CU is the same as C times AU. Okay, now I bring that up because um, that applies here. Okay, so a transformation is said to be linear if the following conditions hold that T of U plus V is T of U plus T of V, and T of C times U is C times T of U, okay? So these two conditions look very similar to what we have up there. And in fact, when, since we define uh, our transformation as uh, A times X, then these are really equivalent. Okay, so linear transformations preserve the operations of vector addition and scalar multiplication. And uh, we'll stop here uh, at this point, and uh, then the uh, next video will be for section 1.9, which will include more information on linear transformations. All right, we're going to start uh, with more on linear transformations. Uh, let's suppose we have a transformation T. And uh, suppose that all you know about T is that the vector 1, 0 gets mapped to 2, 0, 1. And you know that 0, 1 gets mapped to this vector. Um, so just from looking at this, you can tell that T maps R2 to R3. So we're taking vectors in R2 and we're mapping them to R3. But uh, how could we find a general rule for how to determine uh, t of uh, just a generic vector x? So t of x1, x2 for any vector uh, x1, x2. Well, to uh, get this just based on the information that we have, uh, we need to use uh, the properties of a linear transformation. So remember, we talked about these last time. Um, that uh, T of U plus V is T of U plus T of V, and uh, T of a scalar times a vector is that scalar times T of the vector. So let's uh, examine what we have. Notice that we can write a generic vector x1, x2 as x1 times 1, 0 plus x2 times 0, 1. Now remember, going backwards, we know about uh, we know what we get when we apply t to 1, 0, and we know what we get when we apply t to 0, 1. So keep that in mind. So we're going to write x1, x2 is x1 times 1, 0, x2 times 0, 1. So then I'm going to apply t to both sides of this equation. So I'll have t of x1, x2 is equal to t of this stuff here. Now, since t is a linear transformation, T of, this is like T of uh, uh, A plus, or U plus V, if you want to think of it like that. So we can break it up into T of U plus T of V. And then uh, this is like a constant times a vector. So T of a constant times a vector, we can rewrite as that constant times T of that vector. Okay, so we end up with this. And we know what t of 1, 0 is. It's just this vector. And we know what t of 0, 1 is. It's this vector. So here's what we end up with. And uh, so notice this is just a linear combination of these two vectors, um, which we can rewrite in this form as a matrix with those columns times uh, the uh, components x1, x2. So notice that we've written t of x, okay, generic vector x, as a times x. So now we have uh, the matrix with which to apply the transformation. 
And as you can see, that matrix is simply uh, the, uh, the vectors that you get when you apply t to the vector 1, 0, and 0, 1. All right now those columns that we just looked at 1 0 and 0 1 those are special vectors okay uh, and to talk about that let's first define the identity matrix so the identity matrix is an n by n matrix okay so it's square and we write it as i sub n okay and it has ones on the main diagonal main diagonal is like the 1 1 position 2 2 3 3 4 4 Okay, uh, so it has ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So here are a few examples. I2, so 2 by 2, got ones on the diagonal. I3 is a 3 by 3, ones on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. And here's I4, okay? So I sub n is just an n by n identity matrix. Now notice I sub 2. You see those columns that we were just dealing with, those vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. So they are the columns of the identity matrix. Okay, And they are so special that we give them their own names. We call them E1, E2, so forth to E sub n, depending on what n is. So this column here would be E sub 1, this one E sub 2 in a 2 by 2 matrix. Here, for 3 by 3, this would be E sub 1, this E sub 2, this E sub 3. Okay, so the, the, uh, what they actually are depends on the size of the matrix that we're talking about. And there it is, 2 by 2. Okay, now, as we saw in the previous example, if you know um, T of E1, T of E2, and so forth, if you know what you get when you apply the transformation to these uh, columns of the identity matrix, then you can compute T of X for any vector X. All right, that's what we showed in that earlier example. Okay, so here it is written in a little more formal manner. If we have T that maps Rn to Rm, then there is a unique matrix A such that T of X equals AX. In fact, A is the M by N matrix whose Jth column is the vector T of Ej, where Ej is the Jth column of the identity matrix. Okay, and so if you think back to the example we just did, this is exactly what we came out with. We came out with our matrix A was T of E1 and T of E2 because we had a 2 by 2 example. Okay, this matrix A is called the standard matrix for the linear transformation T. Okay, so it's a special matrix. Now, we're interested in determining conditions under which a transformation has an inverse, okay? So that means if you have a transformation that maps Rn to Rm, then given some B in Rm, can we find, the, find an X in Rn that maps to that B? Or can we find X such that T of X equals B? Okay, well, let's go back to our... Uh, uh, functions just defined in the real numbers, first of all. Okay, so before uh, we looked at the function uh, f of x equals x squared. All right, so, and this is what it looks like. Now, a couple things to notice. One is that, um, that you never get a negative number, right? When you plug in any x, no matter what x you plug in, since we're starting with real numbers, so number, no matter what real number x you plug in, you always get a non-negative value. Guys, okay, so keep that in mind. And also note that um, we can get the same y value. So if I drew a horizontal line, I would hit uh, a couple of uh, places on this graph. So for a given y value, we've got uh, a couple different x values that can produce that y value. So keep that in mind. All right, f, okay, f of x equals x squared that we just looked at is not invertible for two reasons. One, there exists y in r, okay, so there's some real numbers for which there's no x such that f of x equals y, okay? There's no x such that x squared equals y. Okay, so consider y equals negative 1, right? We cannot come up with a real number x such that x squared equals negative 1. 
That means that there are values in the codomain that are not in the range, right? The codomain here is the real numbers, but the range for this uh, function is all non-negative real numbers. So we can never get a, uh, a negative number when we apply this function. So we say that this function is not onto the real numbers. Okay, there are real numbers that don't get mapped to. All right, so I'm going to define that term in just a minute, but I want to give you a, a, a example, something that's pretty easy for you to, to grasp. Okay, so I said f is not invertible for two reasons. Here's the second one, um, that there exists y and r. Okay, so there exists real numbers y for which a squared is y and b squared is y, but a and b are not equal. Okay, that, and that's that horizontal line thing I was talking about earlier. So, for example, if y is 4, we can get that with 2, because 2 squared is 4. We can also get there with negative 2, because negative 2 squared is 4. So, if we were trying to get an inverse, right, if we started with 4, and we wanted to know um, how did we get there, well, we don't know, because it could have been from 2, or it could have been from negative 2. So we say that this function is not one-to-one -one because of this reason. Okay, so here's a little more formal way to look at it. We say a transformation from Rn to Rm is onto Rm, okay, onto the codomain, if each b in Rm is the image of, or another way to think of it is, is mapped to by, at least one x in Rn. So every b in the codomain is mapped to by at least one x in the domain. So every b gets mapped to. Okay, so this means that no matter what vector b you choose from Rm, there's some x that maps to it. So for every b in Rm, there's some x such that t of x equals b. And since t of x equals a times x, this means that for every b, there's some x such that a times x equals b, right? If there's uh, an x such that t, x, t of x is b, then it has to be an, uh, the same x that makes a times x equal b, right? Now, when is it true that no matter what right-hand side you have, uh, you'll always have a solution? Well, that's true when you have a pivot position in every row of A. Okay, so if there's a pivot position in every row of A, then the transformation will be on to. Okay, let's talk about one to one. Transformation from Rn to Rm is said to be one to one if each B in Rm is the image of or is mapped to by at most one X in Rn at most one. So remember back to the function f of x, f of x equals x squared. Um, this wasn't true because you could get to four from two and from negative two. So there was a, an element in the, the range that was mapped to by uh, more than one element in the, in the domain. So it wasn't one to one. Here, one to one means each b in Rm is mapped to by at most one x in Rn. So that means that for each b in Rm, there's at most one vector x such that t of x equals b. Okay, so that means that um, since t of x equals ax, uh, if we look at the system ax equals b, it can't have an infinite number of solutions because then there would be more than one x that maps to that b. And if our system can't have an infinite number of solutions, that means it can't have free variables. Okay, so x equals b can have no free variables. And uh, if it has no free variables, that means there must be a pivot position in each column of A. All right, so the transformation is one-to-one -one if there's a pivot position in each column column of A. Alright, so one to one, 
there's a pivot position in each column. On to, there must be a pivot position in each row. Okay, so that's how you can keep straight one to one and on to. This is section 2.1 um, on matrix operations. Just some um, basics out of the way first. Uh, we refer to uh, an M by N matrix A uh, as a matrix with M rows and N columns. And uh, the individual elements in the matrix we denote by uh, lowercase a with a subscript um, IJ, where I is the row index, J is the column index. The diagonal entries uh, in a matrix A are those where the row and column indices are the same, so like A11, A22, and so forth. These elements we call the main diagonal of A. Um, a diagonal matrix is a square matrix where all the entries off the main diagonal are zero. So the only place you can have non-zero uh, values is on the diagonal. So here are a couple of diagonal matrices. Notice that the, the key is off the diagonal, um, you have all zeros. So the main diagonal is just uh, uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, and so forth, um, 3, 3 in this case. So off the diagonal, off the main diagonal, you have all zeros. It's okay to have a zero on the diagonal. We really don't care what's on the diagonal. We just want zeros off the diagonal. Um, here's another uh, diagonal uh, matrix. This one has a, a name. We call it the identity matrix. So it's a um, diagonal matrix because everything off the diagonal is zeros. And uh, the zero matrix is uh, technically a diagonal matrix because everything off the main diagonal is zero. We say that two matrices are equal if they have the same size, so the same number of rows, same number of columns, and their corresponding entries are equal. So the 1-1 one, one entry in one is equal to the 1-1 one, one entry in another. In general, the ijth entry in one is equal to the ijth entry in the other. We can compute the sum of two matrices. We can add two matrices together. Um, this is defined if both matrices are the same size. So you have to do the same number of rows and same number of columns. And in this case, uh, the uh, ijth entry in the sum is just uh, the, the uh, sum of the uh, ijth entries in each of the original matrices. Um, so here's an example one that uh, this sum cannot be computed because these matrices are not the same size. Um, here's one where we can compute the sum. And notice uh, the 7 here is just the 3 plus 4 uh, to get the 3, it's this 2 plus 1, and so forth. So to get uh, the ijth entry over here, you sum the corresponding ijth entries in the two original matrices. We can compute the scalar multiple of a matrix in the same way we compute the scalar multiple of a vector. We just multiply each entry by that scalar. So here's an example, multiply three times each entry in this matrix, and uh, we produce uh, this one. Uh, <clears throat> your book lists some properties of addition and scalar multiplication of matrices. Um, the first three are uh, regarding uh, addition. So um, you'll find that, that since addition of matrices is, is defined essentially the same as addition of real numbers, then a lot of those same properties carry over. So A plus B is B plus A. Uh, the second one um, allows you to um, associate the parentheses uh, as you'd like, so that's the associative property. And uh, if you add any matrix to the zero matrix, uh, you get the same matrix back. Then the, the last three were regarding scalar multiplication. 
and essentially um, these say that you can uh, kind of stick the scaler wherever you'd like to, wherever it's convenient. Um, um, it, it all is uh, equivalent. Okay, let's move on to matrix multiplication because matrix multiplication is uh, not defined um, simply as matrix addition is. Mm, it's a little more complicated. It's not just multiplying the corresponding entries together. So here we go. Um, if A is an M by N matrix, and the sizes are important here. Um, so suppose A is M by N and B is N by P. Okay, so that's the key. Um, the number of columns in the first has to equal the number of rows in the second for the product to be defined. Okay, um, so if you have that situation uh, and uh, we say that the columns of B are B1 through BP, then we define the product AB as the M by P matrix, and notice that the M is number of rows in A, P is number of columns in B. So uh, we kind of always look to see if these inner dimensions match up. So the N here matches up with the N here, and that means the product is defined, and then the, the product itself, the dimensions of it, will be the first, uh, the number of rows, which is M, uh, by the number of columns of of B, so it will be M by P. Okay, so how do we compute A times B? Well, notice what this says. It's the M by P matrix whose columns are A times B1 out to A times BP. That is, um, we want to multiply A times B, then we look at it as A times each of the columns of B. Okay, so the first entry now the first column of the product is A times the first column of B. The second column of the product is A times the second column of B, and so forth. So notice that each column of the product, each column of AB, is, is of the form A times B1 or A times B2. And we know that, that when we compute A times some column, then we are taking a linear combination of the columns of A using uh, the entries in the vector as the weights. So to get the first column of A times B, we're taking a linear combination of the columns of A using the first column of B as the weights. To get the second column, another linear combination of the columns of A using the entries in the second column of B as the weights, and so forth. Okay, so if we want to compute uh, the product AB, uh, where here are our matrices A and B, then we're going to do it as I just described. First, uh, note that A is a 3 by 2 matrix and B is 2 by 2. So we check to see if the 2 here matches up with the 2 here, which it does. And then we look at the outer dimensions, the 3 and the 2, and that will be the uh, dimensions of the product. So our product will be 3 by 2 in this case. All right, to get the first column of the product, it's A times the first column of B. So here's A, first column of B, 4, negative 1, and this is just a linear combination. So 4 times the first column of A minus 1 times the second column. And uh, this is what we get. Do the same thing to get the second column of the product. It's A times the second column of B. Second column B is uh, 1, 8. So we take that linear combination, 1 times this first column of A plus 8 times the second column. Do that linear combination. And now we have our first uh, and second columns of the product. And uh, so we're done. There is A times B. Um, there's a, another way to compute AB. Probably most of you learned this when you took algebra, college algebra probably. Um, notice uh, that it's defined in terms of inner products. Okay? So the ijth entry in the product AB is the inner product of row I of A with column J of B.
So let's see how that works. So this is back to our same A and B. And to get the 1-1 one, one entry in the product, um, then it's going to be row 1 of A times uh, column 1 of B. Actually, these are uh, should not be A's. These should be the, the product. I'm talking about the product here. So row 1 of A times column 1 of B. Um, do that inner product. So it's going to be 3, 2, inner product with 4, negative 1 to give you 10 in this case, and so forth. So to get to the 3, 2 entry of the product, it's row 3 of A times column 2 of B. Okay, so 5 times 1 plus 4 times 8 and gives you 37. And so there you go. Um, you have the uh, same matrix as we ended up with before. Okay, now you should note that um, since matrix multiplication is, is not defined simply, because it's not a simple operation like matrix addition is, um, then properties of real numbers uh, that apply to addition, uh, multiplication do not follow over to matrix multiplication. You know, they did with matrix addition, they don't with matrix multiplication. So, some warnings. Um, if you're dealing with real numbers, A times B equals B times A. That does not hold true for matrices. For matrices, A times B is not necessarily equal to B times A. Of course, it sometimes could be, but in general, A times B is not equal to B times A. Uh, one thing, one reason is that sometimes they're not even both defined, right? Not even both defined. Maybe you can multiply A times B but you might not be able to multiply B times A, and uh, vice versa. However, even if they are both defined, uh, you can't guarantee they'll be equal. Um, so here's an example. Here's a matrix A times B, and we get this product. If we reverse the order, multiply B times A, we get a totally different matrix. Okay? So just because you can multiply both, compute both products, uh, doesn't mean that they'll be the same result. So don't make that mistake. Uh, second warning. Uh, for real numbers, if you know that A times B equals A times C, and you know that A is not equal to zero, you can divide both sides by A and end up with B equals C. Can't do that with matrices. Uh, if AB is AC, that doesn't mean that B equals C. Okay, here's an example of that. Here's a matrix A. Uh, A times B is this matrix. Here's A times C. Get the same matrix, but B and C are clearly different. And another one, uh, the last warning. Uh, for real numbers, if A times B is equal to zero, you can assume that either A or B uh, is equal to zero, or perhaps both are equal to zero. Not true for matrices. You have a product of two matrices that equals the zero matrix. Um, that doesn't mean that A or B is equal to the zero matrix. And here's an example of that. Here's matrix A times B, and we end up with the zero matrix. But neither of these is equal to the zero matrix. Far from it, in fact. Okay, some properties of matrix multiplication. Um, it, you have the associative property, so you can move the parentheses around, but notice that the order uh, that the matrices appear is unchanged. Okay, so we can't move uh, the, we can't change the order that the matrices appear. Can't change the order in which we do the multiplication. Uh, we can distribute either from the left or from the right here in numbers two or three. Oops, back, back, back. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and uh, if we have a scalar, we can move it uh, wherever we'd like. And apparently I thought that was quite uh, um, an uh, important thing since I put an exclamation mark there. Um, and uh, any matrix multiplied by the identity is just itself. Now notice that I'm assuming A is M by N here. So if I multiply on the left, I have to multiply by the M by M identity. Whereas if I multiply on the right, I have to multiply by the N by N identity. Okay, um, one other thing, the transpose of a matrix. 
uh, is uh, um, computed by uh, taking the uh, ijth entry of uh, the original matrix, and that becomes the jith entry of the transpose. So, for example, um, if this is your matrix A, then I take the 1, 1 entry here, becomes 1, 1 entry here. 1, 2 entry becomes the 2, 1 entry, and so forth. I mean, uh, perhaps an easier way to think of it is that the columns of A become the rows of A transpose. So, column 1 is 3, 1, 5. Row 1 of the transpose, 3, 1, 5, and so forth. Or alternatively, the rows of A become the columns of the transpose. So here's a row, first row here, 3, 2, first column here, 3, 2, and so forth. Some properties of the transpose. Um, if I take the transpose of the transpose of a matrix, I'm back where I started. You can look here. If I take the transpose of this matrix, um, then I end up with A. Row 1 here becomes column 1 of A, and so forth. So the transpose of the transpose is the original matrix. Um, transpose of a sum is the sum of the transposes, number 2. Um, can move a scalar around, number 3. Number 4, kind of interesting. If you want to take the transpose of a product, that is the product of the transposes, but in reverse order. Okay, reverse order. So here's an example of that. If I want to compute the transpose of a product, AB, all right, so here's A, here's B. I want to compute their products, then take the transpose. So I compute the product. Here it is, transpose that, and um, end up with this matrix. Um, or I could do it this way. Transpose each of them initially, but reverse the order that I do the multiplication. So here's B transpose, right? Here's B up here. So I take the transpose that's here. Here's A transpose. And I compute that product, and uh, I get the same thing as I did previously. Okay, let's uh, talk about the inverse of a matrix. First, let's go back and think about the inverse of just a scalar, a real number A. Um, the multiplicative inverse, as opposed to the additive inverse, uh, of a number A is just 1 over A, assuming A is not equal to 0, because uh, if we multiply A times 1 over A, we get 1, or 1 over A times A equals 1. And 1 is the identity element for multiplication. Um, we can use the same idea for matrices. The inverse of a matrix A exists only under certain conditions. So not every matrix has an inverse, just like not every number has an inverse. Zero doesn't have an inverse. Okay, we're going to write the inverse of A as A with a superscript negative 1, and we have A times A inverse, we just read this as A inverse, equals the identity matrix, okay, this is not the number one, this is the identity matrix, and also A inverse times A is the identity matrix. Okay, one of the requirements for A inverse to exist is that A is a square matrix, okay, and you have to have that so that you can multiply on the left and on the right by the same matrix. Okay, let's start off by talking about finding the uh, inverse of a 2 by 2. Okay, in this case, there happens to be a, a, a specific formula for the inverse. So if we have a 2 by 2 matrix A that looks like this, A, B, C, D, then A inverse exists if A times D minus B times C is not equal to 0. Okay, so that's A times D, so multiply the elements on the main diagonal and subtract off the product of the elements on the uh, off diagonal. So A times D minus B times C. I call it the crisscross applesauce. A times D minus B times C. Alright, so if that's not zero, A inverse exists and here's a formula for it. Notice that we divide by AD minus BC. That's why it has to be non-zero. And then the matrix is uh, formed from A by swapping uh, 
the a and the numbers in the a and d positions okay so we swap a and d and negate b and c okay so that's how i remember it. you swap a and d negate b and c so for example here's a matrix a if we look at uh, the ad minus bc that's four times negative three so negative twelve minus negative 9 times 2, that's negative 18, so negative 12 minus negative 18 would be negative 12 plus 18, which is 6, so we're dividing 1 over 6, this thing here is 6, and then we swap the 4 and the negative 3, okay, they swap positions and negate the negative 9 and 2, and uh, then multiply that out, and we get this matrix, okay, so that's the inverse of A, and if you check, multiply A times A inverse, you get the identity matrix. If we multiply A inverse times A, we also get the identity matrix. Okay, let's look at another example. Here's another 2 by 2 uh, matrix. Um, but, uh, oops, in this case, if we multiply, do the AD minus BC, we got 1 times 4 minus 2 times 2, which gives us 0. So that tells us that this matrix does not have an inverse. Um, and if you look uh, at that matrix a little bit, you see that uh, the second column is just two times the first. Okay, those columns are multiples of each other, so they're linearly dependent. If we look at A in reduced echelon form, um, it has a row of all zeros. Right, so we have a free variable. Um, uh, to the point, we say that A is not row equivalent to the identity matrix, okay? And it turns out that if A, any matrix A, if it's not row equivalent to the identity matrix, then it will not be invertible. And if it is row equivalent to the identity matrix, it will be invertible. Okay? Um, we don't have a formula for the inverse of a 3 by 3. Um, so we need to develop a method for computing the inverse or for determining that the inverse does not exist. So what we'd like to do is find a matrix, let's just call it B, such that A times B is equal to the identity matrix. Okay, so if we assume that A is n by n, then that means that B also has to be n by n. And we'll uh, denote the columns of B by these uh, column vectors, b1, b2, through bn. So, recalling from the previous section, if we multiply a times b, we can write that in this form, a times uh, the matrix, here's b, the columns of b, b1 through bn, and that equals just a times b1 in the first column, a times b2 in the second column, and so forth. So, you remember this, that A times B, um, you get the first column as um, a linear combination of the columns of A using the elements in B1 as the multipliers and so forth for the other columns. So remember we want that to equal the identity matrix. So here's the identity matrix. So we want A times B1 to be the first column of the identity matrix, A times B2 to be the second column, and so forth. So in order to determine uh, the matrix B here, we need to solve N systems of equations. Okay, so if we solve those N systems of equations, we'll have uh, A inverse if it exists. All right, so let's uh, look at this matrix uh, and see if we can uh, follow that method. Um, it's a two by two, so we could just use the, the formula we have, but let's try applying uh, this method that we just discussed. All right, so A times B, A times B1, A times B2, and we want that to equal the identity matrix. So we have these two systems to solve. A times B1 is 1, 0. A times B2 is 0, 1. So here we go. To solve this system, um, set up an augmented matrix, um, do some row operations, and uh, notice that A, we get... To this point, you see that A is row equivalent to the identity matrix, so that means that A inverse does exist. And here's the first column. B1 um, is negative 1 half, 3 half. So that's the first column of the inverse. And uh, 
To get the second column, we solve this system. A times B2 equals 0, 1, the second column of the identity matrix. And again, I set up my augmented matrix, tack on 0, 1, do some row operations, um, and um, notice that the row operations that I'm doing here are exactly the same ones that I did up here. So first, multiply row 1 by 1 fourth. Same thing down here. Then 9 times row 1 plus row 2, same as down here, and so forth. And that carries through the whole way. And if you give that some thought, um, you'd say, oh yeah, that makes sense because the row operations that I'm doing are based on the entries in A. Uh, right? I'm trying to get A in reduced echelon form. So since A doesn't change, same, same A here and up here, um, then it makes sense that the row operations I do don't change. Um, the only thing that's changed is what's in the last column. Okay, And so we end up with this for um, B2. So I've got my two columns of B, which uh, is what uh, the inverse of A is. And um, and yet if you look at this, you think, well, that seems like to be a lot of repetitive work, and it is. And so um, we have a more efficient method, and that is to solve both systems at one time. Okay, so instead of just tacking on one column uh, in an augmented matrix, we tack on both columns or the whole identity matrix, depending on what size your uh, original matrix is. And here we go through that same sequence of row operations, and we end up with the two columns of B that we found earlier. Okay? And this, of course, is the inverse of A. Now, um, in general, what this looks like is you start off with this matrix, okay, A on one side, then augment on the identity matrix, and you do row operations until you get A in reduced echelon form. And what you're aiming for is to make it look like the identity matrix. And um, like I said, that may or may not be possible depending on A. If it is, then you'll end up with the identity matrix here and uh, the inverse of A on the right. All right. So that's what you're aiming for. And just while we're here looking at this, notice that we could go backwards because we know that all these row operations are reversible. We could go backwards and look what happens. We, we start off with A inverse with the identity tacked on and we get back here and we can make A inverse look like the identity matrix. And so uh, with A over here, so that tells you that if you wanted to take the inverse of A inverse, then you just get the original matrix A back. So the inverse of A inverse is just A. Okay, so what happens if A is not invertible? Um, in this case, uh, it's not row equivalent to the identity. So here's the example we had before where the second column is a multiple of the first. Tack on the identity matrix. Um, do one row operation here and you get to this point and you say, oh, A is not row equivalent to the identity matrix and hence I can't get it in this form where I've got the identity and then A inverse. That tells you that, that, that the matrix A does not have an inverse. Okay, So if you can't get A to look like the identity matrix by doing row operations, then A is not invertible or A inverse does not exist. All right, uh, now this method works no matter what size your matrix is, so I scaled it up for a three by three. Okay, start off with this matrix A and uh, tack on the three by three identity matrix and go through some row operations. A um, lot of uh, arithmetic here. And if you look at the last matrix I have here, look, uh, the first three columns look like the identity matrix. And so sitting over here would be the inverse of A. All right. So this, these last three columns will be the inverse of my matrix A. Um, if you know A inverse, 
then solving AX equals B is trivial, right? Because our whole focus in this course is uh, solving AX equals B, solving systems of equations. And so if you know A inverse, then um, it turns out that uh, it's uh, super simple to solve a system of equations involving A. Um, and basically here's the rationale. Um, start off with AX equals B. Um, and you know A inverse exists, then that means you can multiply both sides of your system by A inverse. So I do that. And the reason to do that is because if you look over here, remember we can uh, reassociate the parentheses, and so we can end up with A inverse times A together. And the advantage of that is that that equals the identity matrix. So we end up with just the identity matrix times X, and anything times the identity matrix is just that anything. So I times X is X. So X is simply A inverse B. So if you know A inverse, then you don't need to do row operations. You don't need to do any of that stuff. Just multiply A inverse times B and you have the solution to your system. Okay, clearly that's going to save you a lot of work if you have A inverse. So if I have this matrix A and this vector b and I want to solve ax equals b, if I don't know a inverse, then I got to go through, you know, set up my augmented matrix, do all these row operations, and I end up here with my solution for negative 7, negative 16. Okay, but if I know a inverse, okay, so I know a inverse, so here's a, here's b, and I know a inverse, then to solve ax equals b, as I said, just multiply A inverse times B, and here's your solution. All right, so back, went through all this work to get 4, negative 7, negative 16. Here, if you know A inverse, all you do is simple uh, multiply matrix times a vector, and you have the solution. Now, of course, the downside is that most of the time you don't have A inverse, and uh, to get A inverse, um, well, you saw what uh, work is required in that. More work than simply uh, going back and through uh, to do this because to find A inverse for a 3 by 3, we had to solve, uh, let's go back, right? We had to solve uh, three systems of equations. Um, just to solve this system, you need to solve one system of equations. Um, but uh, if you know A, A inverse, then solving system is trivial. Okay, um, let's see. Your book lists some properties of matrix inverses. This one we've already talked about. If you take the inverse of A inverse, you get A back. Um, if you have the inverse of a product, so AB quantity inverse, that is uh, the uh, product of the inverses, but in reverse order. So B inverse times A inverse instead of A inverse times B inverse. And uh, if you take the inverse of a transpose of a matrix, that's uh, equivalent to uh, transposing the inverse. Okay, the main part of section 2.3 is the invertible matrix theorem. And um, this theorem actually ties together everything that we've done so far in the course, actually. Um, everything from chapter one and uh, up through chapter two, where we are. Um, so, this theorem uh, says if you have a given n by n matrix A, the following are equivalent. Okay, that means that they're either all true or all false. Okay, the first two look like this one, A is an invertible matrix. Um, and uh, number two, A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. So that should make sense because um, um, the way we found out if A is invertible is to do those row operations and try to um, get it in the form of the identity matrix. And if we could do that, then that means A is invertible. If we couldn't do that, then A is not invertible. Okay, another statement, A has N pivot positions. So this is actually the key to the whole theorem, in my opinion. Everything here you can relate to pivot positions, and that's how um, uh, I would recommend that you approach this. So um, looking ahead, 
Okay, you need to know what this theorem says. You need to be able to um, write down parts of this theorem. Um, I don't suggest that you memorize it um, because I think that's uh, that's somewhat difficult. Um, but I don't. Uh, so don't memorize it unless that works for you. But the way I would suggest that you uh, remember it is to relate everything back to pivot positions because that's what we've done up to now and that should still work for you. So let's look at these next three. Okay, number four says the equation ax equals zero has only the trivial solution. Okay, so um, if it has only the trivial solution, then that means that... Uh, Er, that there are no free variables. That means every column of A is a pivot column. And so that means since they're in columns, there's n uh, pivot columns, so n pivot positions. Okay, so that relates back to pivot positions. Uh, number five, the columns are linearly independent. How do we know that? Well, again, no free variables, so pivot position in every column are in pivot positions. And number six, uh, the transformation x to ax is 1 to 1. And how do we know that? Well, that means we want to have a unique solution uh, to every system ax equals b, um, or at most one solution. Okay, no uh, um, multiple solutions for any right-hand side, so that means that we can't have any free variables. So again, pivot position in every column. So 4, 5, and 6 all relate to the fact that you need a pivot position in every column. These next four relate to having a pivot position in every row, Okay, which again, since it's an n by n matrix, um, that would mean you have uh, n pivot positions. So number 7 says ax equals b has at least one solution for each b and rn. So if that's true, that means that system is consistent no matter what the right-hand side is. That only happens when you have a pivot position in every row. In rows means in pivot positions. Columns of A span are in. Okay? That again means that uh, there's a pivot position in every row. So that no matter what you put on the right side, um, the system will be consistent. So again, pivot position in every row, so in pivot positions. And number nine, uh, x to ax is on to rn. So that means, again, there's a solution no matter what the right-hand side uh, of the system ax equals b is. So there has to be a pivot position in every row. And then last, uh, a transpose is invertible. Uh, it's kind of a tag along there, but if a is invertible, a transpose is invertible. Okay. Um, so I've, I've uh, taken a few of the even-numbered problems from this section just to kind of talk through those to give you uh, an idea about how to, to go through some of the logic here. So here's one. Is it possible for a 5 by 5 matrix to be invertible when its columns do not span R5? Okay, well, let's see. If the columns don't span R5, then that means that there's not a pivot position in every row. And that means that the matrix is not row equivalent to the identity matrix. Or you could say that uh, there's less than five pivot positions. Uh, either one of those gets you to um, the matrix. It cannot be um, in invertible. All right, here's one. We've got a six by six matrix. And the equation CX equals V is consistent for every V in R6. Is it possible that for some v, the equation cx equals v has more than one solution? Okay, well, if cx equals v is consistent for every v in R6, then that means that there must be a pivot position in every row. And since this is a square matrix, if there's a pivot position in every row, then there's also one in every column. And if there's a pivot position in every column, that means there's no free variables. And so hence, any system will, uh, uh, or there will be no system that has um, an infinite number of solutions. Only a unique solution. All right.
let's suppose h is n by n and the equation hx equals c is inconsistent for some c. Does the system hx equals zero have non-trivial solutions? Hmm. Well, if hx equals c is inconsistent for some right-hand side, then there can't be a pivot position in every row. And that means that there can't be a pivot position in every column, since h is a square matrix. And if there's not a pivot position in every column, then that means you have free variables, and hence there are non-trivial solutions to hx equals zero. Okay, another one. If L is n by n and Lx equals zero has only the trivial solution, do the columns of L span Rn? Well, if Lx equals zero has only the trivial solution, then that means there's no free variables. So we have a pivot position in every column of L, which means we have a pivot position in every row of L, since L is square. And if there's a pivot position in every row, then that means that the columns span are in. All right, let's move on to talk about uh, invertible linear transformations. Uh, let's suppose we have a, a linear transformation T from Rn to Rn uh, that's defined by the matrix A. So A here would be n by n. All right, for any x... Uh, we can compute ax, right? For any x, we can compute t of x or a times x. Um, let's think about going backwards, though. Suppose you have some b, and you would like to know, um, is there a unique vector x such that ax equals b? Okay, so... so Think of B as being in the codomain, and we want to go backwards to see what X mapped to that B. All right, well, this works if T is both one-to-one -one and onto. Okay, so for us to be able to go backwards and find out what X mapped to B, we can do that if we know that T is one-to-one -one and onto. Okay, so why is that? Well, if T is onto, then that means that every B in Rn um, is mapped to by at least one X. Right? Every B is mapped to by at least one X. So that means that if we go backward, there's an X to go back to. Um, if it's one to one, then that means that every B is mapped to by at most one X. Right, every b is mapped to by at most one x. So that means that if we can go backwards, there's only one vector to go backwards to. Right? We don't have multiple vectors mapping to the same b. So if you put those two things together, t is one to one and onto, then every b is mapped to by exactly one x, okay? which means there's a unique solution. So how do we find that x? Given a particular vector b, how do we find out what x mapped to it? Well, we need to solve ax equals b. And the way to do that, uh, if we know that a is invertible, is um, to uh, simply multiply a inverse times b. So the matrix that defines the inverse transformation t inverse is simply a inverse. Okay, so, so a takes you... Um, forward, right, from x, you multiply uh, a times x to get b in the codomain. To go backwards, to reverse that, um, you multiply uh, by a inverse. So t is defined by a, t inverse is defined by a inverse. Another way to look at it is this. Um, under what conditions does there exist a unique vector x such that ax equals b for every b in Rn? All right. When can we know that the system ax equals b is always consistent and always has a unique solution? Well, it's consistent uh, if there's a pivot position in every row of a. 
All right, AX equals B is consistent for every B if there's a pivot position in every row of A. And if the solution is unique, then there has to be no free variables. So that means there has to be a pivot position in every column of A. So backing up, it's consistent. Uh, if it's consistent for every B, we have to have a pivot position in every row. If there's a unique solution, um, then that means we have no free variables, so we have to have a pivot position in every column. Okay, so t of x equals ax is invertible when a has a pivot position in every row and column, i.e. when a has n pivot positions, i.e. when a is invertible. Okay, um, we're going to talk about determinants. Um, the determinant uh, of a matrix is just a scalar value that uh, is associated with any square matrix. So we only talk about the determinant of a square matrix. Um, the notation is uh, DET of A, or sometimes you see it with A, it looks like absolute value of A with the um, vertical bars around A. Uh, we've actually already seen the determinant in the 2x2 two two case. Um, if uh, we have A is just this generic matrix A, B, C, D, then the determinant of A is A times D minus B times C. And we've seen that because uh, we saw that in the uh, little formula for the inverse of a 2x2. Two two. So remember we uh, multiplied by 1 over AD minus BC, so we're multiplying by 1 over the determinant of the matrix, um, and then we kind of rearrange the terms and negate a couple uh, to get the inverse of a matrix. So notice that, um, at least in the case of a 2 by 2 matrix, we can see that the inverse exists when the determinant of the matrix is not equal to 0. Here in this case, if AD minus BC is equal to zero, then A inverse does not exist. And it turns out that this is true for any square matrix. If uh, the determinant is not equal to zero, that means the matrix is invertible. And uh, if it's invertible, then the determinant is not equal to zero. So this is actually another installment in the invertible matrix theorem, okay, which we had from section uh, 2.3. Um, so Determinant of A not equal to zero is logically equivalent to A is invertible. All right, if we move up beyond a two by two, there's no nice formula uh, for computing the determinant like there was for a two by two. And we use a method called cofactor expansion. And this method works for any size matrix, uh, uh, three by three on up. Um, in this method, we have to choose a row or column to expand about, okay? That's what we call it. We're going to choose a row or column to expand about. And you'll see as we go on that it's advantageous to choose a row or a column that has the most zeros in it because that eliminates some of the terms. But um, for our first uh, cut here, um, I'm just going to uh, expand about the first row. And... Um, I've kind of color-coded this to make it easier for you to see where the, the terms come from. Okay, so if we expand about the first row, we start with the first entry, which is the 5, and then we multiply 5 by the determinant of the matrix that you're left with if you eliminate the row in a column that contain the 5. So if you eliminate the first row and eliminate the first column, um, then you see that you have this little 2x2 two two matrix that's sitting right here, okay? And so we're going to take the determinant of that. And then we move over to the next entry in the first row, which is the 2, and we multiply that by the determinant of the matrix that you get if you eliminate the first row and the second column, okay? The, the row and the column containing the 2. So we're left with the 0, 2 here, and the negative 5, 7 here. Okay, so that's how we get this matrix here. Then we continue moving across the first row. Then we've got a 4, and we multiply 4 by the matrix that you get if you eliminate the first row and the third column. 
Okay, eliminate the row in the column containing the 4. So you're left with this little 2 by 2 here, 0, 3, 2, negative 4, and that's what we have here. Now notice I haven't combined these terms at all. I've just written them out here, um, and that's because um, there's a method for combining the terms. Okay, we have to put them together somehow. And um, basically, um, you apply a coefficient uh, to each term, which is negative 1 to the i plus j, where i and j are the row and column indices uh, corresponding to that term. So if we look back up the 5, 5 came from row 1, column 1. So the coefficient that we put in front of that term is minus 1 to the 1 plus 1, because 5 came from row 1, column 1. All right, then for the next term, this one, the 2, the blue term, came from this entry here. The 2 is in the first row, second column, so that means the coefficient here is minus 1 to the 1 plus 2. Row 1, column 2, that's where the 1 plus 2 comes from. And then for the 4, the green term, okay, it's in the first row, third column, so we have minus 1 to the 1 plus 3 as the coefficient uh, in front of that term. Okay, and so if we multiply and add, uh, then what do we get? We get minus 1 to the 1 plus 1, so that's minus 1 squared. So that's just plus 1 times 5, so we bring down 5. And then the determinant here, remember it's just the crisscross, 3 times 7 minus negative 4 times negative 5, so that's what we have here. All right, then moving on here to the blue, we got minus 1 to the 1 plus 2, that's minus 1 cubed. So that's negative 1 times 2, gives us the negative 2 here, times the determinant, which is 0 times 7, minus 2 times negative 5. All right, then moving over to the next term, the green one comes from the 4, and that's first row, third column. So that's the minus 1 to the 1 plus 3, which is minus 1 to the 4th, which is positive 1 times 4, and so you get a plus 4 uh, in front of that term times the determinant, which is 0 times negative 4 minus 2 times 3. All right, and then uh, combining a little more, we got 21 uh, minus 20 here times 5. Then we've got 0 plus 10, so just a 10 there. And then here's 0 minus 6, so negative 6 there. And we combine, and we end up with negative 39 for the determinant of this matrix. Okay, now just uh, a little aside, it's really not necessary to explicitly compute this minus 1 to the i plus j term every time. Um, if you just look, here's a 4 by 4, where I've put as the entries in the matrix just the row index plus the column index. So 1, 1 position, we got 1 plus 1. 1, 2 position, 1 plus 2, and so forth. So if we look at what that is, we end up with these numbers. And remember, we want minus 1 raised to each of these powers. And so you can see, since they all differ by 1, going from a, one term to an adjacent term, either in the same row or the same column, you either go from a, an even number to an odd or an odd to an even. So in any case, uh, alternating terms are always going to have opposite signs. And you always start off in the upper left with a plus, plus 1, because that's minus 1 to the 1 plus 1 or minus 1 squared. So you always know that the, the 1, 1 position is a plus term. And then everything alternates uh, after that. So it's always plus, minus, plus, minus. Um, so if you know the, the sign that goes with the first term in the row or the column that you're expanding about, um, then you only need to alternate terms after that. Right? So you always have this checkerboard patterns, and um, you just need to alternate terms based on the sign of the uh, position where you start. So um, let's look at, uh, at this matrix again, it's the same one, but I'm going to expand about the second column this time, all right, just for something different. Now, first note that the second column, or the first entry there is the 2, and it's in the 1, 2 position, 
So minus 1 to the 1 plus 2, if you want to compute it like that, minus 1 cubed, that's a negative 1. So this is a negative position here. Um, or you can say, I always know that the 1, 1 position is a plus, so this is plus, the next one over has to be a minus. That's, that's typically how I do it. All right, so we end up with minus 2 times... Uh, again, the determinant of the matrix that you get if you eliminate the, the row and the column containing the 2. So we end up with a 0, 2, negative 5, 7. So that's where we end up with that matrix. All right, then we move to the 3. Now since this the 2 was a negative, the 3 is going to be a plus. And um, we eliminate the row and the column containing the 3. So we're left with 5, 4, 2, 7. Um, and then we move on to the negative 4. So again, uh, if you forget, we'll go back to the 1, 1. That's a plus. Moving over, that's a minus. Moving down, that's a plus. Moving down again, that's a minus. So we're going to subtract off. That's where the minus comes from. Minus negative 4 times the, the matrix that you get if you eliminate the last row in the middle column. So we've got 5, 0, 4, negative 5. All right, we compute those determinants. Um, here we're going to have 0 times 7 minus 2 times negative 5. Here 5 times 7 minus 2 times 4. And here 5 times negative 5 minus 0 times 4. And we can uh, simplify. And we end up with negative 39 again, which we should. Okay, Because no matter which row or column you choose to expand about, you should end up with the same answer. All right, let's move on to a 4x4, four four, all right? Um, now, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we've got a uh, row with three zeros in it. So I'm going to expand about the second row. And if you notice, um, the first entry in the second column, oops, no. Okay, there we go. Expand about the second row to take advantage of the zeros. So if we look, um, the zero here is, or go back to the one, that's a plus position. So we move down, that's a minus. So the first term is going to be minus zero times the determinant of the matrix that you get if you eliminate uh, the second row and the first column. So you can see now uh, the first row is going to be negative 2, 5, 2. That's what we get there. Then we've got these two uh, rows right here as the second two rows. All right, then we move over to the next entry. Okay, plus here, minus. So this is a plus entry. So it's plus 0 times the determinant of the matrix that you get when you eliminate the second row, second column. All right, then... Um, minus the next term, so minus 3 times the matrix that you get if you eliminate second row, third column, and then plus 0 times uh, the, matri the determinant of the matrix that you get when you eliminate the last column and the second row. So that's where all these terms come from. And you can see the advantage of choosing a row with a bunch of zeros because the red term, the green term, and the uh, orange term all just disappear because they are all uh, multiplied by zero. Um, the blue one, though, we have to uh, compute now a 3 by 3 determinant. So we have negative 3 times the determinant of this matrix. So we use the same method, choose a row or a column to expand about. I chose the third row. Okay, so I've got plus, minus, plus, five's in a plus position, so it's five times this two by two determinant here. Then move over minus zero times the one, two, two, five, and then plus four times the determinant of this little matrix up here. All right, and then plus zero because this term's multiplied by zero. So you can see that everything simplifies except for this blue part. And we go through and uh, evaluate these determinants and um, uh, combine terms and simplify. We end up with negative 6 for the determinant of this matrix. Now, 
just uh, stop for a minute here and think about how much more work would have been required if we didn't have any zeros in this matrix. You know, we would have had to done, you know, what we did with the blue part. We would have had to do that for the red and the green and the orange. So we get, uh, this turns into significant work fairly quickly. Okay, it's a recursive method. Um, because, for example, to compute a 5x5 five five determinant, you have to compute 5 4x4 four four determinants. Now, this is assuming there's no zeros in the matrix. So, the worst case, um, for a 5x5, five five, you have to compute 5 4x4 four four determinants. And each of those 4x4 four four determinants requires computing 4 3x3 three three determinants. And each 3x3 three three means you have to compute 3 2x2 two two determinants. As you can see, this gets very... Um, um, work intensive very quickly. The amount of work increases exponentially. Um, so clearly this method does not scale well at all. As your matrix gets bigger, um, the amount of work required increases exponentially. So it's not a good tool nor a good method to use to compute the determinant uh, for um, an arbitrary size matrix. 3 by 3 is okay. Uh, four by four really turns into too much work unless you've got uh, some some significant number of zeros there. Okay, now um, let's let's go off on a little different tangent here uh, for a bit and um, first define what a triangular matrix is. Okay, a triangular matrix is a square matrix in which all the entries either above or below the main diagonal are zero. Okay, so here are some examples. I've uh, um, highlighted the zeros uh, in red just to make it clear. The first one here um, has all zeros below the main diagonal, so we say that this matrix is upper triangular. So all the interesting stuff is in the upper part of the matrix. Um, this next one, the middle one, is lower triangular because all the interesting stuff is in the lower part of the matrix. Everything above the diagonal is zeros. And then uh, here's another one. This one is uh, um, upper triangular also. And I just want to make it clear that um, what defines a triangular matrix is that either above or below, or even both, um, uh, the diagonal, you have to have all zeros. So this one um, is upper triangular because below the diagonal we have all zeros. Now it's okay to have some zeros above the diagonal or even on the diagonal, but that has really nothing to do with whether this is a triangular matrix or not. This is a triangular matrix because everything below the diagonal is zeros. Alright, so we have a theorem that says if A is a triangular matrix, then the determinant of A is the product of the entries on the main diagonal of A. Okay, so this is this is making it easy to compute the determinant if your matrix is triangular. Okay, it's pretty easy to see how that works. Uh, if we take a triangular matrix, um, then uh, if we were if we were going to compute the determinant directly, then um, I would expand about the first column. So my determinant would be 1, that's a plus, so 1 times the determinant of the matrix that you get if you eliminate the first row and first column. So you got this 3 by 3 that we take here. And notice that all the rest of the terms would be 0. So it's 1 times this determinant plus this 0 here times, an, or actually minus this 0 here times another determinant plus this 0 times another determinant minus this zero times another determinant. So the only term that's non-zero is the one associated with the one. So that's the only one I've written here. And then if we take the determinant of this three by three, notice we do the same thing, expand about the first column. So we've got one times five, because five's in the one, one position. So um, that's a plus. So one times five times this uh, two by two sitting right here. And notice again, all the other terms in that column are zero, so we don't need to worry about them. And so we end up with one times five times this determinant, and so it's going to be eight times one minus zero times nine, so it's just eight times one. So our determinants, one times five times eight times one, which you see are the uh, entries on the main diagonal. So um, if your matrix is triangular, life is good, life is easy, 
just multiply the entries on the diagonal. Um, just uh, thinking ahead just a little bit, notice that um, a triangular matrix is in echelon form. Or if it's upper triangular, it's in echelon form. If it was lower triangular, uh, we could we could swap rows. Uh, and we'd have to swap some columns too, but let's just think about upper triangular at this point. Um, now, so something to think about. Um, to compute the determinant of a large matrix, let's just say large is 4 by 4 or bigger, um, could we first put in echelon form and then just take the, the uh, determinant by multiplying the diagonal entries? Would that work? Well, to answer that, we need to explore um, how row elementary row operations affect the determinant of a matrix. Okay, So if we can nail that down, um, then it is indeed possible that we could just put, put our matrix in echelon form and then uh, easily compute the determinant that way. So that's uh, what we'll ponder, and we'll discuss that in the next section. Okay, last time we talked about how to compute the determinant of a matrix, and we discovered that as the matrix got larger, uh, the amount of work required to compute the determinant uh, increased dramatically. Um, even a 4 by 4 without any zeros in it um, is a considerable amount of work to take the determinant of. So uh, we thought uh, that Oh, and we also saw that for if a matrix is triangular, uh, then computing the determinant is easy. You just multiply the diagonal elements. And so we thought, hmm, um, I wonder if we could just do some row operations and uh, either uh, either just generate some zeros um, or um, uh, get the matrix totally in uh, echelon form, which would be uh, upper triangular form, and then uh, compute the determinant to, just so we can eliminate uh, some of the work required. So we're going to first talk today about how row operations affect the determinant. Yeah, because if you do row operations, um, you need to know um, what effect that has on the determinant if you're going to try to, to uh, go down that road in order to compute the determinant. Okay, so first thing uh, we'll look at is the effect of swapping rows. So the example I have here, um, I just uh, swap the rows. So the first matrix I call A, swap the rows, call that matrix B. And uh, obviously we know the determinant of A is just AD minus BC. The determinant of B is BC minus AD, which is the negative of AD minus BC. So we have the determinant of A equals minus the determinant of B. And uh, this holds true uh, no matter what uh, size your matrix is. So we have a theorem that says um, if you have uh, um, a matrix A and you exchange two rows or swap two rows of A to produce B, then the determinant of B is just the negative of the determinant of A. Okay. So um, if you swapped rows again, um, you'd negate the determinant again. So suppose we have this example. There's a 3 by 3. Let's just suppose the determinant of this matrix is T. Then we swap the first two rows and the determinant of this matrix we've negated the determinant of the original one so the determinant of this one is negative T then if we swap two rows again so uh, to get to this this matrix here I have uh, interchanged um, the uh, second and third rows of the the previous matrix and so I've negated the determinant again so it's the determinant will be negative of the determinant here, which is negative t, and notice we're back to where we started. So uh, as you interchange rows, that just negates the determinant. So um, um, it, if you do two of them, then you're back to where you started. 
All right, uh, another row operation. Here we're multiplying uh, a constant by one row and adding to another. So again, the determinant of A is just AD minus BC. Determinant of B um, is A times KB plus D minus B times KA plus C. And we can do a little algebra. Notice that the KAB terms, there's two of them, and they cancel each other out. So you're just left with AD minus BC. So this, with this row operation, you don't change the determinant at all, which is uh, kind of nice because we know that when we're doing row operations on a matrix, this is the one we're doing 99% of the time. And so it has absolutely no effect on the determinant. Okay, so another theorem. If you multi if a multiple of one row of A is added to another row to produce a matrix B, then the determinant of B is equal to the determinant of A. Okay, the third row operation is multiplying a row by a constant. So here I've multiplied row two by K. So again, determinant of A, A D minus B C. Determinant of B is A times K D minus B times K C. We can factor out a K and we end up with K times AD minus BC. So we see that the determinant of B is K times the determinant of A. Or um, when you're going backwards, um, you know, if you were using the determinant of B to try to, to uh, go back to get the determinant of A, uh, determinant of A would be 1 over K times the determinant of B. So another theorem. Um, if a row of A is multiplied by K to produce a matrix B, then the determinant of B is equal to K times the determinant of A. That holds true for uh, any square matrix A. Um, kind of tagging along with this, um, I said, what happens if we um, multiply the whole matrix by a constant? Okay, so start off with our A, B, C, D, multiply one row. This is the matrix we had before. Multiplied it by at row 2 by k uh, to get this matrix. Then I multiplied row 1 by k to get this one, which is just equal to k times the whole matrix. So um, we know the uh, determinant of, of A is AD minus BC. The determinant of KA, take the determinant of this matrix, uh, we end up with k squared times AD minus BC which makes sense uh, because we know we know what the determinant of this one is right it was the one we looked at previously and it was just k times the determinant of a so we just did one more row operation multiplying a row another row by k and so we should incur that k term one more time and hence we get the k squared okay so the determinant of k times a matrix now this this is uh, just in general, not a row operation here, but if you just multiply k times the whole matrix, um, um, you get k squared times the determinant of a. That's for this case with a 2 by 2. Um, notice that if a had been 3 by 3, we would have had to multiply each of three rows by k, and we would incur that k term three times, not two, as in this case. So in general, if A is n by n and k is a scalar, then the determinant of k times A is k to the n times the determinant of A. Okay? So if A is 3 by 3, you're going to get k cubed. If it's 4 by 4, you're going to get a k to the fourth term. Okay, so here's an example of how you can use these ideas that we've talked about to compute the determinant. Now, if we were just doing this one straight away using cofactor expansion, uh, we would clearly expand about the third, the fourth column here. Um, but notice that it's simple to do uh, one one row operation here and generate another zero in this column, which will eliminate uh, a significant amount of work. You know, as it is, we need we would need to do two three by three determinants. But if we do one row operation to generate a zero here where the six is then we've cut our work in half because uh, then we only need to evaluate one 3 by 3 determinant. So let's do um, 2 times row 4 or negative 2 times row 4 plus row 3 and notice that that kind of uh, row operation recall does not change the determinant. Okay so if we do that 
um, we can uh, do this row operation. Uh, we get this matrix. Notice a zero here where the six was. And then um, we just uh, expand about the last column. So uh, we need this three. We need to figure out what sign goes with the three. So start here. One, one position is a plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So it's plus three times the determinant of this three by three matrix sitting right here. Okay, so that's what I have here. And then uh, I've expanded about the third row, um, which um, now I'm seeing that this is not looking right because this should be negative three here. Oh, no, 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 negative three here. My mistake. This three here comes from the ones outside. And then when I expand about the third row, the negative three is right here. All right, so, and the negative three is in a plus position because we start with a one, one. That's plus, minus, plus. So we have plus negative three, okay, times uh, this two by two. And then we got a zero, so we can skip that. So it would be minus zero, then plus negative two. So here's the other term. And if we continue to work it out, uh, we end up with 114. Okay, so that one's pretty straightforward. Um, I want to show you one more um, just uh, that has a little more um, work involved. And for that, I'm going to go to Maple just because uh, that kind of makes it a little bit easier. Um, so I've got it set up. Um, here's uh, the matrix that we're going to start with. And um, notice this. I guess I could do a row operation to generate a zero in the uh, third uh, column here. That would probably make life easier. Be much actually. That would be the way to go if you were actually doing this by hand. Um, but I would have wanted to illustrate the concept of um, of how you could um, use these row operations. So I have actually done the row operations to get it in triangular form, and then uh, I want to show you how to go back and and recreate the determinant of the original matrix based on the row operations that we've done. Okay, so the first thing I did was I just uh, um, started out to uh, eliminate uh, or generate zeros in the first column. So I used uh, the negative three here to, um, to generate a zero here and here. So the uh, first operation I did was to uh, well, this command here, add row, what it does is says take row A, so we're or er, matrix A, so we're operating on the original matrix A, and we're going to change row 3 by multiplying row 1 by negative 1. Okay, so this operation is negative 1 times row 1 plus row 3, and we generate a 0 in row 3. Then I do um, row 1 plus row 4. Okay, so that's the next command. Now I'm operating on A1, this matrix here, and I'm going to change row 4 by multiplying row 1 by 1. All right, so the negative 3 plus 3 gives me a 0 here. All right, then um, I'm going to um, swap rows. I'm going to swap. Uh, swap the first and the second row because then that gives me a one in the uh, um, um, one one position. All right, so I'm just swapping rows now. Notice at this point we've negated the determinant. So whatever, if I took the determinant of a three, it would be the negative of the determinant of the original matrix. Okay, so keep in mind that we've done one row swap. All right, now I'm going to generate a zero here where the negative three is. And so to do that, I'm operating on A3, matrix A3. I'm going to change row two by multiplying row one by three. All right, so three times row one minus three gives me, uh, or minus row two gives me a zero there in that first position. Okay, now I'm ready to move over to the next uh, uh, column, 
And so the first thing I'm going to do here, since there's no nice uh, numbers here to work with, I'm going to just multiply row 2 by 1 7th. So the command to do that is this one, multiply row. So I'm going to multiply row, I'm working on A4, I'm going to multiply row 2 by 1 7th. Alright, so that gives me a 1 in the uh, 2 2 position. And now I'm ready to zero out underneath that. So my next operation is to work on A5. And I'm going to multiply, I'm going to change row 3 by multiplying row 2 by negative 6. Alright, so negative 6 times 1 plus this 6 gives me the 0 here. And then I need to do a similar thing to generate a 0 in this position. So I'm working on A6, multiply, or I'm going to change row 4 by multiplying row 2 by 6. So 2 times row 2 plus row 4, I mean 6 times row 2 plus row 4 gives me a 0 here. So up to this point, the only thing that I've uh, changed in terms of the determinant of the original matrix is doing the one row swap. So we've negated the determinant. Oh, we did the multiply row. So we've changed, uh, changed the determinant by factor of uh, 7 also. All right, so keep those two things in mind. And here, the next thing I'm going to do is generate a 1 in this position. So I'm going to do another multiply row. Multiply row 3 by negative 7 over 27. And that gives me the 1 in this position. So now we've done a row swap and we've done two, um, two operations where we multiplied a row by a scalar. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to do one more row operation um, to get a 0 in this position. So I'm going to uh, multiply row 3 by negative 13 sevenths and add that to row 4. So I get a 0 there. Now my matrix is in triangular form, upper triangular form. So um, to take the determinant of this matrix, it's just 1 times 1 times 1 times 2. Um, and then to, to uh, go back to get the matrix, of the determinant of the original matrix, I've got to back out these row operations. So that's what I've done here. Okay, so I've taken the determinant of A9, which um, is, as I said, 1 times 1 times 1 times 2, so we could just do that, um, times 7, and I'm multiplying times 7, um, to um, because of this row operation because I multiplied by one seventh to so to back that out to get the original determinant I need to multiply by seven and then I multiplied by negative seven over twenty seven so I'm multiplying by the reciprocal of that and then multiplying by negative one because we did the row swap. So put all that together, I get the determinant of the original matrix is 54. And then just to check, um, I'll just uh, use maple to determine that original determinant, and we get 54 again. So this is a way you can uh, back out the determinant of the original matrix um, by keeping track of the uh, row operations that you did and how they affect the determinant. Okay, so back to this. Um, we're ready to, to look at a, a few theorems about determinants. Um, this first one here is actually another installment in the invertible matrix theorem. Okay, so it says a square matrix A is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not equal to zero. So, um, so we've seen this, we saw this last time. Um, but um, add that on to the invertible matrix theorem. So in, it's, this is an equivalent statement. Determinant of A equals not equal to zero is equivalent to um, A is invertible. Um, the determinant of A transpose is equal to the determinant of A. Um, 
if you think about that for a little bit, um, it, it actually is uh, it's pretty easy to see how why that is true. Because um, if you think about taking the determinant of A, you choose some row or column to expand about. You know, for exa example, maybe expand about the first row. Then um, if you're taking the determinant of A transpose, then you can do the exact same operations by expanding about the first column. Since the first column of A transpose is equal to the first row of A, then you would be computing the determinant of A transpose exactly how you would compute the determinant of the matrix A. So you end up with uh, getting the same value. Okay, another theorem. Um, if A and B are square matrices, then the determinant of the product A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. The determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. Um, notice though that that doesn't apply to sums. So the determinant of A plus B is in general not equal to the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. So don't make that mistake. Okay, and that's all we have uh, for this section. All right, let's talk about Kramer's rule. Kramer's rule is actually uh, one of, uh, of the beautiful things in mathematics, I believe. It's, uh, it's just a neat little idea. Um, and it's a way to solve a system of equations using only determinants. So it's, uh, it's just very interesting. So here's uh, the way it works. Uh, Kramer's rule. We have uh, A is an n by n matrix. Then for any B in Rn, the unique solution x of Ax equals B um, is given by this uh, formula here, which looks rather odd. Um, notice that we've got uh, a way to compute x of i for each i, and it's just a... Uh, uh, ratio of determinants. In the denominator we've got just the determinant of A. In the numerator it's the determinant of A sub I of B. So A sub I of B refers to the matrix formed by replacing the ith column of A with B. Okay, so we replace the ith column of A with B. So to get X1 um, we replace the first column of A with B and compute that determinant divide by the determinant of A, that's the value for X1, and so forth. So neat idea. So let's just uh, use it to solve this system. All right, so we need the determinant of A. So that's just uh, 8 minus 5, which is 3. The determinant of A sub 1 of B, so notice that I've just taken B, 6, 7, plopped it into the first column of A. Take the determinant, get 5. Same thing, uh, a sub 2 of b, we take b and plop it in the second column of a. And take that determinant, we get negative 2. And so x1 is just the 5 divided by 3. And x2 is the negative 2 divided by 3. And those are the values of x1 and x2. Um, just to check, uh, we take 5 thirds times the first column of a minus two-thirds times the second column of A, and we indeed get six, seven. Yippee! It's nice when things work like they're supposed to. I use the same method for three by three system. Although this time you gotta compute, uh, you know, a determinant for each of three variables plus the determinant of A. So here's a, a matrix A in the right hand side, B. Compute the determinant of A first, and then we compute the determinant of A sub 1 of B. So again, take B, take the vector B, stick it in the first column of A, leave the rest of A alone, and compute that determinant. Same thing, A sub 2 of B, we take B, stick it in the second column of A, uh, leave the rest of A alone, compute that determinant. A sub 3 of B, we take the uh, B, replace the third column of A, compute that determinant, 
and then put it all together. Um, x1 is going to be negative 16 over 4. x2 is going to be 52 over 4. And x3 is going to be negative 4 over 4. And so there's your solution to this system. So just a really neat uh, idea and a neat way to solve systems of equations. You know, but clearly we run into the same problem for this 3x3. Three three. It really wasn't that bad, but if it was a 4x4 four four system, then you're computing um, five 4x4 four four determinants, right? Because you have to compute one for each variable, one for each column. So you'd be have A1, A2, A3, and A4 of B, plus you need to compute the original uh, determinant. So you have five 4x4 four four determinants, and that would be a lot of work. So this is not practical in a general sense, but um, for, for theoretical and for um, uh, small matrices like this, it's kind of a neat idea. We can also apply it to a question like this. Um, determine the values of the parameter S for which the system given by this augmented matrix has a unique solution and then describe the solution. Okay, so it, we know it has a unique solution when the determinant is not zero. Okay, because the determinant is not zero, A is invertible, and um, there's a unique solution. So if we take the determinant of uh, the coefficient part of that matrix, uh, we end up with 15 times S squared plus 3. And note that um, 15 times s squared plus 3 is is not equal to 0 for all values of s. So you can never uh, end up with, um, with that equal to 0 as long as s is a real number. Because s squared plus 3 is always going to be positive. Um, and so um, this system is going to have a unique solution no matter what the value of s is. So we compute um, to get the uh, to to be able to describe the solution, um, we can use Kramer's rule, um, and uh, so I've just uh, computed a one of b. That takes b the three two, sticks it in the first column of a, and we compute that determinant. Then same thing a sub two of b. We stick right hand side on the second column, compute that determinant, and then. Um, uh, kind of massage things a little bit, and uh, we have expressions for the value of x1 and x2 um, for any uh, value of s. Okay, so it's uh, just the 5 times 3s plus 2 divided by the determinant of a here, and the 3 times 2s minus 9 divided by the determinant of a for x2. Uh, we can also use Kramer's rule to compute A inverse because as we saw in chapter 2, to compute A inverse we simply need to solve um, some systems of equations. So if we consider this matrix A, um, we want to find B such that A times B equals the identity matrix. Right? So B here would be the inverse of A. So let's let uh, B1 and B2 uh, denote the columns of B and let E1 and E2 denote the columns of the identity matrix and we've used that notation before. So we need to solve A times B1 equals uh, E1 and A times B2 equals E2 here in this 2 by 2 case. Alright, so if we take the determinant of A, go back up and look at A here, 2 times 8 16 minus 3 times 5, so 16 minus 15. Determinant of A is just 1. Okay, now to get B1, we're solving this system here, A times B1 equals E1. So um, to get the first entry in B1, that's the determinant of A1 of E1, right? We're solving, look at this augmented matrix. So to get the first entry in the solution, um, we replace the first column of A by the right-hand side, which is E1. Compute that determinant, get 8. 8 over 1 is just 8. So um, the 1, 1 entry in the inverse is 8. All right, now to get the 
the second entry in the solution to this uh, system here, um, we um, substitute E1 into the second column of A. All right, so here we go with that. And uh, compute that determinant, negative 5 divided by 1, we get negative 5. So um, we've got the first column of the inverse, right, because we were solving this system, A times B1 equals E1, and so that's the first, so we get the first column of the inverse, B1, would be 8, negative 5. To get B2, we solve uh, a similar system, just now the right-hand side is 0, 1, instead of 1, 0. And so to get the first entry in the solution to this system, we substitute 0, 1 in the first column of A. All right, so you see that here. Compute the determinant, we get negative 3, divided by 1, negative 3. And then the second entry means substitute the right-hand side in the second column of A. Compute that determinant, you get 2, divided by the determinant of A, and we have 2. So we have A inverse, which is B, given by this matrix that we just computed. So in general, the ijth entry in the inverse is given by the determinant of A sub i of ej divided by the determinant of A. So if you go back, for instance here, to get the 1, 2 entry in the inverse, we computed the determinant of A sub 1 of E2 divided by the determinant of A. To get the 2, 2 entry, it was A2 of E2 divided by the determinant of A. So in general, the ijth entry in the inverse is A, the determinant of A sub I of Ej divided by the determinant of A. Um, we actually give, uh, we actually have create a, a matrix which we call the adjugate or the adjoint um, of a matrix and stick in these values, these uh, determinants of A sub I, E sub J. Okay, we call that the, the book uses the term adjugate primarily. Um, I typically use adjoint, so those are um, synonymous terms. Okay, but it's composed of all these determinants. And so basically it's just these things but with the determinant of A uh, term factored out. So in general, A inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of A times the adjoint of A. All right. So let's use that to find the inverse of this matrix here. Okay, so first uh, we'll find the adjoint or the adjugate of A. And um, remember to get the, uh, to get the ijth entry in the adjoint, it's the determinant of A sub I, E sub J. So for the 1, 1 entry, it's the determinant of A1, E1. For the 2, 1 entry, determinant A2, E1. 3, 1 entry, determinant of A3, E1. All right, so I've computed all those. A sub 1 of E1, remember E1 is the first column of the identity matrix. The A1 says substitute that into the first column of A. So there you have E1, 1, 0, 0, substitute in the first column of A. And I take that determinant. A sub 2 of E1 says put E1 into the second column of A. So there we have it, determinant there is 0. A sub 3 of E1 says put E1 in the third column of A. So there we go. Take that determinant. And do the same thing uh, for the other six entries in the adjoint. 1, 2 position, determinant of A1 of E2. So take E2, which is 0, 1, 0, and substitute that in the first column of A. So there. So you can see here we have 0, 1, 0 in the first column. Here it's in the second column. Here it's in the third column and we compute each one of those determinants. Then do it one more time for the third column. Let's get the 1, 3, 2, 3, and 3, 3 elements. Um, so E3 is 0, 0, 1. So we stick it in the first column of A, then the second column of A, third column of A, and compute all those determinants. Then we put it all together. Um, this is what we get. And we need the determinant of A, which we can compute. That's 5. So 
the inverse of a is just 1 over the determinant of a, so 1 fifth times the adjoint of a, which is this matrix. And there's your inverse, computed totally by doing elementary, uh, not elementary row operations, totally using determinants. Okay, today we're going to start uh, section 4.1 on vector spaces. So um, we'll start with the definition of a vector space. Um, you'll probably want to have your book out with you because we're going to refer back to this definition quite a bit. So in your uh, textbook, it's on page 217. Uh, there's a lot uh, to this definition, so we'll spend a little time uh, just talking about it before we move on uh, from there. A vector space uh, is said to be a non-empty set, V, of objects called vectors. Okay, now let's stop there because that's a little bit odd. It's a set of objects called vectors. Um, I want to make the point here that uh, when uh, the author uses the term vector in this context, he's not necessarily talking about a vector of the type we're familiar with, like in R2 or R3 or so forth. Yeah, he's using it in a more generic sense, um, and I actually like to use the term object just to keep from um, um, confusing you between exactly what he's, he's referring to by using the word vector. And as we go along today, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about here. Okay, so starting over, a vector space is a non-empty set V of objects on which are defined two operations called addition and multiplication by scalars, which are real numbers. Now again, uh, this seems sort of odd, uh, I would think, to you, because he's saying there's two operations, and instead of saying two operations, addition and multiplication by scalars, he's saying there's two operations called addition and multiplication by scalars, which is a, kind of an odd way to phrase it. And the reason why he says it like that is because um, since these objects are not necessarily vectors in the traditional sense that we're used to, um, then addition and multiplication by scalars are not necessarily defined as we're accustomed to. Okay, uh, They can, in fact, be defined in any way that you would like, um, as long as these properties here are satisfied. So we're, we're, we're in an abstract sense here. Okay, We're talking about objects and operations, um, and uh, so don't... Uh, assume that we're talking about um, vectors in the traditional sense, nor uh, addition and scalar multiplication in the traditional sense. Okay, so we have these collect this collection of objects and these two operations, and they are subject to the ten axioms given here. And these axioms must hold for all vectors u, v, and w in the set V and for all scalars C and D. Okay, so I've kind of highlighted some because some are um, a little bit more uh, interesting than others. Uh, number one says the sum of U and V denoted by U plus V is in the set V. Okay, so it just says if you take any two vectors from the set and you add them together, uh, then you get another vector that is still in the set. And as we'll see in a minute, this property is, is called closure, or we say that the set is closed under addition if this property holds. Okay, two and three um, are uh, some standard properties. Uh, number two, we have uh, the commutative property, three, uh, associative. Then number four um, says that in the set V, there is a zero vector such that when you add it to any vector in the set, you just get that vector back. Okay, so U plus zero is equal to U. Okay, so um, notice number one um, is uh, referring to um, an element that has to be in the set. Okay, if U and V are in the set, their sum has to be in the set. 
number four, also saying that there has to be this zero vector in the set. Okay, so and we'll see that number six kind of follows along with that too. Uh, number five, for the first, says um, for each uh, vector in the set, you have another vector such that when you add it to the first, you end up with the zero vector. So it's essentially saying that every element has an additive inverse in the set. Then number six says uh, the scalar multiple of any vector by constant c is denoted by c times u, and that is in the set. Okay, so this says that when you take the scalar multiple of any vector in the set, or any object in the set, the result is also in the set. So you can see that number one, number four, number six, all are specifically referring to whether or not particular elements are in the set. And that will be important as we go along. Um, number seven through 10 are again standard sorts of properties. Um, uh, we have distributive properties and uh, uh, number 10 um, we have a multiplicative inverse property one times any element in the set is equal to, to that element um, and you might be looking especially at night number 10 and going well when would that would when would that ever not be the case and the answer is going back to what I'd said originally is that um, these uh, the set V can contain um, uh, an items other than just uh, vectors like from R2 or R3. Um, and these operations, addition and scalar multiplication, can be defined in non-standard ways. And so based on that, then sometimes it could be the case that number 10 would not be true. Okay, so let's start with R2. Um, that's a simple set to think about. And uh, let's talk about whether R2 is a vector space. The answer is yes, um, because all the properties except 1 and 6 uh, were in fact explicitly given in section 1.3. So if you want to go back to page 32 and check that out, um, all the properties except 1 and 6 are explicitly listed there. So let's think about 1 and 6. Number 1, uh, we want to know if you take two vectors from R2 and add them together, do you get another vector in R2? Well, here's two vectors in R2, A, B, and C, D. When we add them together, we get A plus C, B plus D. That's another vector in R2. So uh, the answer is yes there. Number 6, if you multiply a vector in R2 by a scalar, do you get another vector in R2? Okay, is it closed under scalar multiplication? And here we see multiply a vector times a scalar, we get another vector in R2, both of whose components are real numbers, and therefore um, R2 is a vector space. And uh, in fact, uh, the set of real numbers, a uh, set of all vectors with two components, which is R2, R3, and Rn in general are all vector spaces. Uh, going back to uh, these uh, property 1 and property 6, um, just to take a second look at those. Property 1 said that um, if you take any two vectors from the set and compute their sum, then it is also in the set. Okay, And if that is true, we say that the set is closed under addition. Property 6 says if you take a scalar multiple of a vector in the set, then the result is also in the set. Then if this is true, we say that the set is closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, So keep those terms in mind. Let's move on and consider another set. Um, here's another set. This is a subset of R2. So I'm saying uh, we have a set S here which consists of vectors of the form x0 where x is a real number. Okay, So basically um, everything in R2 where the second component is 0. If you think about this graphically, uh, it's just saying that the y component is 0 so therefore, graphically speaking, S would just be the x-axis. So I want to know, um, is S 
with the uh, operations of addition and scalar multiplication as traditionally defined, okay, what you're used to is as a vector space. Well, again, um, axioms 2 and 3 and 7 through 10 follow automatically uh, since S is a subset of R2 because 2, 3, and 7 through 10 are true of everything in R2. Um, and I'm assuming here that you got your book open so you know which of these I'm referring to. Um, the other axioms depend on certain elements being in the set. Uh, so we have to look at this closer. So number one is S closed under addition, i.e. if you take two elements in the set, do you get another element in the set? Um, you take two elements in the set and add them together, do you get another element in the set? Um, well, here I've taken a couple of generic elements from the set, U and V, um, and if we add them together, as I've done here, notice that you get this vector uh, of this form, U1 plus V1 in the first component, zero in the second component, and um, this vector is in, uh, oh, it should be an S there, this vector is in S instead of V. Since uh, U1 plus V1 is a real number, uh, uh, let's pause here. Why do we know that U1 plus V1 is a real number? Um, the reason we know that is because U and V are both in S, and uh, therefore U1 has to be a real number, V1 has to be a real number, so we add two real numbers together, we get another real number. Okay, so we know the first component's a real number, second component is zero, and that's what it takes to be in the set S. So S is closed under addition. By number four, does S contain a zero element? Does S contain a vector zero such that when you add zero to any vector in the set, you just get that, that vector back. Well, the obvious choice would be zero, zero. So the question is, is that vector in S? And the answer is yes, because remember, to be in S, uh, the first component has to be a real number, which zero is, and the second component has to be zero, which we have here in the zero vector. Okay, number five, uh, does each element have an additive inverse? Well, if we start off with a uh, generic element of the set, say u equals u10, we can add to that uh, this vector negative u10, and it is in the set. How do we know that? Well, if u1 is a real number, then negative u1 has to be a real number, and we have the second component zero. When we add those together, we get the zero vector. Um, is S closed under scalar multiplication? So if we uh, multiply, take a generic element from the set, multiply it by a scalar, do we get another element in the set? Well, here's a generic element of the set. U equals U10. C is a scalar. That just means it's just any real number. And if we multiply C times U, we end up with CU1 in the first component. Now that has to be a real number, which it is, because C is real, U1 is real. We've got the product of two real numbers, and that's another real number. And the second component is zero. And that's what it takes, again, to be in S. So uh, S is indeed closed under scalar multiplication. And... Uh, at this point, we've, set, we've uh, established that all 10 of the axioms are uh, satisfied. So S, our set S, is a vector space. Okay, now it turns out that when you're dealing with subsets of known vector spaces, just like we were here, um, S was a subset of R2, then we really need to only examine three of these properties to see if the set's a vector space. And actually, uh, we typically call it a subspace um, of the larger vector space, even though it is actually in itself a vector space. Okay, so there's the three properties are given here.
uh, we say a subspace of a vector space V is a subset H of V that has three properties. The zero vector of V is in H. H is closed under vector addition, and H is closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, so if we want to check to see if a set is a subspace of a vector space, we need only check these three properties. All right, so let's do that here. Here's another set, T. Um, and T is a subset of R2, and it consists of all vectors where the first entry is any real number and the second entry is a 2. So I want to know, if, is, is T a, a subspace of R2? So looking at the first one, does T contain the zero vector of R2? That was the first requirement to be a subspace. So I'm asking, is 0, 0, is the vector 0, 0 in T? And if you look up here at T, remember, what does it take to be in T? First component's any real number, second component's 2. So we look at 0, 0, does that fit that bill? No, it doesn't. Why not? Because the second component here is 0. To be in T, the second component has to be a 2. Okay, so 0, 0 is not in T. And at this point, we could stop and say, nope, T is not a subspace of R2 because uh, it doesn't contain the zero vector of R2. Uh, but for practice, uh, let's just keep going um, and consider the other two conditions. Um, so here's T again. Is it closed under addition? So if I take two elements of T and add them together, do I get another element of T? Well, here's a couple of generic elements of T. If I add them together, what happens? Mm, oops, look at that second element here. Second element in the, the sum of these two is a 4. So this is not in T, right? because to be in T, your second component has to be a 2. Here it's a 4. Okay, so T is not closed under addition. How about scalar multiplication? Is it closed under scalar multiplication? Well, let's take a generic element of T. Here's one. Got a real number on top, two in the second component. We multiply by scalar, and what do we get? We get this vector. Uh, actually, we shouldn't get that vector. That V1 should not be there. I apologize for that. Should be just CU1 in the top, 2C down in the bottom. Um, make a note of that. Um, so again, this plus V1 shouldn't be here. Um, but let's look. What's important really is the second component, the 2C here, because um, what we want to know is, is that 0? And the answer is, well, it's 0 only if C is 0. And C is not restricted to be 0, and therefore... Uh, we can come up with uh, easily come up with a counterexample to show uh, that we can take a scalar multiple of an element of T and uh, end up with something outside of T. So T is not closed under scalar multiplication. All right, let me make one more note. All right. Um, so in this case, this set T uh, failed all three of the subspace tests. Um, they, again, you if you were simply trying to determine if T is a vector or a subspace of R2, uh, you only need to find one that it fails, and then you could stop there. I just showed you all three just for practice. Okay, um, so as I said before, uh, these vector uh, vector spaces uh, such as R2 and R3 and Rn, uh, those we are familiar with. Um, but there's a lot of other ones uh, in which the elements don't look like traditional vectors. So let's kind of examine that a little bit. Um, consider uh, this set I'm calling M sub 2 by 2, which is the set of all 2 by 2 matrices, okay, where all the components are real numbers. Um, turns out that M sub 2 by 2 is also a vector space, even though its elements are matrices instead of vectors in the traditional sense. So let's go back through those properties um, with uh, M sub 2 by 2 in mind. 
Okay, so let's uh, start off and suppose that A, B, and C are, are two by two matrices, and that P and Q are uh, scalars. So property number one, uh, if we add uh, A and B together, do we get a, another two by two matrix? Right? This is saying is M sub two by two closed under addition, and clearly it is. If you add two two by two matrices together, you get another two by two matrix. All right, uh, here are the second and third properties. Those uh, fall straight out from properties of matrices. Um, number four, is there a zero matrix? All right, is there some two by two matrix such that you can add to any other two by two matrix and get that same matrix back? Well, uh, clearly there is. It's a matrix with zeros in all the positions. Um, and number five, if you add negative A to A, you get the zero matrix. Number six uh, is uh, M sub two by two closed under scalar multiplication. So if you take any two by two matrix and multiply it by scalar, do you get another two by two matrix? And of course you do. So it's closed under scalar multiplication. And then these uh, final four properties, uh, fall straight out from what we know about matrices. So M sub 2 by 2 is indeed a vector space. Um, another one about polynomials. Polynomials are some uh, standard examples of vector spaces. Uh, let's first uh, start with P sub 2. P sub 2 is the set of all polynomials of degree 2 or less. Okay, So we wanted to write it uh, in, in formal terms, it would look like this. A naught, set of all, A naught plus A1 times T plus A2 times T squared, where A naught, A1, A2 are real numbers. So here's some sample elements of P sub 2. 3 plus 2T, okay, here 3 is, A, A sub 0 is 3, A1 is 2, A2 in this case would be 0. 4t squared, that's in there. 8t squared minus 13t plus 45, that's in there. Okay, any polynomial of degree 2 or less. Okay, and p sub 2 is indeed a vector space. Let's look at these properties uh, in terms of p sub 2. So if we add two polynomials of degree 2 together, do you get another polynomial of degree 2? Okay, well, yes, you do. Here's uh, uh, how that works. If you've got two, let's call it P of T, which looks like this, Q of T, which looks like this, and if we add them together, then we get uh, this polynomial here, which is, again, of degree two or less. Okay, they satisfy the uh, properties two and three. I can let you uh, explore that some more. Uh, number four, do you have a zero element? Is there a zero polynomial? Well, yes, there is. It's just zero. If we add zero to any polynomial, we get that same polynomial back. Um, if we uh, negate all the coefficients in a polynomial um, and add it to the original one, we get the zero polynomial. Number six, is this set of polynomials closed under scalar multiplication? Um, so if you multiply any polynomial of degree 2 or less by a scalar, do you get another polynomial of degree 2 or less? And the answer is yes. Okay, here, multiply by scalar, and uh, we get another uh, polynomial of degree 2 or less. And again, 7 through 10 kind of fall out pretty straightforwardly. Um, here's another set. Uh, this is a subset, Q sub 2 here is a subset of P sub 2. Um, here uh, I've got all polynomials uh, not of degree 2 or less, but all polynomials of degree exactly 2. So the way I've defined it is in this form, looks like P sub 2, with this addition, A sub 2 has to be non-zero. Okay, so that uh, makes it where you're going to have a second degree polynomial. All right? You're going to have uh, a sub 2 not equals 0, so you're going to have the t squared term showing up. 
Um, so I want to know, is Q sub 2 a subspace of P sub 2? So to show that it's a subspace, uh, we need to show that it satisfies those three properties. Right, it includes the zero element, closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication. So is that the case? Well, let's start with number one. Does Q sub 2 contain the zero element of P sub 2? Well, the zero element of P sub 2 is the zero polynomial, right, just zero. Um, so is that in Q sub 2? And the answer is no, because we go back up and look at the definition of Q sub 2. A sub 2 can't be zero, right? But down here, in the zero polynomial, A sub 2 is zero. So, so Q sub 2 does not contain the zero element of P sub 2. So we could stop right here and say, nope, Q sub 2 is not a subspace of P sub 2. Um, but uh, again, just uh, for more experience, we're going to go on and look at the other two. Um, so the second one is, uh, is Q sub 2 closed under addition? So if we add any two elements of Q sub 2 together, do we get another element of Q sub 2? Or if you add any two polynomials of degree exactly 2 or less, ex not or less, a degree exactly 2, do you get another polynomial of degree exactly 2? Right, there it is there. Um, so here's an example. Let P of T be 6T squared minus 3T. Um, that is in Q sub 2 because um, we've got... Uh, uh, a 6, okay, the a sub 2 term is not equal to 0. And here's q of t, um, where uh, the coefficient of uh, t squared is not 0. So we've got two polynomials here of degree exactly 2. When we add them together, what happens? The t squared terms go away. We're left with negative 3t plus 5. And that is not of degree exactly 2. So Q sub 2 is not closed under addition. How about scalar multiplication? If we multiply a polynomial of degree exactly 2 by a scalar, do we always get another polynomial of degree exactly 2? So think about that. Is there anything you... So you start off with any sort of polynomial that's degree exactly 2, and you multiply it by any scalar, do you always get another polynomial of degree exactly 2? And if you don't think about that very long, you might say, well, yeah, you multiply it by anything, and you're going to get another polynomial of degree exactly 2. And that's almost always true. But there's one, one coefficient, one scalar you can use. If you multiply it by 0, then you get uh, the 0 uh, polynomial. Um, and it is not of degree exactly 2. So this means that Q2 is not closed under scalar multiplication. So Q2 sub two here failed all three of uh, the requirements to be a subspace of, of uh, P2. Sub yeah, it only has to fail one and not, to not be a subspace, but this one, in fact, failed all three properties. Okay, let's look at one more. Um, let's look at Z, set of all integers, okay? And I want to know, is Z a subset of the real numbers? A subspace of the real numbers, excuse me. Clearly, it's a subset of the real numbers. All right, so we want to know, number one, does Z contain the zero element of the real numbers? Well, the zero element of the real numbers is just zero, and zero is an integer, so the answer here is yes. Um, is Z closed under addition? Okay. If you take two integers and add them together, do you get another integer? And the answer is yes, because the sum of any two integers is always an integer. So we pass number one, we pass number two. How about number three? Is it closed under scalar multiplication? So if we multiply an integer by a scalar, do we always get another integer? Hmm. Let's think about that. 
trick here is that the scalar could be a real number. You don't have to multiply it by an integer, right? The scalar just means a real number. That real number might not be an integer. So if we multiply our integer by a uh, non-integer, then we uh, open up the chance that we could end up with a uh, non-integer. So the answer is no, it's not closed under scalar multiplication. And here's an example. Uh, if I multiply 0.5, there's my scalar, times 3, my integer, I get 1.5. 1.5 is not an integer. So here's a scalar times my integer. I don't get another integer. And so therefore, z is not closed under scalar multiplication. And therefore, it's not a subspace of the real numbers. Okay, we're continuing in section 4.1 um, with more about vector spaces. And um, there's uh, w one way that we've talked about uh, for finding th if a set is a subspace of another vector space is to show that it satisfies the three properties uh, that, that it contains the zero vector of the parent vector space it's closed under addition, and it's closed under scalar multiplication. <clears throat> These, uh, so to show that um, a set is a subspace, then you can show that these three things hold, or to show that it's not a subspace, show that at least one of these does not hold. But we have another uh, method uh, for showing that a set is a subspace. And this doesn't work in all cases, but in some cases you can use this theorem and it makes life much easier because you don't have to go through and show those three properties hold. So the theorem says if V1 through VP are vectors in some vector space V, then the span of V1 through VP is a subspace of V. Okay, so what this says is that if we can write our set as the span of a finite set of vectors, okay, write it in this form, span of V1 through VP for some vectors, then automatically we can conclude that the set is a subspace. <clears throat> so let's look at this example. We have a set S which consists of all vectors of this form, okay, it's a subset of R3, um, first component is 2 times some real number t, second component is 0, and the third component is the negative of that uh, real number t that we had up in the first component. Okay, so how uh, we want to know if s is a subspace of R3. If we use the original method, uh, that is to show that the three properties hold, then we would start with um, saying does S contain the zero vector and uh, in this case if we set T equal to zero then uh, we get zero 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 and so um, the zero vector is contained in the set S. So we go to um, the next property is S closed under addition. We need two generic vectors from S um, so let's call those u and v, and u uh, looks like 2u0 negative u, and we'll say v is 2v0 negative v, and we need to add those together and see if the resulting vector is in the form uh, that uh, has to be to be an s. So we add u and v and uh, rearrange terms just a little bit, and we end up with this uh, vector here. We've got 2 times u plus v. Uh, in the first component, zero in the second component, negative u plus v in the third component, and this is in the form that it needs to be uh, to be in the set S because u plus v here is a real number. Uh, we know that because uh, these came from the vectors u and v. Um, so we have two times u plus v in the first component, negative u plus v in the last component, zero in the middle, so it is in S. So S is closed under uh, addition. So we move on to the third property. 
um, is S closed under scalar multiplication. Well, again, we need a generic vector from the set S and a scalar, which we'll call C. And we compute C times U. And uh, again, rearranging terms a little bit, we can write it as 2 times CU in the first component, negative C times U in the last component, 0 in the middle. And since both C and U are real numbers, then C times U is a real number. So this vector is in S. So we have all three properties satisfied, and therefore S is a subspace of R3. Now there's a fair amount of work that went into that. Um, and so let's look at how we could use, or if we could use, this theorem to make the, uh, the work a little easier. Alright, uh, if we take a generic vector from the set S and we write it in parametric vector form. So that means factor out the parameters. Um, in this case there's only one, T. And so we can write any vector in S as T times zero, uh, 2, 0, negative 1. So any vector in S is a multiple of this vector. Therefore, uh, S is equal to the span of this vector. And since we've written S as the span of a finite set of vectors, that means uh, by the theorem, S is a subspace of R3. So you can see here that if you can, if your problem is one in which you can use this theorem, then uh, it makes the work much easier. Here's another example. Uh, that set we'll call W. Um, it's a subset of R4. And uh, we want to know, is uh, W a subspace of R4? So again, we could go through the three uh, properties, you know, zero vector, closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication. But it's much easier um, to apply the theorem so here we uh, write this generic vector in parametric vector form. There are three parameters here, A, B, and C. So we factor those out. And, uh, and so at this point, we have written uh, this generic vector as a linear combination of these three vectors. That is exactly what it means when we say that um, W is the span of those vectors because any vector in W can be written as a linear combination of these three. So again, we've got W is um, the span of a, a finite set of vectors, and so by the theorem, it must be a subspace of R4. All right, here's another one. Um, set T, um, given here, and uh, we want to know, is it a subspace of R3? So we proceed as we did before, apply, uh, try, uh, try to write uh, this generic vector as a uh, sub, as a uh, linear combination, apologize for the phone there, linear combination of uh, vectors in uh, R3. Um, and so we can write it, but notice what happens. Um, if we factor out the A and the B, we're left down here with uh, a vector, but no parameter associated with it. And so we can't write this vector as a linear combination of vectors, because a linear combination means you've got a, a parameter or a multiplier in front of each vector. And here, uh, the multiplier is set at 1. We can't uh, alter this. So this is not a linear combination. And so we cannot apply theorem, uh, the theorem here. All right. And so in this case, our only uh, alternative is to go back to the first method. And so uh, let's, I'm going to go through that here just uh, because it's always good to have practice um, in doing that. So we look and we say, is the zero vector in the set? And um, a lot of times... When you have a constant term like this, uh, that's a red flag. Um, and you have to think about that very carefully because a lot of times in those cases it will not be a subspace because um, in a lot of cases it moves you away from the origin, which means that your set does not contain the origin. So that's what we're asking here. Is the zero vector in T? Well, 
for the z for the zero vector to be in there, that means that each of the elements uh, we we need to be able to make each of the elements equal to zero. So if you look at the the first or the second component, uh, for this to be zero, that means a has to equal six b. And in the third component, it would mean a has to equal negative two times b. Okay, so if we put that together. Uh, then that means that 6b is equal to negative 2b, and down here at this point. And uh, solving that, that means that b has to be 0. All right, and if b has to be 0, a is 6b, so that means a is 0. And in that case, we look back up the first component, that says you get a 1 there. And so, therefore, the origin is not contained in this set. All right, because to get zeros in the second and third positions, that means uh, we're going to end up with a 1 in the first position. So t does not contain the zero vector. Now at this point, you could stop and say t is not a subspace uh, of R3. But just for practice, I'm going to continue on uh, and say, um, is t closed under addition? And the answer is, uh, no, uh, it's not. Um, now, to show that, we need to um, add two vectors together. We need to take two vectors from t, add them together, and uh, see if we get um, another vector that is in the set. So, um, I picked 1, 0, 0. It's in the set uh, because it's what we just talked about. If the two, second two components are 0, then the first one has to be 1. And so, um, uh, so 1, 0, 0 is in the set. So I'm just going to add it to itself. And the result um, is 2, 0, 0. And so let's think, um, is that in the set? And uh, the answer is no, because as we said before, if the second two components are both 0, then the uh, first one has to be 1. So this vector is not in T. And therefore, T is not closed under addition. Um, so, just for practice again, let's check, is it closed under scalar multiplication? And here we have, uh, no, the answer is no, because we've got, um, again, I just chose 1, 0, 0, because we know that vector is in T, and multiply it, actually we can multiply it by anything other than 1, uh, I multiply by 2, we get 2, 0, 0, and that is not in T. All right, so um, this particular set T fails all three of those properties. Um, now here's one that looks similar to T. Um, it's uh, got the plus one, so it's got that constant term in it. Um, but notice here that uh, the A in the first uh, component here uh, is not constrained by anything in the other two components. And so um, this one's a little bit different. Still, we cannot apply the theorem because of that, that 1 in the first component. Right? We cannot write S as a linear combination of um, uh, vectors um, because we, we can't uh, account for that 1 uh, by doing that. So um, my point really in, with this example is to show that uh, just because you can't apply the theorem does not mean that the set is not a subspace. And so, in fact, this one is a subspace of R3. So we're going to go through and just show that. So uh, we have to go back to the original method for that. And so we ask, is the zero vector in, uh, that should be in S, sorry about that. Is the zero vector in the set S? And the answer is yes. Um, because uh, B and C could certainly be 0, and we can set A equal to negative 1, and in that case we end up with a 0 vector. Um, is it closed under addition? And uh, the answer is, well, we take two arbitrary elements of the set, say U and V, so here's what U looks like, here's what V looks like, and when we add those together, we get this vector, so just u2 plus v2 in the second component, u3 plus v3 in the third. In the first, we get u1 plus v1 plus 2. Now, you ask, is this vector in the set? And the answer is, 
Um, well, it's not clear from looking at this whether it is or not. However, if we write it in this form, okay, then it's clear because now, um, you know, this, obviously the second two components are just real numbers. And the first one, I by, by factoring out a, a plus one and then... Uh, uh, gathering what's left here in parentheses. Now this thing here, u1 plus v1 plus 1, is a real number. And so now my first component looks like some real number plus 1. And um, so that's a real number. Uh, u1 plus v1 plus 1 is real. u2 plus v2 is real. And u3 plus v3 are real. Therefore, um, u plus v has to be in T or in S. Sorry about that. So it's closed under addition. Um, we take a similar approach to show that it's closed under scalar multiplication. Again, take a generic vector and a scalar. Uh, multiply the two. And again, here I had to factor out that plus one so that I could make it look like uh, the form that it has to be to be in the set. And that leaves me, in this case, with uh, this quantity here. Um, but that's a real number, right? Because C is real. U1 is real. Uh, obviously, 1 is real. So this quantity is a real number. So I got real number plus 1. And then the second two components are clearly real numbers. And that's what it takes to be in the set. So we can conclude that the set is closed under scalar multiplication. And so it's a subspace of R3. Um, another example, um, this one, uh, first glance, looks like maybe uh, you could uh, use the theorem here, but it turns out that you can't with that a times b in the first component. Uh, there's no way to break that up in a linear combination. And so you, this one, the theorem, uh, does not apply. And so we go back uh, again to the original method. Um, and uh, uh, look and see, does this contain the zero vector? And clearly it does because you can set A and B both equal to zero and that gives you the zero vector. Is it closed under addition? Uh, well, here, uh, let's go back and look at that set. Maybe it's not clear, um, just looking at that, whether it would be closed under addition or not. You have to do some thinking uh, a little work to, to arrive at a conclusion on that. Um, so really there are two approaches you could take. Um, one of them is to play around with the numbers and try to find a counterexample to show that it's not closed. So a counterexample would be a specific example, okay, specific numbers that you plug in and uh, show that the set is not closed. The other approach is to try to make a formal argument to show that it is closed, okay? And whichever one of these you pick really depends on the problem um, and whether you have uh, some intuition one way or the other. Um, and it also uh, actually depends a little bit on your personality. Uh, would, you, uh, would you rather uh, play around with the numbers and try to come up with a counterexample or um, would you rather take a more straightforward approach, which is to try to show that it's closed? Because a lot of times in that case, if you're trying to show that it's closed, um, you will either succeed or you will get to a point where you see why it's not closed. And so, um, so taking that route's a little more of a, a deliberate approach. Uh, Playing with the numbers to try to find a counterexample is a little more of a random approach, but either either is valid, and um, it kind of depends on, as, again, on your intuition, uh, whether you have a, a gut feeling one way or the other, and which, you, which you'd rather do, you know, what, what you think is uh, the better way to go. Um... With this one, I'm going to choose the latter approach because maybe I, I, I don't know, it's just uh, not clear to me which, you know, whether it's closed or not closed. I don't have, maybe I don't have a gut feeling on that. So I'm just going to take the safe, deliberate approach and try to show that it's closed and see where that takes me. So I pick two arbitrary elements from the set. 
Okay, these vectors I've written here, P and, uh, U and V, and uh, when I add them together, uh, I get this vector. And so what I want to know is uh, if I multiply the second and third terms together, does that equal the first term? All right, so I'm asking, does, does first term, PQ plus XY, equal P plus X times Q plus Y? And as I look at that, I say, well, no. You know, sometimes it might, but in general, no, that does not hold. So that tells me, hmm, this is probably not closed under addition. And so uh, I think I'm going to switch horses now, switch gears, and try to find uh, a counterexample. All right. Um, and so at this point, you kind of uh, scratch this out. Um, consider that to be your scratch work and you start over. Okay, so start over here and this time I'm going to try to find a counterexample. And so, um, you know, my advice is uh, make life simple. Uh, you know, a lot of, you can do a lot with just ones and zeros. Um, so here I chose U to be 1, 1, 1, right? Second two components are 1, multiply them together, you get 1, so that means first component is 1. And V, um, I uh, have 1, 2 in the second and third components. Multiply those together and get 2. So the, the first component in V has to be 2. All right, so, so both these vectors are in S. And I add them together. And uh, so I get this vector 3, 2, 3, just adding component-wise U and V. And then I check, is this vector in S? And the answer is no, because when I multiply the second two components together, 2 times 3, I get 6. Um, but my first component is not equal to 6. Um, it's equal to uh, 3. And so um, this vector, u plus v, is not in s. So s is not closed under addition. Uh, now at this point, we know that s is not a subspace of R3. But uh, again, for practice, let's keep going and look and see, well, is it closed under scalar multiplication? And uh, again, you can, you've got the choice which approach you want to take. Find a counterexample or work on a formal argument to show that it is closed. Um, in this case, I'm going to think, hmm, you know, it wasn't closed under addition, so I'm going to just uh, bet that it's probably not closed under scalar multiplication. So I'm going to fudge around and see if I can find a counterexample. So I need to come up with a vector that's of the general form and a scalar c such that when I multiply c times the vector, it, I get one that's not in, in the set. Um, this is uh, a trial and error process. Um, and again, I would say start simple. Ones and zeros are good. Now, from before, we know that 1, 1, 1 is in the set because second two components, 1 times 1 is equal to 1. And so, um, you know, I might multiply by 0, but then I'm going to get 0, 0, 0, and that is in the set. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do me any good because that doesn't change the vector. I want something that's outside the set. So how about 2? If I multiply 2 times u, I get 2, 2, 2. And then I ask, is that in the set? And so you multiply the second and third components together. 2 times 2 gives you 4, but the first component is not 4. So therefore, this vector is not in the set, and we've shown that S is not closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, and uh, so, so now you have some examples, uh, examples that you can apply this theorem on, and some examples that you can't. Uh, my advice is, uh, you know, to, if you can't apply that theorem, you want to, because it makes your life easier, uh, much less work. Um, if you can't, then you must go back to the original definition and show that the three properties either show, either show that they all hold or show that one of them doesn't hold. And when you're doing that, to show that, show that one of the properties holds, you must make a generic argument um, you know, to show that it sets closed under addition or closed under scalar multiplication. You must make a generic argument. Uh, it's not sufficient to show that uh, you can find two vectors that you can add together and get get one that's in the set. You have to show that that holds for any two vectors that you pick. And that means you must make a general argument to show that 
a set's not closed um, under either addition or scalar multiplication, uh, you need to find a counterexample. And a counterexample means come up with a specific example with real numbers, and by real numbers I mean actual numbers, um, just like this one that's on your screen now. Um, you know, a specific vector, 1, 1, 1, a specific scalar, 2. Multiply those together and see what you get and show that that's not in the set. So that's a counterexample. So to show that it is closed, make a general argument. To show that it's not closed, find a specific example. In section 4.2, we're going to talk about a couple of concepts uh, that uh, we're not familiar with the terminology, but we are familiar with the concepts behind these terms. First of these is the null space of a matrix. We say the null space of an M by N matrix A, written uh, as null A, is the set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation AX equals 0. Okay, so null A is simply set of all X such that X is in Rn and AX equals 0. Okay. Uh, X has to be in Rn because if A is an M by N matrix um, and we want to be able to multiply A times X, then there must be an entry in X for every column of A. And so X must be from Rn. So null A is simply the set of all solutions to AX equals 0. The fact that we're calling it the null space uh, probably gives you a clue that it's a subspace, and indeed it is. The theorem here says the null space of an M by N matrix is a subspace of Rn. Uh, let's look at this matrix A given here um, to generate an explicit description of null A we have to solve AX equals 0. Right? An explicit description means you can look at it and, and generate a, an entry in null A. Okay, So to do that, we have to solve AX equals 0. Um, so we throw that into an augmented matrix and do a couple of row operations, uh, giving us the matrix given here. So we see the general solution uh, is X1 equals 6X2 plus 2X4 and x3 equals negative x4, and x2 and x4 are free variables. If we put it in parametric vector form, uh, we have uh, x1 is 6x2 plus 2x4, x2 is just x2, and so forth. So notice that any vector in the null space of A is a linear combination of these two vectors given here. So if we put those, uh, uh, if we look at those, we can say uh, any vector in the null space of A is in the span of those two vectors. Um, and uh, if you remember the theorem from section 4.1, it said that if you can write your set as the span of a finite set of vectors, then it's automatically a subspace of that apparent vector space. So here we've written uh, for this particular matrix A, we've written a set of solutions to AX equals 0 as the span of these two vectors. So therefore, the null space of A is a subspace of R4. The second concept uh, that uh, we're going to talk about here in, in this section is the column space of a matrix. And once again, it's new terminology, but not new fundamental material here. So the column space of an M by N matrix A, which we write as call A, is the set of all linear combinations of the columns of A. All, right? all linear combinations of the columns of A. Um, we know that to be the span of the columns of A. All right? So if A is equal to A1 through AN, the column space of A is just the span of A1 through AN. Um, and uh, since we've... Uh, the definition here is that uh, column space of A is the span of a set of vectors. So it, too, is a subspace of uh, some vector space. Uh, in this case, if A is M by N, then the column space is going to be in RM because uh, when you take a linear combination of, of vectors with M components, you're going to get another vector 
with M components. So the column space of A is in RM. Another way to look at the column space of A is to write it as a set of all B, such that B is equal to A times X for some X in RN. Because when you multiply A times X, you're simply taking a linear combination of the columns of A. Um, here's a set S, um, defined in terms of this generic vector. And uh, you're asked to find a matrix A such that S is equal to the column space of A. So uh, we simply take that generic vector, write it in parametric vector form, so we can write anything in S as a linear combination of these three vectors given here. Um, so if we put those vectors into a matrix, then we can say that um, anything in S is a linear combination of the columns of A. And so um, S is equal to the column space of A. Um, as I said before, the null space of A and the column space of A are simply new terms for describing entities with which we are already familiar. Null A is just the set of all solutions to AX equals zero. Right? That dates back to like section 1.3, 1.4, or somewhere back there. Um, a column space of A is just the set of all linear combinations of the columns, uh, or uh, the span of the columns. So again, we're going back to fundamental uh, information that we learned in chapter one. Okay, so um, if we have a matrix A, how do we determine if a particular vector X is in the null space of that matrix? Well, go back to the definition. Null space of A is a set of all vectors satisfying AX equals zero. So we just need to multiply A times X and see if we get zero. Um, again, um, to multiply A times X, uh, we're taking a linear combination of the columns of A, so there needs to be a, a component of X that corresponds to each column of A. There are N columns in A, so we need N elements in the null space of A. So null A is in RN. Okay, so here's a vector, and we're asked, is this in the null space of the given matrix? So we simply multiply uh, the matrix times this vector um, so that we're taking a linear combination of the columns here and uh, uh, go through the arithmetic and we end up with a zero vector. So the answer is yes, it is in the null space of A because A times X is equal to zero here. All right, uh, what if we have a, a matrix A and another vector and we want to know if that vector is in the column space of the matrix? So again, look at the definition. Uh, B is in the column space of A if AX equals B is consistent. So we need to solve a system to determine if uh, B is in the column space of A. And again, um, uh, the column space of A is going to be a subset of RM because we're taking linear combinations of uh, vectors with M components and so we get another vector with M components. All right, so here's a vector, and we want to know if it's in the column space of A for the given matrix A. So we need to solve the system, uh, all right, set up the augmented matrix, solve the system. So I've done that, left out the uh, specifics, the row operations, but we end up with this matrix here. And so the question is, is does this correspond to a consistent system? And the answer is yes, because we have no rows, 0, 0, 0, something not 0. Uh, the fact that we have a row of all zeros is really irrelevant. The fact that we have free variable is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is that we don't have a row that's zero, 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 not zero, because that would tell us it's inconsistent. So since the system is consistent, that means that this vector is indeed in the column space of A. All right, let's look at this uh, example. Here's a set W, and uh, we're asked, is it a subspace of R4? Um, so we can write it, uh, write any generic element of W as a linear combination of these two vectors. So we, we write it in parametric vector form. 
And so we can say that W is equal to column space of this matrix. Just taking these two vectors, sticking them in the columns of a matrix. Uh, the column space of this matrix uh, uh, is all linear combinations of these columns, which is exactly W. So that means that W is a subspace. All right, um, how about this example? Um, this one, um, uh, it's not uh, so easy uh, or so clear to see because um, we, uh, we have this constant term one here and so we can't write this set as a linear combination of vectors. Um, so in this case, we have to go back to the definition of subspace. That's those three properties that every subspace must um, satisfy. So first one was, does, does it contain the zero vector? And uh, if we look, uh, for it to contain the zero vector, clearly D uh, has to be zero, uh, which would mean that the second component would be two times zero plus one, which is one. And so if, if you get zero here, you're going to have one up here. And therefore, the, the zero vector is not in this set. So it is not a subspace of R4. Um, about this set, uh, is this set a subspace of R4? So we've got all vectors A, B, C, D that satisfy these two equations. Um, there's actually two ways we could go about doing this uh, using what we've learned uh, in this section. One is easier than the other. Uh, let's take the, uh, the hard way first. Um, and uh, we're going to try to write S as uh, the column space of some matrix A. So we need to figure out what A would be. Um, we're going to simplify things a little bit. Um, Instead of C here, we're just going to substitute A plus 3B. And then instead of D, we're going to substitute A plus B plus C, but we're going to plug in what C is uh, since, since we've gotten rid of C. So D uh, is uh, B plus C plus A, and C is A plus 3B. So we plug that in for C, and we end up with D equals 2A plus 4B. So... Uh, we can write any vector in S in this form. So we replace C with A plus 3B and D with 2A plus 4B. And then it's just a matter of uh, writing that uh, in parametric vector form and throwing those columns into a matrix. And so S is equal to the column space of uh, A, where A is given here. And uh, thus, S would be a subspace of R4, since the column space of any matrix is a subspace. Now the other way to look at it, so re I rewrote the problem here. The other way to look at it is uh, to note that we could write S in this form. So basically I've taken these two equations that uh, we have here, and I've uh, taken all the, the variables over to the left side, and, and so we've got zeros on the right. And so when you see zeros on the right, you should think, hmm, that's a homogeneous system. Um, and um, so we can write S as the null space of A, where A is equal to the coefficient matrix from this system of equations. So you see 1, 3, negative 1 uh, for A, B, C, and then 0 for D, and from the first equation. And then the second equation, we get 1 times A plus 1 times B plus 1 times C minus 1 times D. So that's where the second row comes from. So remember what the null space of a matrix is. It's just the set of all solutions to AX equals 0. And uh, so I've just taken this system of equations, written it, uh, uh, or taken these equations, written them as a homogeneous system, and then I can use the fact that uh, the null space of a matrix is always a subspace, and we're done. So that's why I said one was uh, harder than the other. This is clearly the easiest way. All right. Um, let's uh, revisit the concept of linear transformations for just a bit. Um, and this is, again, back to Chapter 1. Um, 
where we talked about linear transformations. Um, one uh, new term that we didn't learn back in chapter one was the idea of the kernel of a linear transformation. And the kernel of a linear transformation is simply the set of all vectors that map to the zero vector. So uh, the kernel of a linear transformation is exactly the null space the null space of the matrix that defines the transformation. So kernel and null space are uh, analogous concepts. Uh, the range of a transformation is the set of all vectors um, that get mapped to. So the range is in the codomain. Okay, sometimes it's all of the codomain, sometimes not, but it's it's the range is a set of all vectors that get mapped to by some vector from the domain. Um, and so um, the, uh, the range of uh, T is actually the column space of A, where A is the transformation of uh, the matrix that defines the transformation. So the kernel of the transformation is the null space of A. The range of the transformation is the column space of A. Okay, um, last I want to talk about just um, a, the, looking at the contrast between the null space of a matrix and the column space. Um, these really, on the surface, uh, are very different sets. Uh, we will kind of pull them together a little bit later on in this chapter, but for right now, they're really very different sets and they don't um, uh, uh, share... Um, they share analogous sorts of ideas, but, um, but that's kind of the extent of it at this point. So let's assume A is an M by N matrix. Then the null space is in Rn. The column space is in Rm. The null space is implicitly defined. That means you, you're given a condition that vectors in the null space must satisfy, but you can't look at a matrix A and know uh, which vectors are in it. Uh, you have to solve that system AX equals zero. On the other hand, the column space of A is explicitly defined, right? Because it's just uh, the set of all linear combinations of the columns. So you can look at the matrix A and you know uh, um, that the columns that you're looking at are actually in the column space. And you know how to create more entries in the column space. All right, to find vectors in the null space requires work. You have to solve the system AX equals zero. Um, note, however, that the zero vector is always in the null space of A, right? because A times the zero vector gives you the zero vector. Um, to find vectors in the column space of A, you just compute linear combinations of the columns. So it's a direct um, process to do that. Uh, there's no obvious relationship between null A and the entries in A. On the other hand, uh, the relationship between A and the column space of A is obvious since each column is in the column space. The typical vector V in the null space satisfies A times V equals zero. The typical vector in the column space um, has the property that AX equals V is consistent. Okay, so and for null space, um, you're multiplying A times V uh, to see if you get zero. To see if a vector's in the column space, you're solving a system AX equals V. So V is on the right-hand side in that case. Given a specific vector V, it's easy to determine if V is in the null space. You just see if A times V is equal to zero. Um, to determine if V is in the column space, you have to solve a system of equations. All right, um, the null space equals only the zero vector um, if and only if AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. Okay, so how do you get what's in the null space? We have to solve AX equals zero. And if you get only the trivial solution, then that means there's only one solution, which is a zero vector. The column space of A is equal to RM if and only if AX equals B is consistent for every B in RM. Right? That means that everything, uh, no matter what you put on the right-hand side, uh, 
the system will be consistent. So every B is a linear combination of the columns of A. And then relating it to uh, linear transformations, the null space of A is equal to the zero vector only if and only if uh, the transformation x to ax is one to one. So if you back up to the previous one, uh, we had uh, that uh, null a is equal to only the zero vector if ax equals zero has only the trivial solution. And remember that's going to occur um, when you have no free variables and uh, or if there's a pivot position in every column. And so we know that indicates that that the transformation is one to one. And then the column space is equal to Rm if and only if uh, Ax equals B is consistent for every B. So that means every B in the codomain gets mapped to. So the transformation must be on to Rm. Okay, we're going to start uh, today talking about a basis for a vector space. And the idea of a basis is that it's a minimal in terms of number of vectors and uh, representative uh, in that it represents the vector space uh, set. So it's a minimal representative set. So let's explore uh, what that actually means. Um, before we really get into that, let's back up a little bit and uh, remember uh, what l a couple of concepts are that are key here. One is linear independence and the other is spanning. So let's start with linear independence. So here's the definition. A set of vectors, uh, V1 through Vp, is said to be linearly independent if the only solution to the equation uh, where you take a linear combination of the vectors and set it equal to zero. Okay, this linear combination set equal to zero. The only solution to that is when you set all the coefficients equal to zero. Okay, note that uh, this is always a solution. We can always set the coefficients equal to zero and uh, generate the zero vector. What we want to know is if this is the only solution. So, uh, thinking in terms of a systems of e system of equations, uh, we know the system's consistent. We want to know if uh, this the solution is unique or if there are an infinite number of solutions. So that's when we get into talking about free variables. Does the system have a free variable or not? Okay, so we set up that augmented uh, matrix for that system. Um, we put it in echelon form and we want to see if there are free variables, right? Because if there are free variables, that means an infinite number of solutions and the, and the vectors would not be linearly independent. And uh, if we don't have free variables, that means uh, the solution is unique, so the vectors are linearly independent. Okay, so to check for linear independence, uh, we we really don't have to tack on that, that zero column on the uh, augmented side. We can just look at the coefficient matrix, put it in echelon form, and see if there's a pivot position in every column. Okay, because we want to know are there free variables or not. So is there a pivot position in every column? Okay, there are a few um, uh, cases that are obvious. Uh, one is where you have more uh, vectors than you have entries in each vector, like this matrix given here. These the three vectors could not be linearly independent because you have three vectors in R2. There's no way you can have a pivot position in each column. Um, if you just have two vectors, they're linearly independent if neither's a multiple of the other. And in general, a set of vectors is linearly independent if none, okay, can't find any of the vectors in the set that can be written as a linear combination of the others. All right, let's move on to spanning sets. Um, take that same set of vectors, V1 through Vp, and assume they're in Rn and they are said to span Rn if the equation where you take a linear combination of those vectors and set it equal to B is consistent for every B in Rn. 
Okay, that means you can take a linear combination of those vectors and generate any vector in Rn. Now, obviously, we can't solve this system for every b in uh, Rn. It should be Rn, not Rm. Um, so how do we know if it's going to be consistent uh, for every b or not, right? Then the linear uh, independence, right-hand side was 0. We can solve that system. But here, we want it to be consistent for every b. Okay, so we can't go and plug in every possible vector b on the right and solve the system to see if it's going to be consistent for everyone. So what do we do? Well, we know that it will be uh, consistent if we never end up with a row where we've got all zeros and then something not zero on the right-hand side. Um, in, when we put the matrix in uh, echelon form. Right, so if we have this, okay, where all zeros and then something not zero, then it's inconsistent. So we want to, to know if we never get that. And the way um, that that happens is uh, we have a pivot position in every row, right? If there's a pivot position in every row of the coefficient part of the matrix, okay, then you'll never end up with all zeros uh, in a row of the coefficient part of the matrix. So this, the um, so to check to see if a set of vectors is linear is uh, spans um, whatever vector space they're in, um, we need to have a pivot position in every row. Okay, so the columns of A are linearly independent if there's a pivot position in every column of A, and they span R M if there's a pivot position in every row of A. Okay, it's assuming A is an M by N matrix, so the columns are in RM. All right, so let's look at some examples. Um, here's a set with just one vector. Is it uh, linearly independent? And uh, the answer is yes, because you have a single non-zero vector. Uh, is, uh, is always going to be linearly independent, right? The only time just a single vector is linearly dependent is if that vector is the zero vector. Okay, does this set span R2? Um, and the answer is no, because uh, if you look at all linear combinations of that vector, you're just getting multiples of that vector uh, which is a line in R2. So you only get uh, a line, not all of R2. Oops. All right, let's look at uh, this set T. Now I've got three vectors. And uh, first let's ask, is T linearly independent? And uh, the answer is no, because... Uh, you've got more vectors than there are entries in each vector, right? So if you put those vectors in a matrix, there's no way you could have a pivot position in every column. Um, this, does the set span R2? Uh, yes, because uh, if you just even look at the first two vectors, they are uh, not multiples of each other, and so not collinear, so they will span the plane. Now, uh, if you want to go back and just look at it in matrix form, uh, take those vectors, put them in a matrix, put it in echelon form, and look and see. Do you have a pivot position in every column? No, so they're not linearly independent. Do you have a pivot position in every row? Yes, so they do span R2. Okay. Now let's look at uh, one more set. Now this one is like the other one, except I just took out that last vector. Um, so again, is it linearly independent? Uh, yes. It's uh, uh, We've got two vectors, and neither is a multiple of the other. So they're linearly independent. Does it span R2? Notice that should be U instead of T there. Um, does it span R2? And again, it's yes, uh, for the same reasons that you used before. Look at it in matrix form. Um, you've got a pivot position in every row, uh, so the vectors span R2. You have a pivot position in each column, so they're linearly independent. So we see that any set that spans R2 has to have at least two vectors, because you have to have one in each row, a uh, pivot position in each row. 
um, any set that's linearly independent must have two or fewer vectors, right? Because once you get over two, you can't have a pivot position in each column. So any set that's both linearly independent and spans R2 has to have exactly two vectors, right? Exactly two. Because uh, to span, it needs at least two. To be linearly independent, it needs no more than two. So if you want both, then you have to have exactly two vectors. Uh, such a set that's both linearly independent and spans R2 is said to be a basis for R2. Um, here's a formal definition. Set of vectors uh, B1 through BP is a basis for some subspace H if the set's linearly independent and the span of the set is the subspace. Okay, so you need two pieces to be a basis, one linear independence, the other must span the subspace. So let's uh, look at a few examples. Um, here's a set and I want to know is this a basis for R3? Um, so um, pick one of the criteria, either linearly independent or spans, and uh, see if those are satisfied. Um, so let's start off with is it linearly independent? Well, if you uh, set up the uh, augmented matrix, set it equal to zero, um, then uh, you can clearly see you don't have a pivot position in the uh, second column here, and so can't be linearly independent. So it's not a basis. All right, how about another set? There's one uh, not so clear here. Uh, whether these vectors are linearly independent. Um, so we uh, put them in a matrix, do some row operations, and uh, we end up here with a coefficient matrix. Notice it has uh, a pivot position in every column. So the only solution is the trivial solution. Therefore, uh, the vectors are linearly independent. Um, we can also look at the matrix here and see that there's a pivot position in every row. Um, so they span R3, and therefore uh, they must be a basis for R3. So the key is looking at the coefficient matrix uh, in echelon form. You can see a pivot position in every column, so they're linearly independent. Pivot position in every row, so uh, they span R3. Now here's another set. Is this a basis for R3? And uh, you're probably thinking, well, there's only two vectors, and in R3, you need three vectors to span. And that's right, because if you look at that matrix, uh, you can't have a pivot position in every row. So therefore, these vectors can't span R3, and therefore can't be a basis for R3. Now, how about this one? If you look at this one, maybe you're thinking, oh, we've got four vectors in R3. They can't be linearly independent, right? Because if you put them in a matrix, um, there's no way to have a pivot position. Oops, no way to have a pivot position in every column. You've got four vectors, only three rows. Can't have a pivot position in every column, so not linearly independent. Now, here's a, a little different question. Um, here I've got four, a set of four vectors, um, and I'm not asking though, is this a basis for R3? Clearly it's not, because four vectors can't uh, be linearly independent. What I'm asking though is for you to find a, a basis for the span of this set. Okay, so we don't really know what the span of this set is. It's some uh, either all of R3 or some piece of R3. We don't know. Um, so um, we want to know um, whatever that space is, uh, what is the basis for it? Well, you know, one of the criteria for a basis is that it spans the set. So um, clearly, if we just take all four vectors, they're going to span uh, w because that's how w is defined. So the question is are they linearly independent? And we already know that they're not uh, because uh, there's four vectors in R3. 
So, um, remember, if, since they're not linearly independent, then that means that at least one of them is a linear combination of the others. And um, so one strategy would be to throw out the ones that are dependent on the others and then um, reduce that down to where we have a linearly independent set. All right. Now, in this case, um, I'll point out to you that the second vector here is twice the first. You can look at that. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times negative 4, negative 8, and so forth. And the last one, okay, vector 4 here, is the sum of the first and the third. So we've got 1 plus 0 gives you 1. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1, and so forth. All right? So that tells us that the second vector is dependent on the first. Okay, it's a linear combination of the first. And the last one is a linear combination of the first and the third. So it seems like we should be able to throw those out. Okay, we don't need them. Okay, and if we do, then we're left with these two vectors. And um, we can look at it and see that it's linearly independent because we've got two vectors that are not multiples of each other. Um, it's still a little iffy on whether this set spans the original set W, right? So, because we threw out some, how do we know that these two still span uh, the subspace? Well, um, let's uh, introduce a little shortcut notation here. Let's uh, say we're going to call the four original vectors V1 through V4, all right? And uh, so any vector in the span of those vectors, or any vector in W, can be written in this form, linear combination of those four vectors. All right. Now, uh, we know, though, that V2, the second vector, was 2 times the first one. So we have this relationship here. And we know that V4 was the sum of the first and the third. So we have this relationship. So we can plug that in back up in this equation. So um, substituting for V2, we can plug in 2V1. And for V4, we can plug in V1 plus V3. And then if we do a little rearranging, we can write V as just a linear combination of V1 and V3. Okay, We've got different coefficients, but that's OK. Just needs to be a linear combination of V1 and V3. So here we've shown that any vector that was a linear combination of v1, v2, v3, v4 is also a linear combination of just v1 and v3. Therefore, um, just v1 and v3, just those two vectors, will span w. And we've already said that they're linearly independent. So therefore, they are a basis for w. Right. So we start off with our big set, threw out the ones that were dependent on the others and what we were left with still spans and it's linearly independent so it's a basis now in that problem I told you which vectors were dependent on the others so what can you do when that's not so obvious right how can you figure out which ones are are dependent when you can't just look at it and, and, and tell um, well there's an amazing thing, and that is that when you do elementary row operations, um, the, the dependence relations among the columns are not changed. Okay, So these are the four vectors we had uh, before. And remember, the second one is 2 times the first. The last one is the sum of the first and the third. All right, so I put it in echelon form, and I get this matrix, and look. The second column here is 2 times the first, right? 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 0 is 0. And the last column is still the sum of the first and the third. 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0. So you can take your original matrix or original vectors, throw them in a matrix, put the matrix in, in echelon form or reduced echelon form, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, in that matrix, uh, the vectors will still exhibit the same uh, relationships among each other. 
So what you see here is that the ones that we want to keep are the ones where we have pivot positions. Okay, because if if one, like the second one here, is dependent on the first one, there's no pivot position in column two. Column four is dependent on the first and the third. There's no pivot position in column four. So the, the uh, pivot columns indicate which columns uh, are, indicate the columns that are linearly, uh, that should be independent. Pivot columns indicate the columns that are linearly independent. Okay, so those are the ones we want to keep. And we have a theorem that says that the pivot columns form a basis for the column space of A. All right, now, uh, along with this comes a warning, uh, which is to be careful to use the pivot columns of A, that is the original matrix, not uh, some echelon or reduced echelon form of A. And that's because um, elementary row operations can change the column space of a matrix. Okay, so we go back and look at that example one more time. Um, the column space of A, that is all linear combinations of the columns of A, uh, is not the same as a set of all linear combinations of the columns of B. Okay, those are not the same. And so um, the uh, column spaces are not the same. For example, the first column of A is clearly in the column space of A. We take one times the first column, zero times the others, and that's what you get. But uh, that column is not in the column space of B. Why? Well, when we set up the system, we've got this right-hand side. Notice system's inconsistent because we've got all zeros and then something not zero. Okay, it's not in the column space. So the column spaces are different. Therefore, you can't take the pivot columns from B and say that that's a basis for the column space of A. You need to look in your echelon form or your reduced echelon form, see which ones are the pivot columns, and then go back and pull those from the original matrix. All right, here's another example. Here's a matrix, and you're asked to find a basis for the column space of this matrix. So we put it in echelon form, uh, get this matrix, and notice we get pivot column in a pivot position in the first column, third column, and the fifth column. So therefore, we go back and take the first, third, and fifth columns of A for a basis for the column space of A. Okay, and here's a little different question. Same matrix, you're asked to find a basis for the null space of A. All right, remember the null space, set of all solutions to AX equals zero. So let's solve AX equals zero. Um, get the same matrix here. Um, we look at the general form of the solution. Um, from the first row, we get x1. It's going to be negative 2x2 minus 4x4. x3 is going to be 7 fifths uh, x4. And from the third row, we get x5 is just equal to zero. x2 and x4 are free variables. So if we put that in parametric vector form, uh, we get what's given here. And um, so any vector in the null space of A can be written as a linear combination of these two vectors, right? So that means that they span the null space of A. So we've got half, we're halfway to being a basis. Still need to um, uh, show that they are linearly independent or uh, reduce the set so that we get a linearly independent set. Um, so the question is, we know that they span. Are they linearly independent? And if you just look at them, it's clear that they are because we've got two vectors that are not multiples of each other, so they must be linearly independent. So these two vectors would be a basis for the null space of A. Now, an important point is that in general, um, when you solve AX equals zero and write your solution in parametric vector form, the vectors that you get will always be linearly independent. So in fact, when you write that solution in parametric vector form, it's going to, you've got a set of vectors that spans and they will be linearly independent. Now why are they linearly independent? Because the only way to produce the zero vector 
is to set each of the free variables equal to zero. So if you go back and look at the one we were just looking at, right? if you didn't know, uh, if you can just look at that and tell that they're not multiples of each other, so they're linearly independent, right? if you tried to solve the system, then notice that uh, from in the second component, you've got uh, x2 plus 0 would equal 0. So x2 has to be 0. Um, and x4 times 1 equals 0 means x4 has to be 0. Because of the way these vectors are uh, produced, um, you always end up with the, the, the element that corresponds to, to the free variable. So in this case, the second component, since this is multiplied by x2. Uh, if you looked at that whole row, then um, the only solution would be to set x2 equal to 0. And similarly for x4, x4 has to be 0. So when you write your solution in parametric vector form, automatically you have a basis because they span and they're linearly independent. All right, one more uh, example. Um, I've got three vectors here, and uh, we're given that uh, v1 minus 3v2 plus 5v3 is equal to the zero vector. And you're asked to find a basis for the span of these vectors. So again, clearly you know that if you took all three, you have a set that spans. Um, but we know from what we're given that they're not linearly independent. So we need to figure out which vectors to throw out until we get to a linearly independent set. And um, since we can write any of the three as a linear combination of the other two, right, simply solve this equation for any of the three vectors, then we could throw any of them out. Um, but it's uh, kind of a convention to uh, throw out the first one that's linearly dependent, which would be V3. And so we're left with V1 and V2. And uh, if we just look at those, we can see that they're not multiples of each other. And so therefore, the set V1, V2 is linearly independent. It still spans, and therefore, it's a basis for W. All okay, today we're going to talk about using a basis as a coordinate system for a vector space. We start off with the unique representation theorem, and it says, uh, suppose you have a basis B, which consists of the vectors B1 through Bn, and uh, you choose some x from the vector space V, um, and the theorem says that no matter which x you pick from the vector space, the there are a unique set of scalars, C1 through Cn, that uh, you can use to take a linear combination of the vectors in your basis to produce x. Okay, now, um, so it's really saying two things. It's saying that that system's consistent. You can take a linear combination of the b's, and uh, you can produce any vector in the vector space. And it's also saying that the solution to that system is unique. And uh, both these things follow from the fact that B is a basis for V. Um, the fact that um, it's a basis tells you that these vectors span V, so therefore that system is going to have a solution no matter what X is. And it also tells you that these vectors are linearly independent, and since they're linearly independent, the solution to that system will be unique, since there's no free variables. Okay, now the weights that we use, these C values, um, are called the coordinates of X relative to the basis B. Okay, and we write them uh, using your, your book's notation as uh, X with the brackets around it, this uh, notation here with a subscript B. Um, and we call that the coordinate vector of X relative to the basis B. All right, so for example, we have a basis for R2 here, the vectors 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, just a, a quick aside, how do we know that that's a basis for R2? Uh, well, the simplest way is to say 
Well, we know the dimension of R2 is 2, and here we have a set with two vectors that are linearly independent. And we know they're linearly independent because there's two vectors and neither is a multiple of the other. All right, so my question is, based on this particular basis, can you find the coordinates of the vector 0 or 1, 0 relative to this basis? So um, just setting up the system that we talked about previously, I need to take a linear combination of the vectors and the basis to produce x. And so we can set up that system in an augmented matrix and uh, solve the system. And uh, this tells us that uh, the numbers we're looking for are negative 2 and 1. Just a quick check. If we multiply negative 2 times the first vector plus 1 times the second vector, that gives us 1, 0, which is what we were looking for. So that tells us that the coordinate vector of x relative to b, which we write in this notation, is negative 2, 1. All right, uh, suppose we go the other way. Suppose you're given the coordinate vector and you want to find the uh, corresponding vector. Um, so in this case, all you need to do is uh, compute that linear combination. You have the coordinates, so it's uh, in this case be 5 times the first vector plus 10 times the second, and we uh, compute that to be 3550. Okay. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but kind of uh, leads us into what we're going to talk about next. If you have any vector, um, say just AB, um, then uh, the vector itself is the coordinate vector relative to the standard basis. So let's refresh our memory about what the standard basis is. Um, that's just the uh, for R2 just the uh, two columns of the identity matrix. Now your book refers to that as the uh, uh, labels that set with a script E. All right. So notice um, that if you've got uh, a vector AB, then that's just A times 1, 0 plus B times 0, 1. So your coordinates are A and B. So therefore, the coordinate vector is just equal to the vector itself, right, which is just AB. So Relative to the standard basis, the entries in a vector are actually the entries in the coordinate vector. Okay, so um, just a little review. If we have a basis um, and a coordinate vector, how do we find the corresponding vector? Well, we just uh, compute that linear combination. All right, so we know that uh, this linear combination can be written in uh, as a matrix times a vector. And so if we define this matrix, we'll call it P sub B to be the matrix consisting of the vectors and the basis. Then this linear combination can be written as P sub B times the coordinate vector. And we say that P sub B is the change of coordinates matrix from B to the standard basis of Rn. Right? So we're taking uh, uh, P sub B, multiplying it by the coordinate uh, vector relative to B, and we end up with the coordinate vector relative to the standard basis, which, as we saw before, is just the vector itself. All right, so um, let's talk about how we go back the other way. If we're given a basis and a vector, how do we find its coordinate vector? Well, um, we uh, um, need to solve a system, right? Uh, take the linear combination, set it equal to the vector, and solve the system. We need to figure out what those multipliers need to be. So looking at it in matrix terms, um, we have this relationship, but we don't know what the coordinate vector is. So therefore, we need to solve the system for the coordinate vector. And one way to do that is to um, multiply both sides by the inverse of the uh, matrix, and uh, that'll give us the coordinate vector. Now, the, the danger there is, well, how do we know that matrix is invertible? Well, we actually do know that uh, it's invertible because 
um, we know that its columns are a basis for Rn. And uh, so that's actually straight out of the invertible matrix theorem, but you can uh, kind of get there uh, um, in a couple of steps if you think, well, columns are a basis for Rn, so that means uh, that the columns must be linearly independent, which means there's a pivot position in every column, therefore n pivot positions. So the matrix is invertible. Okay, so we're going to put those two ideas together uh, in this question. So here I've got two bases for R2. So bases, uh, that's the plural of basis. Uh, if you've seen that, kind of confusing, but bases is just the plural of basis. So we have uh, two bases for R2 here, we call them B and C, and I have a coordinate vector for a vector x relative to basis B. All right, so a coordinate vector of x relative to B, which is this vector here. And I want to know how do we find the coordinate vector of x relative to C? Well, um, you can think of it probably easiest as a two-step process. So first, um, use the coordinate vector relative to B to find actually what x is. Right? And once you know what x is, then you can find the coordinate vector of x relative to C. All right? So we'll do those two steps. So the first one here, um, to find x, we just multiply uh, our uh, piece of B matrix, right? the matrix consisting of the vectors in B, times our coordinate vector, and we find that x is 2, 44. And once we know that, then we just need to take a linear combination of the vectors in C um, and set that equal to 244 and solve that system. Okay, or uh, look at it like this, where we uh, solve the system by taking the inverse of that matrix times x. So here's a uh, p sub c. Um, these are just the columns that are in the basis C. We invert that matrix, multiply by 244. So what we have here, I'm taking 1 over the determinant um, times this matrix times 244, and I end up with a vector 4, 2. So this is coordinate vector of x relative to C. Now just to check, we can take that, these coordinates, uh, times our vectors in C, and see if we get x, which we do, 244. All right. So let's take, let's go back and take a look at what we did. All right. First step was to compute x, which we did by p sub b times x of b, and then compute the coordinate vector relative to c by p sub c inverse times x. Now we can't put that all together. All right. Just uh, plug in for x. And we have the coordinate vector of x relative to c is just pc inverse times p sub b times the coordinate vector relative to b. And so what we have is a change of coordinates matrix uh, from b to c. So this matrix takes us from coordinates in b to coordinates in c. All right. So pc inverse times p sub b is how we can change uh, b coordinates to C coordinates. All right, we're going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about polynomials. Um, let's uh, examine this problem. I want to show that these polynomials are a basis for P sub 3. Okay, this is actually a homework problem from uh, section 4.5, I think. Okay, so to show that these are a basis for P sub 3, we need to show that they span p sub 3 and that they're linearly independent. So um, let's start off and show that they're linearly independent. So to show any sets linearly independent, we have to take a linear combination and set it equal to the zero vector, or in this case, the zero element of p sub 3. So here's a linear combination, all right? c sub 1 times the first element, c sub 2 times the second one, so forth equals, here's the zero element of p sub 3, 0 plus 0 times t plus 0 times t squared plus 0 times t cubed, all right? And we want to be able to show that, that the only solution to this system is that all the c's have to be 0. 
So the way to approach that is to collect uh, like terms, all right, collect all the constant terms, collect all the coefficients of t, and so forth, and then uh, equate those coefficients to what we have on the right-hand side. So we do that, we end up uh, with this, so this comes from, we've got C1 here, and then uh, from this term we get a 2 times C3, so that's our constant term. Uh, coefficients of t here, we've got a 2 times C2 from here, uh, and over here a negative 12 times C4, so that's where that comes from. For t squared, I've got 4 times C sub 3, and uh, for t cubed, i got an 8 times C sub 4. Oops. All right, so those are equal to this zero vector again. Now, uh, if you write out that system of equations, right, we're going to get c sub 1 minus 2c3 equals 0. 2c2 minus 12c4 has to be 0, and 4c3 has to be 0, and 8c4 has to be 0. So if you write that out, it looks like this. And when you look at it like that, it's obvious uh, that all the c's have to be 0. Right From the last equation, you get c4 has to be 0. From this one, we get c sub 3 has to be 0. And since both c3 and c4 are 0, then that uh, means that c1 and c2 have to be 0. Right? So we've shown here that the polynomials are linearly independent. Um, let's just look at it in uh, matrix form. Right? If we just look at the coefficients, uh, it's already in echelon form, and we have a pivot position in every row. So from that, we know that these polynomials must span p sub 3. So no matter what the right-hand side is, there'll be a solution. All right, so we have that they're linearly independent, and they span p sub 3, so they have to be a basis for p sub 3. Now, there's actually a somewhat easier way to look at this, um, and that is to... Um, to look at the polynomials and what we ended up with in the columns of this matrix. Now, uh, actually the way it works is a polynomial of this form, here's a um, degree 3 polynomial, um, actually has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the vector in R4 that looks like this. Uh, first comes the constant term, then the coefficient of t, coefficient of t squared, and the coefficient of t cubed. So, for example, our polynomial, one of them was just 1, so that corresponds to the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, and R4. And if you look, that's what the first column of this matrix, our coefficient matrix, was. And then just to pick another one, how about the last one, negative 12t plus 8t cubed? All right, then that's going to have, that's 0 for the constant term, negative 12 for the coefficient of t, 0 coefficient of t squared, and 8 for the coefficient of t cubed. And that's what the last column in our coefficient matrix looks like. So the bottom line is that every polynomial in P sub n can be represented as a vector in Rn plus 1. Right? So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between polynomials in P sub n and vectors in Rn plus 1. All right, let's talk about the dimension of a vector space. To do this, we need to go back and uh, review what a basis is. Recall that a basis is a set of vectors um, that is linearly independent and spans uh, the subspace that uh, it's a basis for. So let's think about uh, R3. If you have more than three vectors in R3, then they must be linearly dependent. Right, you put them in a matrix, put it in echelon form, then you would have free variables. Uh, if you have less than three vectors, then they don't span R3. Right? If you had only two, you wouldn't be able to have a pivot position in every column if you stuck them in a matrix. So, or wouldn't have a pivot position in every row, excuse me. Um, so they would not be, um, they would not span R3. So, if you put those two together, um, you need at least three uh, to span. Uh, if you have more than three, they're linearly dependent. So that means that any basis for R3 has to have exactly three vectors. 
Why our theorem says that if a vector space has a basis of n vectors, then every basis for that space must have exactly n vectors. Um, this number of vectors in a uh, basis for a vector space is called the dimension of that vector space. And we have a, uh, a special case where uh, uh, the vector space has only the zero element. Okay, we call that the zero vector space. And since there's no basis for that set, then we define its dimension to be zero. Okay, so to find the dimension of a vector space or subspace, then one approach is simply to find a basis for that space and count the number of vectors in that basis. Uh, the standard basis for Rn consists of the vectors E1 through En. So you might recall that uh, E sub i is the uh, vector in Rn that has a 1 in the ith position and zeros out everywhere else. Or you can think of E sub i as just the ith column of the identity matrix. Uh, so the standard basis for R3 is... Uh, uh, consists of these three vectors, which you'll recognize as the columns of the 3x3 three three identity matrix. So in general, the dimension of Rn is n. Now right, let's talk about polynomials. Um, P sub n, if you recall, is the set of polynomials of degree n or less. So for example, P sub 2 uh, consists of all polynomials um, that are quadratic or less, okay, all polynomials that look like a naught plus a1 times t plus a2 times t squared, where the uh, a values are just real numbers. The standard basis for p sub 2 is uh, this set, 1, t, and t squared. So any vector in p sub 2, any polynomial in p sub 2, can be written as a linear combination of these three uh, objects. So the dimension of p sub 2 is 3. And in general, the dimension of p sub n is n plus 1. Okay, what if we have a set like this, uh, defined uh, in terms of these parameters? Um, how do we find the dimension of uh, such a set? Uh, well, first let's find a basis. And to do that, we can write uh, this generic vector in parametric vector form. And uh, so at this point, we know that these three vectors span our set S. And so, <coughs> excuse me, so we want to know, are they linearly independent? And to check to see if they're linearly independent, we throw them in a matrix, do some row operations, uh, get that in uh, echelon or reduced echelon form. Uh, I, I got it in reduced echelon form. And uh, we can see here there's not a pivot position in every column. Therefore, uh, they're not linearly independent. We can see that there's a pivot position in the first two columns. So that means that the first two vectors are linearly independent. And notice that the negative one-third here means that the third column is minus one-third of the first column. And if you look back, uh, that is true. Minus one-third of three is negative one. Minus one-third of six is negative two, and so forth. All right. Uh, so that means that, that we can throw out that third column, and a basis for S would just consist of the first two vectors. And once we have a basis, then we need only count the vectors in the basis to get the dimension. So there's two vectors in the basis. That means the dimension of S is two. And uh, we don't say that S is R2, okay, because it's not, because these vectors are in R4. But what we do say is that S is a two-dimensional subspace of R4. All right, the basis theorem, this is an important theorem. It says that if you have a vector space with dimension P, where P is greater than or equal to 1, then the following conditions hold. Number one, any linearly independent set of P elements in V is a basis for V, automatically. Don't have to check to see if it spans. 
Similarly, any set of p elements that spans v is automatically a basis. Okay, don't have to check to see if they're linearly independent. All right, so since we know the dimension of R3 is 3, if you have a set of three vectors in R3 that are linearly independent, then you know they're a basis. You don't have to check to see if they span, because they will. Similarly, if you have a set of three vectors that span R3, then you know they're a basis for R3. You don't have to check to see if they're linearly independent, because they will be. Okay, so we basically end up with uh, three pieces of the puzzle. Um, Let's go back to that. Uh, three pieces of the puzzle. Knowing the dimension, having a set uh, of that many vectors that spans, or having a set of that many vectors that's linearly independent. If you have any uh, two of those three pieces, then you can conclude that you have a basis for the vector space you're, you're dealing with. Okay. Um, for given a matrix A, how do we find the dimension of the column space of A? Well, we go back to our method, find a basis, and count the number of vectors in the basis. Now let's think back, how do we find a basis for the column space of a matrix? We will put A in echelon form uh, so that we can find the pivot columns. We pull those columns from A, right? not from the echelon form, but from the original matrix A, and that's our basis. So here's uh, one, I think we looked at this one last time. Um, we take the matrix A, put it in echelon form. Uh, we can see that the first, third, and fifth columns are pivot columns. So we pull the first, third, and fifth columns from A, and that's a basis for the column space of A. And once you have a basis, then uh, getting the dimensions trivial, just three vectors in the basis, so the dimension of the column space of A is three. In general, the dimension of the column space of a matrix is simply equal to the number of pivot columns in the matrix. All right, how about the null space? We have a matrix A, how do we find a basis, or how do we find the dimension of the null space of A? Well, once again, find a basis and then count the number of vectors. So let's uh, think back, how do we find a basis for the null space of a matrix? Uh, well, we have to solve AX equals zero and write the solution in parametric vector form. And the vectors that we get there uh, both span the null space of A and they're linearly independent. We made that argument last time that when you write those in parametric vector form, they will be linearly independent and therefore there'll be a basis for the null space of A. So if we start with this matrix A, we solve AX equals zero. Um, and uh, write the solution in parametric vector form. Uh, we'll get these two vectors, and uh, they are, oops, that should, yeah, x5 is 0, right? Yep, x5 is 0, so that, that's right. Um, so these two vectors are linearly independent. They span the null space, so they're a basis for the null space. Therefore, the dimension of the null space for this particular matrix is 2. Note that in general, the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of free variables in AX equals 0, right? Because that's, you have a vector here corresponding to each free variable. And where do free variables come from? They come from columns that don't have a pivot position. So the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of non-pivot columns in A. Recall the dimension of the column space is the number is equal to the number of pivot columns. Null space dimension is equal to the number of non-pivot columns. So if we add those two quantities together, the dimension of the null space plus the dimension of the column space, we get the number of pivot columns plus the number of non-pivot columns, which is equal to the number of columns. And we'll hit on that some more next time. All right, let's uh, move on to talk about the rank of a matrix today. Now, first, a little bit of review. Um, remember, the uh, column space of a matrix is the set of all linear combinations of the columns, which is also the span of the set of columns of the matrix. So we're going to talk about a, a, another subspace um, 
this time the row space of a matrix. So we know what the column space is, so what do you think the row space of a matrix uh, is? Mm, well, if you just take the analogous uh, route, then we get uh, the row space of a matrix is a set of all linear combinations of the rows or the span of a set of rows of the matrix. So it is truly just the analogous uh, term to the column space. Okay, we have the column space, all linear combinations of the columns, row space, all linear combinations of the rows. Okay, so think back to find a basis for the column space of a matrix. Uh, we put the matrix in echelon form so that we can determine which columns are the pivot columns. Then we go back to the original matrix and pull out those columns, and that's a basis for the column space of the original matrix. So the question is, how do we find a basis for the row space of a matrix? And here, uh, the similarities end somewhat, although there still are some similarities. Um, but this theorem tells us how we can find a basis for the row space of a matrix. Okay, so it says if two matrices A and B are row equivalent, all right, so you can get from one to the other doing elementary row operations, then their row spaces are the same. Now you'll recall that that is not true for the column spaces. When you do elementary row operations, you may be changing the column space of the matrix. But this theorem tells us that, that for row space, that stays the same when you do row operations. Okay, If B is in echelon form, the non-zero rows of B form a basis for the row space of A as well as for that of B. Okay, So this tells us to find a basis for the row space of A, we put it in echelon form and pull the non-zero rows from that echelon form matrix and we have uh, a basis for the row space of the original matrix plus uh, the echelon form matrix and any uh, intermediate matrices that we encountered. Okay, so again, elementary row operations um, do not change uh, uh, this Let's back up here. Uh, this is talking about the linear dependence relationships among the columns. Okay, so that means like if the second column of A is uh, 10 times the first column, then when you do elementary row operations, that doesn't change. So elementary row operations do not change the linear dependence relationships among the columns of a matrix. However, they can change the linear dependence relationships among the rows of a matrix. Okay, so let's look at a little simple example. We start off with this matrix A. Uh, we do uh, one row operation, end up with this one, which I'll call B. Now, a basis for the column space of A, right, we, um, we could just look at A and say, well, I can see that the second column is a multiple of the first, so I throw it out and just keep the first column. Or you could look at B and see where are the pivot positions in B. Well, there's only one in the first column, so that means we want to pull the first column for A from A uh, to be a basis for the column space of A. Um, if we want a basis for the column space of B, that's that's straightforward because B is already in echelon form, so we just pull. We know what the pivot columns are. There's only one first column, so that's a basis for the column space of B. Okay, so if we look graphically at the column space of each of these matrices, okay, the red line here, um, you can see this vector right here, this is 1, 1, and so this red line is any multiple of the vector 1, 1, so that's, the red line is the column space of A. Uh, this vector here is 1, 0, and since that's a basis for the column space of B, the blue line, or the x-axis, is the column space of B, right? All multiples of 1, 0. So clearly here, these uh, column spaces are not the same, right? They, they, uh, these matrices are row equivalent, but their column spaces are not the same. All right, let's look again, same set of matrices. Now, the row spaces are the same because if we want a basis for the row space of A, then right, we look at each row of A. Well, they're the same row, right? Each row is the same, and so we only need one of them. Throw out the second one, and we keep the first row, and that's a basis for the row space of A. 
All right, if we were using the theorem, we would get A in echelon form, which we have here, and take the non-zero rows of that matrix. Well, the non-zero rows is just that row 1, 2. So either way you look at it, you end up with this basis for the row space of A. And similarly for the row space of B, um, it's going to be all multiples of the row 1, 2, because 0, 0 didn't add anything to the picture. So this set which consists of just that one row, is a basis for both the row space of A and the row space of B. Now let's look at a little, uh, a little more uh, interesting example. Um, there's a big matrix A, and uh, after some row operations, we end up with this version of A. Okay, this is an echelon form, and we'll call that matrix B. Okay, so to get a basis for the column space of A, we look at B, we can see that there's a pivot position in the first column, the second column, and the fourth column. So we choose those columns out of A, first column, second column, and the fourth column, and that's a basis for the column space of A. So the dimension of the column space of A is the number of vectors in this basis, which is 3. To get a basis for the column space of B, um, we look at B, it's already in echelon form, so we choose the non, uh, choose the pivot columns, and so we get the first, second, and fourth columns. That's columns, the basis for the column space of B. And the dimension of the column space of B, count the vectors in a basis, that's 3. So the dimension of the column space of B is 3. Um, Alright, what about a basis for the row space of A? which we know from the theorem will also be a basis for the row space of B. Well, according to the theorem, put A in echelon form and choose the non-zero rows. So we do that, we get the first, second, and third rows of B, which are given here. So the dimension of the row space of A is equal to the dimension of the row space of B, and notice there's three vectors here, so that is three. Alright, so we got the dimension of the column space of A is 3, dimension of the row space of A is 3, and the question is, is this a coincidence that they're both the same value? And uh, if you think about that just a little bit, uh, you can say, no, um, I don't think so, because the dimension of the column space of A is the number of pivot columns or pivot positions in A, and that's uh, you know, we look at B to figure that out, but there's three pivot positions. And uh, the dimension of the row space of A is also equal to the number of pivot positions because there's a pivot position in each non-zero row in B here, or in an echelon form of A. So every, each of these values is based off of the number of pivot positions, right? Because a pivot position defines a pivot column and a pivot position defines a non-zero row. So, uh, for any matrix, the dimension of the column space is equal to the dimension of the row space, which is equal to the number of pivot positions in that matrix. Okay, and this quantity is what we call the rank of a matrix. Okay, the rank of a matrix is the dimension of the column space which is also equal to the dimension of the row space of that matrix. Okay, so we just call that the rank of the matrix. All right, back to this one. Let's talk about the null space. Um, what is the dimension of the null space of A? Well, we end up with a... Uh, a if we want to find a basis for the null space, right, we... Um, solve AX equals zero and write our solution in parametric vector form and those vectors will be a basis for the null space of A. Now um, how many vectors do you end up with in that case? Well you end up with one for each free variable. Okay, Key is one for each free variable and if you think about that a little more you think hmm well where do I get a free variable? Well it's a uh, free variable is one whose column does not contain a pivot position. So the dimension of the null space is the number of free variables uh, in AX equals zero, also equal to the number of non-pivot columns in the matrix. 
Okay, for this particular matrix, dimension of the null space is three because here's a non-pivot column, uh, the third one, and the fourth and oh, fifth and sixth. So the third column, fifth column, sixth column are all non-pivot columns. So we have three non-pivot columns, and therefore the dimension of the null space is three. All right. So once again, this number three pops up. We have dimension of the column space is three, dimension of the null space is three. So I ask again, is this a coincidence? Hmm. And the answer is yes, it is a coincidence. It's coincidence because um, dimension of the column space is the number of pivot columns. Dimension of the null space is the number of non-pivot columns. So when you add them together, you get what? The number of columns in the matrix. Um, so it just so happened that there were six columns in this matrix. And so if the dimension of the column space is three, then the dimension of the null space is going to be six minus three, which is also three. So that's totally coincidence. Had there been seven columns, the dimension of the null space would have been four. All right, so we have the dimension of the column space plus the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of columns. And since the dimension of the column space is equal to the dimension of the row space, we have the dimension of the row space plus the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of columns. And one more time, since the dimension of the column space and the dimension of the row space are equal to the rank of A, we have the rank plus the dimension of the null space is equal to the number of columns. Okay, so in this section we have uh, another installment of the invertible matrix theorem. And if you uh, recall, uh, we had this version of it, or this installment of it back in section 2.3. Um, and uh, so this should be seared into your memory at this point. If not, you go back and review it. Um, but uh, one of the pertinent things is... Uh, uh, recall that the whole idea here is that all these statements are equivalent, uh, which means that they're either all true or all false. Number one here says A is an invertible matrix. Now one of the most important pieces of this is number three, that A has N pivot positions. Because if you recall, when I was telling you about how to uh, remember all this, I told you the easiest way is to relate everything to pivot positions. So if we can establish uh, for any part of this that A has N pivot positions, then we're done. All right, so what we have new here, uh, we have six new things. Four of them are given here, so let's take a look at these. Uh, number one says the columns of A form a basis for Rn. Okay, um, if that's true, if they're a basis for Rn, then that means uh, that they must be linearly independent and they must span Rn. Either one of those says that there's a pivot position in every row and every column. Therefore, they're in pivot positions. So A is invertible. Uh, the column space of A equals Rn. Uh, that means that uh, the columns of A span Rn which again, they can only do that if there's a pivot position in every row, meaning there's n pivot positions. The dimension of the column space is n. Um, that actually falls from number two here. Um, if column space of A equals Rn, you, we know that there are n vectors and a basis for Rn, so therefore the dimension of the column space is n. And the rank of A equals n. That follows from number three, since the dimension of the column space is equal to the rank of a matrix. Okay, then we have two more that deal with the null space. Um, null space of A is just the zero vector. Okay, so if that's true, then that means that if we look at the system AX equals zero, it has only the trivial solution. That happens when there are no free variables, which means there's a pivot position in every column, which means there are n pivot positions. And uh, from number five follows number six because uh, the, if you have only the zero vector, uh, then that's a special case and we define the dimension of that vector space to be zero. 
All right, so all these are equivalent to the statement that A is an invertible matrix. So just like with those, uh, the first 10, I believe it was, let's see, yep, first 10, uh, these, these extra six, you need to commit them to memory, relating them to, to each other or to pivot positions. All right. Uh, I want to go through some of the some of the problems uh, at the end of this section because there's some excellent problems here. Uh, in fact, this section I think is the most important section in the course. So make sure that you um, really work on these problems and understand what you're doing here. So I'm going to do several of them at the end of the section. Okay, so the first one says, suppose uh, a 5 by 6 matrix, let's call it A, has four pivot columns. Okay, so it's a 5 by 6 matrix with four pivot columns. Okay, if it has four pivot columns, um, then that means it has two non-pivot columns. So what's the dimension of the null space of A? Must be 2, right, because you've got two non-pivot columns. Um, is the column space of A equal to R4? Well, um, the dimension of the column space is 4 because we have four pivot columns. Okay, So the dimension of the column space is 4, but the columns are in R5, and therefore um, they uh, uh, are the span of the columns is not equal to R4. Uh, it's just a subset of R5. All right. Next one, if the null space of a 7 by 6 matrix is 5 dimensional, okay, so that means you have 5 non-pivot columns, which means out of 6 columns, 1 is a pivot column, then therefore the dimension of the column space has to be 1. All right, suppose the null space of a 5 by 6 matrix is 4 dimensional then that means you have four non-pivot columns, so that leaves two pivot columns. And uh, we want another row, dimension of the row space. We have two pivot columns, so that means we have two non-zero rows when we put the matrix in echelon form. So the dimension of the row space is two. All right, how about if A is four by three? What is the largest possible dimension of the row space? All right, well, if A is 4 by 3, then uh, we could have uh, at most three pivot positions, so at most three non-zero rows when we put it in echelon form. So the maximum dimension of the row space is 3. All right, uh, if A is 3 by 4, what's the largest possible dimension of the row space? It's three by four, then the again the maximum number of pivot positions we can have is three. So we have at most three non-zero rows. So the maximum dimension of the row space is three. Uh, how about if A is six by four? What is the smallest possible dimension of the null space? So that's asking what's the smallest number of free variables you can have, in, or what's the smallest number of non-pivot columns you could have? Well, since we have more rows than columns, every column could be a pivot column, in which case uh, there's no free variables, and so the minimum dimension of the null space of A would be zero. All right, a little more complicated one here. Um, suppose a non-homogeneous system of six equations and eight unknowns has a solution with two free variables. Is it possible to change some constants on the equation's right sides to make the new system inconsistent? All right, so we got a non-homogeneous system, six equations, and eight unknowns and it's consistent with two free variables. Now what that tells you with the two free variables is that um, you have, since there's eight unknowns, we got eight columns. Two are free, so that means there are six that are pivot columns. Okay, so that would look like this. We've got six rows here, eight columns, um, two free variables, which leaves six pivot columns. All right? And it's saying, if we change the right-hand side, will the system still be consistent? 
And the answer is yes. Um, plug my computer in. Um, is it possible to change the, some constants to make the new system inconsistent? No, the answer is no to that. Um, because uh, no matter what's over here, since you have a pivot position in each row, uh, the system's always going to be consistent. No, I was thinking the question was, is, is the system always consistent? And the answer to that is yes. Right? And that is because you have a pivot position in every row. So you're never going to end up with a row of all zeros and then something not zero over here. All right, another one. Is it possible that all solutions of a homogeneous system of two equations and four unknowns are multiples of one fixed non-zero solution? Hmm. Okay, homogeneous system, two equations and four unknowns. Okay, so we think about that. We've got two rows and four columns, so we have at least two free variables. Right? So if we wrote our solution in parametric vector form, assuming we had two free variables, then it would look like this. Now what this says is that each solution is a linear combination of two fixed non-zero solutions, right? Each one of these vectors is what they're calling a fixed non-zero solution. So we're going to have at least two of these vectors. So that means that um, it can't be the case that uh, all the solutions are, are just multiples of one non-zero solution. If that was the case, we would only have one vector here. And we can't have that because we have at least two free variables. All right. Um, another one. Is it possible for a non-homogeneous system of three equations and two unknowns to have a unique solution for some right-hand side of constants? So three equations, two variables. All right, so that might look like this. Three equations, two variables. So, so you could have a pivot position in each column, and you could have a row of all zeros. In that case, Yes, the system would be consistent and there would be uh, a unique solution. All right, how about this one? Is it possible for such a system to have a unique solution for every right hand side? And, okay, look at that. You could have this situation, still have pivot position in each column, but have 0, 0, something not 0, in which case there's no solution. Right? So in this case, it's not possible for such a system to have any sort of solution for every right-hand side. Right? In some cases, it's simply going to be inconsistent. All right, that's it for this one. Okay, our topic for today is Markov chains. And uh, to uh, get us going on that, uh, look at a... a small example. So let's suppose uh, in a uh, given urban area uh, each year 5% of the population that's in the city moves to the suburbs and 3% of the suburban population moves to the city. And we're going to assume that this is a closed uh, uh, system here so uh, any movement uh, just goes from the city to the suburbs or suburbs to the city. So we're, we're not uh, considering moving elsewhere or people moving in from elsewhere. So just city to suburban, suburban to city. Okay, so let's assume that the current city population is 600,000 and the current suburban population is 400,000. Then what will the population of each be a year from now? Well, um, based on what we know, uh, next year uh, the city population is going to be 95% uh, of what it is now, right, because we each year 5% leave, so we're keeping 95%. And then 3% of the suburban population moves to the city, so we add on uh, 0.03 times the current suburban population. So that's... Uh, 0.95 times 600,000 plus 0.03 times 400,000, which gives us 582,000. So it makes sense that the city population is going down. We've got more moving to the suburbs than we have coming in. 
uh, to find the suburban population in a year, uh, we could just say, well, um, since the total is a million, then we can just say a million minus 582,000 and uh, get it that way, which is correct. But we could also look at it the way we did with the city and say, well, we're getting 5% of the city population moving to the suburbs and 97% uh, of the current suburban population is staying there. So we get 0 0.05 times 600,000 plus 0.97 times 400,000, which gives us 418,000. And uh, 418 plus 582 uh, gives a million total. Um, another way to look at it is, uh, let's look, take a closer look at those equations um, and notice that we've got um, 600,000 times the 0 .95, 0 .05 here, and we got the 400,000 times the 0 .03 and the 0 .97, and that looks like, hmm, we're taking a linear combination of a couple of vectors, the 0 .95, the 0 .05, and the 0 .03, 0 .97. So we can rewrite it in this form as a matrix times a vector, right? And so the linear combination is just 600,000 times the first column plus 400,000 times the second column, and that gives us our uh, population figures for one year from now. We can also look at, at it as percentages, which is typical um, instead of actual raw uh, numbers. Uh, so if we look at the population vector as 0.6.4, um, we do the same sort of uh, computation and end up with this uh, population vector for a year from now. And uh, if you notice that each one of these vectors, the columns of the matrix plus our two vectors here, each one of them sums to one. So they're, they're uh, special vectors uh, because they represent probabilities um, or percentages. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little more in just a minute. But before we get to that, notice that uh, what we have here, this is of the form some matrix, which I'm calling M, times a vector I'll call X0, which is like the original state of the system, original population. We multiply those together to get X1, which is the state in year one. We can continue that process to figure out what the population in year two would be year three and so forth, year k plus one. Uh, for any year, it's just uh, m times the population from the previous year. So for instance, if I wanted to figure out 10 years from now, what's uh, the population, then I could compute x2, which is, well, to compute x10, I need x9, right, because x10 is m times x9. To get x9, I need x8. To get x8, I need x7, and so forth. So I'd have to compute all those intermediate uh, population vectors. Uh, there is another way to do it, which doesn't require uh, that computation, um, and that is to look at it as I have here at the bottom. Uh, if we look at x2, for example, that's m times x1, but we know that x1 is m times x0, so x2 turns out to be m squared times x0. Similarly, x3 is m times x2, but we know x2 is m squared x0, so x3 is just m cubed times x0. And in general, we have xk, your k, uh, population would be m to the k times the original population vector. Okay, so a vector with non-negative entries that add up to one is called a probability vector. So back to, to these, um, all these are probability vectors because they all add up to one. Each column adds up to one. Okay, a stochastic matrix is a square matrix whose columns are probability vectors. So the matrix that we had here that is a stochastic matrix because each of its columns is a probability vector, a vector where their entries are non-negative and they sum to one. A Markov chain is a sequence of probability vectors, x0, x1, x2, and so forth, together with a stochastic matrix M such that x sub k plus one is just M times x sub k, right, which is the pattern that we had in our example. Um, the ith entry in xk is the probability that the system is in state i at time k. Okay, 
um, and we call xk a state vector because it represents the state of the system at time k. Okay, now an interesting question related to our, pop our population example is, will there ever be a point at which there's no net population change? That is, the number of people moving to the suburbs is equal to the number of people moving to the city. Okay, another way to look at it is, will there ever be a point at which xk plus 1 is equal to xk? All right, so you compute xk plus 1, um, and uh, it's the same as xk. Or will there ever be a point at which you have your current state is some vector x, you apply the transition matrix m to it, and you end up back with the same vector x. Okay, and so this is the system we want to look at. Um, it's similar to systems that we know how to solve, but it's a little bit different because on the right-hand side here, we've got a, a variable. It's not a constant. Um, so it's not like an ax equals b system. Um, so we need to uh, manipulate it a bit before we can uh, use the things that we know about uh, solving systems. Okay, so we want to know, is it consistent? And the way we determine that is uh, if we bring the x over to the left-hand side, we get uh, mx minus x is a zero vector. And then the key is to factor out that x. And if we factor out the x, then we're left with m minus the identity matrix. So i here is the identity matrix. So what we end up with is some matrix, which is m minus the identity matrix, which we can compute directly, we know both of those, times x, which we don't know, equals a zero vector. So when we write it in this form here, it's a simple homogeneous system. Now clearly it's consistent because uh, x can be the zero vector and, and uh, that uh, obviously makes that consistent. However, that's not a very interesting case. So what we really want to know is, um, does this system have uh, an infinite number of solutions? Uh, are there any free variables? All right, well, if we look at this uh, matrix for our example, uh, all right, so we subtract off the identity, and we're left with this one, and it's clear when you look at that that the columns are not linearly independent, and therefore you have a free variable. So if we solve this system, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, one row operation, and we've zeroed out uh, the bottom row. And um, so first row tells us that 5 multiplying through by 100 makes life simple. So we get 5x1 equals 3x2. So that means x1 is 3 fifths times x2, where x2 is a free variable. And um, to get uh, the actual vector that uh, the probability vector that corresponds to um, this um, relationship between x1 and x2, uh, we want x1 plus x2 to equal a million, or we could say 1. Um, I'm doing it just for raw population numbers. Um, and x1 is 3 fifths x2, so we get this equation. Putting these two together, 8 fifths x2 is a million which says x2 is uh, 625,000, and therefore x1 is 375,000. All right, so um, we've reached the point here at uh, that the number moving out of the city is uh, 0.05 times 375,000, right? So because five, every year 5% 5 leave the city, so the population of the city at this point is 375,000. So 5% of that is 18,750. Likewise, the total moving out of the suburbs, which is 3% of the suburb population, which at this point is 625,000, is also equal to 18,750. So we've reached the point here where the number moving out of the city is equal to the number moving in. So there's no net population change once the system gets to this point. All right, um, a little more terminology for you. If P is a stochastic matrix, then a steady state vector, also called equilibrium vector, for P 
is a probability vector q such that p times q is equal to q. Right? Before we said m times x equals x. We're talking about the same thing here. All right, we have this theorem that says if p is uh, a stochastic matrix, then it has a unique steady state vector. Okay, and it, it, even though the system has an infinite number of solutions, if we require that the uh, elements sum to one, then that makes it a unique uh, vector. Okay. Furthermore, um, if x naught is any initial state, and we have x to the k plus x sub k plus one equals p times x sub k, then uh, the Markov chain converges to q as k goes to infinity. So what's interesting about this is that uh, the initial state is unimportant. It says if x naught is any initial state, um, then the Markov chain will converge to this steady state vector as uh, if you go, go to a big enough k. Okay, so let's look at another example. Here's a matrix. So let's get a 3 by 3. Um, and find the steady state vector for this matrix. So we need to compute P minus the identity. So there's that. And then we need to solve P minus I times X equals zero. So do a few row operations, end up with this matrix. And uh, so the solution is X1 is X3, X2 is a half of X3, where x3 is free, so back you can see x1 equals x3, x2 is a half of x3, and x3 is free. And again, uh, the elements need to sum to 1, so uh, we get, uh, since x1 is x3, x2 is a half of x3, that's where this second equation comes from. And uh, it turns out that x3 has to be 2 fifths, so that means x1 is 2 fifths and x2 is 1 fifth. So the steady state vector is this one here. And if you check out uh, what P times X is, multiply P times the steady state vector, turns out you get uh, that steady state vector back. So it checks out. All right, I want to show you one more uh, application problem. And this one I've taken from another book, a uh, book by Andrilli and Hecker. It's kind of an interesting one, I thought. And it's based on banks. I uh, say, suppose you're, you've got three banks in a certain town that compete for uh, business. And uh, Bank A right now has 40% of the customers, B has 10%, and C has 50%. So we write that uh, vector as uh, given here 0.4 corresponds to Bank A, 0.1 for Bank B and C with a 0.5. Okay, so the banks are obviously trying to um, woo customers from the other banks. And um, what we have here is uh, um, information about how successful they are at that. So we see that records show that each year Bank A keeps half of its uh, investors with the remainder switching equally to B and C. So if you look at the first column of this matrix, that uh, is... You can think of this column as being related to bank A. Um, in each row, uh, uh, the row, first row corresponds to bank A, the second row to B, and the third row to C. So got an A column, a B column, a C column, and an A row, a B row, and a C row. So the, the point five here uh, represents the probability that a person at bank A is going to stay at bank A. Then the point two, uh, point two five here represents the probability that a person in bank A is going to switch to bank B. And the 0.25 at the bottom represents the probability that a person currently at bank A is going to switch to bank C. All right, and it says bank B keeps two-thirds of its investors with the remainder switching equally to the other two. So the 0.667, that's the probability that someone who, who starts at bank B or who's currently at bank B is going to stay there. Um, for the next year. And then uh, the 0.167 here, that's probability someone who currently is at bank B switches to bank A. Okay, and same thing down here. Somebody at bank, a probability that a bank B customer will switch to bank C. Uh, then we say uh, bank C keeps half of its investors and the remainder switching equally the other two. So the 0.5 here 
is probability that customer at bank C stays at bank C. And these 0.25s here, probability that somebody at bank C switches to A here and switches to B here. Okay, so this is what we call our transition matrix. Um, and as I said, the IJth entry represents the fraction of current investors going from bank J to bank I. Okay, so um, we think of, again, if you think of this as uh, labeled uh, columns A, B, C, rows A, B, C, um, the entry, a particular entry represents person switching from whatever column they're in to whatever row uh, that value is. All right, to find uh, the uh, distribution of investors after one year, we take our transition matrix, multiply it by the current state vector, uh, which is this one, and uh, that gives us this vector here. After two years, uh, multiply the transition matrix times the distribution after one year. All right, so just take that one, slot it in here, do that multiplication, and here's um, what we have after two years. And so you can keep doing that for as many years as you're interested in. Um, if you would like to find the steady state vector, then you compute M minus the identity, which gives you this matrix, and then you solve the system M minus I times X equals zero, um, which uh, do some row operations that takes you to this point, and uh, so we have uh, x1 equals x3, x2 is equal to, to uh, 1.5 times x3, x3 is free. You should always end up with a free variable here because otherwise uh, you have the unique solution which is the zero vector and that's, uh, that's an error. Right? There should always be a free variable. All right, uh, have the uh, uh, element sum to one, tells us that x3 is 2 sevenths. And so our steady state vector looks like this, 2 sevenths, 3 sevenths, 2 sevenths. Um, and I didn't actually compute those uh, probabilities, um, but um, this is the method that you would use. Okay, today our topic is eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The equation that we're interested in when uh, trying to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors is this one, ax equals lambda times x. Here a is an n by n matrix, x is a vector in Rn, and lambda is a scalar. So we're essentially asking, um, can you find x and lambda, we, know, we don't know either of those, but can you find x and lambda such that when you multiply a times x you get the same result as simply scaling x by lambda. So if x is not equal to 0 and satisfies ax equals lambda x then it's said to be an eigenvector of a with associated eigenvalue lambda. Okay, So we require that eigenvectors not be 0 because uh, clearly the zero vector satisfies this equation. So we're looking for um, non-zero solutions. So x would be an eigenvector, lambda an eigenvalue. Now we've seen a similar system uh, to this when we were uh, finding the steady state vector for uh, a transition matrix back when we were looking at Markov chains. And that, if you remember, uh, looked like this. We had mx equals x. So we wanted uh, to know uh, if there was a vector x such that you apply the transition matrix to it and you get the same vector back. All right? Um, if you just uh, look at the x here as having a coefficient of 1, uh, so we have mx equals 1 times x, then it's of the same form as our eigenvector vector and eigenvalue equation, ax equals lambda x. So we have seen systems like this before, and we're going to solve them in a similar way as we, as we did when we found the steady state vector. So if you remember what we did then, we took the x over to the other side and factored it out, and we ended up with m minus i times x equals zero, um, and that was the equation to solve to find the steady state vector. We're going to do a similar thing 
uh, with our eigenvector system, uh, bring the lambda x to the other side, factor out x, and we end up with a minus lambda times the identity matrix uh, times x equals zero. So this is a system that we need to solve. Now, it's complicated here, more so than with the Markov chains, because we don't know what lambda is. We don't know x, and we don't know lambda. All right, now uh, let's think about this a bit. We know that uh, x to be an eigenvector can't be the zero vector. So we have a homogeneous system here, and we want to find non-trivial solutions to it. All right, so some uh, things that we know. Uh, this system is going to have non-trivial solutions if uh, it has free variables. Okay, and it has free variables if the matrix A minus lambda I does not have a pivot position in every column. And that happens when A minus lambda I is not invertible. Right, because if it doesn't have a pivot position, every column has fewer than n pivot positions, so it's not invertible. And uh, that happens when the determinant of that matrix, A minus lambda I, is equal to zero. And this last uh, item here is the key to how we are going to find eigenvalues. Okay, so we're going to compute the determinant of a minus lambda i, and that actually turns out to give us a polynomial. And we're going to set it equal to zero and uh, solve for lambda. Once we have the eigenvalues, then we can proceed to finding the eigenvectors uh, by plugging in uh, what we know for lambda for the eigenvalues, and then we just have a simple uh, homogeneous system to solve to find x. Okay, so let's look at an example. Here's a matrix A. It's a 2 by 2. We first find the eigenvalues of A by solving the determinant A minus lambda I equals 0. So here's A minus lambda I. Here's A minus lambda times the identity matrix. Okay, so we end up basically we're, uh, what you end up with is just subtracting lambda off the diagonal elements. And then we want to take the determinant of that matrix. So we take the determinant, do the crisscross, uh, and uh, we get this stuff. And we uh, expand, put it all together, and uh, then factor it. And when we factor it, we get lambda minus 8 times lambda plus 2. And we set that equal to 0, right? Because that's what we want the determinant of this matrix to equal 0. And clearly the solutions are lambda equals 8 and lambda equals negative 2. So those are our eigenvalues. Okay, um, here we ended up, go back, uh, we ended up with a lambda squared minus 6 lambda minus 16. That's a quadratic uh, function. So in a 2 by 2 matrix, we ended up with a quadratic. In general, if you have an n by n matrix, then the determinant of a minus lambda i will be a polynomial of degree n. So for a 3 by 3, you get a cubic function. 4 by 4, you get a degree 4, and so forth. Okay, so at this point, we have two eigenvalues for a. And uh, we want to find the eigenvectors or eigenvector or eigenvectors associated with each of these eigenvalues. So let's start off with lambda equals eight. Um, so we want to solve a minus a minus lambda i. Lambda in this case is eight. So a minus eight i times x equals a zero vector. So first we need to compute a minus eight i, and there it is. And then we set up that homogeneous system. And remember that the whole point of finding the eigenvalues was so that we would have a free variable. And so if you end up working on problems and you're trying to find an eigenvector and you don't end up with a free variable, then you've made a mistake somewhere. Either you don't have a correct eigenvalue or you, you made a mistake in solving this system. Um, so you should always end up with um, at least one free variable so that the system has non-trivial solutions. So in this case, uh, we end up with x1 equals uh, 3x2. x2 is free. So if we write it in parametric vector form, it looks like this. 
And uh, so that tells us that any multiple, right, any vector of this form, multiple of 3, 1, is an eigenvector of a corresponding to lambda equals 8. You can check that to, to make sure it works. Ax should equal lambda x. So if we multiply a times x, here's a, here's x. We end up with the vector 24, 8. And we can factor out lambda, which is 8. And uh, that we get 8 times 3, 8 times 1. And 3, 1 is our vector x. So that's equal to lambda x. So it works out. This is an eigenvector corresponding to lambda equals 8. All right. And we got another eigenvalue to look at. Uh, lambda equals negative 2. So we need to solve a minus lambda i x equals 0 again for uh, lambda equals negative 2. So we got a minus minus uh, 2 times i is just a plus 2 times the identity, which is this matrix. And we set up the homogeneous system. And again, do one row operation, the second row goes away, we got a free variable. And here's our solution. So if we write it in parametric vector form, we get this. And uh, so that tells us that any multiple of the vector negative one-third one is an eigenvector of A corresponding to the eigenvalue negative two. So, um, and you can check again like we did last time. Multiply a times x, you get 2, negative 6, and that is equal to negative 2 times negative 1, 3, which was the eigen uh, vector that I picked. Um, you, you're, you might be saying, hey, that didn't look like uh, this one that we got here, and it doesn't because uh, I just multiplied, I scaled it, because remember, any multiple of this vector is an eigenvector, so I just uh, chose x2 to be 3, and uh, scaled it. And so uh, 3 times negative 1 third gave me the negative 1, and then 3 times 1 gave me 3. And I did that just to get rid of the fraction there. But any multiple, any non-zero multiple, I should say, any non-zero multiple of this vector would be an eigenvector uh, corresponding to lambda equals negative 2. All right. Um, so given an eigenvalue lambda of a matrix A, we solve this homogeneous system, A minus lambda I times X equals zero, to find the associated eigenvector or eigenvectors. All right, now a little bit of terminology here. Think back um, to uh, the previous chapter. We talked about the null space of a matrix. And uh, remember, the null space of a matrix is just the set of solutions uh, to the homogeneous system involving that matrix. And so if you look at this uh, system we were solving to find the eigenvectors, you can see it's a homogeneous system. So the set of solutions uh, to this will be um, elements of the null space, or actually will comprise the null space of A minus lambda I. And uh, we give that space, since it's associated with finding eigenvectors, we give it a special name and call it the eigenspace of A. So the eigenspace of A corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda is just the null space of A minus lambda I, right? It's a set of all solutions to this system, A minus lambda I times X equals zero. So the eigenspace of A corresponding to lambda consists of the zero vector, right, because that's in every null space, and uh, all eigenvectors of A minus lambda I. Therefore, a basis for the eigenspace of A corresponding to lambda is the same as a basis for the null space of A minus lambda I. Okay, let's look at another example. Uh, let's find all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix A. So we start off uh, to find the eigenvalues. Um, take the determinant of A minus lambda I. And uh, here it gets a little complicated because it's got a three by three, so we have to expand about uh, one of the rows or columns. I expanded about the first column 
And so we get negative 4 minus lambda times the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix here. So that's what you see right here. Then it's, uh, since this is a plus position, next be minus. So that's where the minus 6 comes from. And then it's the matrix that you get when you delete that second row in the first column. So we get this. And then uh, it's a minus term, so the next one's plus. So I get plus 6 times uh, this little 2 by 2 sitting up here in the uh, upper right corner. And uh, then it's just algebra. You know, take these 2 by 2 determinants, do some algebra. Oops. Uh, there we go. Um, and we end up... Uh, with this cubic function, which makes sense because 3 by 3 matrix, and uh, it, we end up being able to um, rewrite it like this, negative lambda times lambda minus 2 squared equals 0, and so clearly uh, lambda equals 0 is a solution and lambda equals 2 is a solution. Now in this case, since it's uh, lambda minus 2 squared, uh, the eigenvalue 2 actually occurs twice because it's a solution twice here. So we say that lambda equals 2 has multiplicity 2. That means it occurs two times. Lambda equals 0, it only occurs once, so it has multiplicity 1. All right, then we need to do the same process as before to find the eigenvectors. Um, so for lambda equals 0, we need to solve a minus 0 times the identity times x equals 0. So in this case, uh, a minus lambda i is just a. So we uh, set up the homogeneous system and uh, get that matrix into reduced echelon form. Um, and here's the solution. So we write that in parametric vector form. And uh, so any multiple of negative 1, 1, one uh, would be an eigenvector associated with lambda equals zero. Okay, then we move on to the next eigenvalue, which is two. So we solve a minus two i times x equals zero. And uh, so we compute a minus two i. Then set up the homogeneous system and get it in reduced echelon form. And notice here that we've got two free variables, and so we're going to end up with two uh, linearly independent eigenvectors uh, here. And sometimes that happens because, remember, lambda equals 2 was um, an eigenvalue that occurred twice, had multiplicity 2. And so sometimes, in that case, you end up with two linearly independent eigenvectors, sometimes only one. In this case, we're going to have two because we have two free variables. So uh, the solution looks like this. Uh, every eigenvector of A associated with uh, lambda equals two is a linear combination of these two vectors. And clearly, they are linearly independent. So to review this problem we've just looked at, here's our matrix A. Um, Eigenvalues were 0 and 2. For lambda equals 0, we ended up with one eigenvector. Uh, lambda equals 2, we've got two linearly independent eigenvectors. Now clearly, any multiple of this one is an eigenvector associated with lambda equals 0. And any linear combination of these two is an eigenvector associated with lambda equals 2. But we're really concerned about how many linearly independent eigenvectors we have. And so from lambda equals 0, we got 1. From lambda equals 2, we got 2. All right, so we can say that the vector negative 1, 1, 1 is a basis for the eigenspace of A associated with lambda equals 0. Similarly, these other two vectors would form a basis for the eigenspace of A associated with lambda equals 2. All right, this brings us to a theorem which says if uh, V1 through VR are eigenvectors that correspond to distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1 through lambda R, of an n by n matrix A, then the set V1 through VR is linearly independent. Now put in uh, a little simpler terms. This just says 
Eigenvectors that come from different eigenvalues are linearly independent. Eigenvectors that come from different eigenvalues are linearly independent. So from our previ previous example, right, this first one uh, came from a different eigenvalue from the second two. So we know that um, this set is linearly independent, right, because the, the latter two came from the same eigenvalue, but they were linearly independent. We knew that from uh, before. And then when you throw in this other one that came from the other eigenvalue, we know that this set is linearly independent because of the theorem, because they came from different, uh, the first one and the second two came from different eigenvalues. All right, um, we're going to hit that a little bit more in the next section, um, but uh, we'll leave it at that for right now. And um, I just want to talk about um, uh, a little easier problem. Okay, what we've done so far is just taken, basically done the hard problem. Here's a matrix, find all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But sometimes uh, you just want to know if a given vector um, is an eigenvector of a matrix. And that is a much easier problem. Okay. So suppose we just want to know if this vector x given here is an eigenvector of the matrix A. For this, go back to the original equation and think, um, does Ax equal lambda x? Well, we can multiply A times x. That's trivial, right? And then how would we know if it's an eigenvector? Well, the result of A times x should be some scalar times x. So we multiply a times x, and in this case we get this vector here, and notice that I can factor out a negative 2, and I end up with negative 2 times this vector, which is the original x. So in this case we have ax equals negative 2 times x, so that means that x is indeed an eigenvector of a, and the associated eigenvalue is negative 2. Okay, so didn't have to solve any systems of equations or take determinants or anything like that. It was just a simple plug it into the basic equation and see if it satisfies it. All right, um, another uh, similar question is given uh, an, a, a scalar value, check uh, to see if it's an eigenvalue of a matrix. Um, and again, um, you don't have to go through the process that we were doing to find the eigenvalues. Okay, Just to check to see if a number is an eigenvalue, you need only look at the determinant of a minus lambda i, where lambda is the value that you're given. So in this case, we look at the determinant of a minus 3 times the identity. So we set up that matrix, take its determinant, and in this case, we end up with 0. And so the determinant of a minus 3i is equal to 0. That tells us that 3 is indeed an eigenvalue of a. If we didn't get 0, then it wouldn't be an eigenvalue. OK, a little more terminology. Um, this expression, the determinant of a minus lambda i, OK, that's what you end up with when you um, are, are uh, trying to figure out the eigenvalues of a matrix. Um, and we said that you end up with a polynomial there. It's called the characteristic polynomial of A. And when you set it equal to zero, then we call it the characteristic equation of A. So the characteristic polynomial is just what you get when you take the determinant, and then you set that equal to zero, and we call that the, the characteristic equation. Okay, we have now the final installment of the invertible matrix theorem. So um, if A is an n by n matrix, A is invertible if and only if 0 is not an eigenvalue of A. Okay, 0 is not an eigenvalue of A. And uh, actually, it's pretty easy to see that if you think about it a little bit. Um, every eigenvalue of A satisfies the, the characteristic equation, which is the determinant of a minus lambda equals 0. So if 0 was an eigenvalue of A, then we'd have the determinant of A minus 0 times I would be 0. But A minus 0 times I is just A. So we would have the determinant of A is equal to 0. 
and that means that A is not invertible. Okay, so therefore, zero can't be an eigenvalue of A if A is invertible. All right, let's uh, talk today about matrix diagonalization. First, we're going to introduce uh, the concept of a, of a similar matrix. So if A and B are n by n matrices, then we say A is similar to B, and also B is similar to A, if there is an invertible matrix P such that A is equal to P, B, P inverse. And we have this theorem which says if you have two matrices which are similar, then they have the same characteristic polynomial and hence the same eigenvalues with the same multiplicities. So remember, uh, the characteristic polynomial is just the determinant of A minus lambda I. That's the polynomial that you get um, when uh, you're trying to find the eigenvalues of a matrix. So this theorem tells us if you have two matrices that are similar, then they have the same characteristic polynomial and therefore they're going to have the same eigenvalues. Okay, now why is this of interest? Well, think back to uh, our section on Markov chains. We had this sort of uh, um, uh, equation that um, to get uh, x1 we multiplied our transition matrix, which I'm calling A here, times uh, the previous uh, state vector. So for x1, a times x0. a2 is a times x1 and so forth. x to the x sub k is a times x sub k minus 1. Now, um, we can, uh, if we, we look at it like this, then to find, say, our state vector at time 10, then you need to find the state vector at time 9. And to find the one at time 9, you need the one at time 8, and so forth. And so to compute x sub 10, you need x1, x2, x3, up through x sub 9. Um, another way to look at it is like this, that uh, we know, for instance, for x2, that's a times x1, but we know x1 is a times x0. So we make that substitution, and so we end up with x2 is a squared times x0. And similarly, x3 is a cubed times x0. So in general, xk is a to the k times x0. Now, unless a to the k is relatively easy to compute, uh, this really doesn't help us. However, if a to the k is easy to compute, then uh, we can compute uh, x sub k much more quicker than going through and computing all these subsequent state vectors. All right, so um, let's suppose that A is similar to a diagonal matrix. That is, A can be written as P, D, P inverse, where P is invertible and D is a diagonal matrix. Now, what does that get for you? Well, just look at what happens when you compute a squared. Um, a squared is a times a, and when we substitute p, d, p inverse in for a, we have this. Now, the trick here is to group the p inverse times p together. Okay, so we've got p inverse p right here in the middle. If we group that together, that's the identity matrix. And so then we get PD times the identity times DP inverse. And of course, anything times the identity is just that anything. And we got D times D, which gives us D squared. So A squared is PD squared P inverse. How about A cubed? A cubed is A squared times A. And so we take the A squared we computed up here, plug it in times A and do our trick again. Uh, reassociate to get the P inverse P together and uh, we end up with P D cubed P inverse. So it looks like in general A to the K is P times D to the K P inverse. Now what good is that? Well let's look at a diagonal matrix. Here's a simple 2 by 2 diagonal matrix. If we compute D squared 
then notice that we end up with another diagonal matrix and the entries on the diagonal are just the original diagonal entries raised to the second power. So in this case we were computing d squared so these are the original diagonal entries squared. d cubed uh, we get another diagonal matrix and the entries are the original diagonal entries cubed. So just looking at this example, it appears that it's easy to compute powers of a diagonal matrix. We just uh, raise each diagonal entry to whatever power we're trying to compute. So if A is similar to a diagonal matrix, computing powers of A is also easy. So we say that a square matrix A is said to be diagonalizable if A is similar to a diagonal matrix. That is, if A is equal to PDP inverse for some invertible matrix P and some diagonal matrix D. Now, uh, here is a very important theorem. It says an N by N matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if A has N linearly independent eigenvectors. So A is diagonalizable if it has N linearly independent eigenvectors. And furthermore, A equals P D P inverse with D a diagonal matrix if and only if the columns of P are N linearly independent eigenvectors of A. So this theorem not only tells us the condition, A condition under which A is diagonalizable, it also tells us how to uh, compute P and D. Okay? P is a matrix that consists of N linearly independent eigenvectors of A. And continuing on, it says the diagonal entries of D or eigenvalues of A that correspond respectively to the eigenvectors in P. So P consists of the eigenvectors, D uh, consists of uh, the eigenvalues on the diagonal. So let's uh, look at an example. Here's the matrix A. Um, you can recognize this matrix. We looked at it in uh, this, the video on um, uh, the intro to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so is it diagonalizable? Well, let's uh, find the eigenvalues. So we take the determinant of a minus lambda i and uh, we end up with lambda minus 8 times lambda plus 2 uh, as our characteristic polynomial. We set that equal to 0 and so our eigenvalues are lambda equals 8 and lambda equals negative 2. Now, at this point, we know that A is diagonalizable because uh, A has uh, two distinct eigenvalues. So it's a two by two matrix, it has two distinct eigenvalues. That means, uh, since we know that, eigen, that distinct eigenvalues uh, give us linearly independent eigenvectors, Right. And eigenvectors that come from distinct eigenvalues are guaranteed to be linearly independent and therefore A is diagonalizable. Now to find uh, P we have to compute uh, the eigenvectors. We already know what D is. D is a matrix, diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal. So uh, take lambda equals 8 and we need to solve A minus 8 times I times the times x equals a zero vector and uh, we uh, so we solve that system and we end up with uh, this vector in parametric vector form so any multiple of 3 1 is an eigenvector of a corresponding to lambda equals 8 so at this point we have one column of p to get the other column we look at the uh, eigenvalue negative 2 and solve uh, a minus negative 2i times x equals 0. And uh, here's that. Uh, we end up with uh, negative 1 third 1 as our uh, eigenvector. So any multiple of that, any non-zero multiple of that would be an eigenvector. And so um, I multiplied by, by 3, go back to that, I multiplied it by 
3, and so end up with negative 1, 3 for our second eigenvector. So um, the 3, 1 came from lambda equals 8. Negative 1, 3 came from lambda equals negative 2. And so D uh, consists of the eigenvalues, and uh, the order that you put the eigenvectors into P is not important. However, once you establish an order, you have to hold that uh, true uh, for both P and D. So the eigenvector here, 3, 1, came from lambda equals 8. So we need the eigenvalue 8 in the first column of D. And then the eigenvector in the second column of P should correspond to the eigenvalue in the second column of D. All right, and then uh, if we want to just check our work, uh, we can multiply P, D, P inverse. And uh, we end up with uh, A. All right, go through that computation, and you end up with A. So P, D, P inverse is equal to A. Let's look at another example. Here's another matrix, uh, uh, 3 by 3 in this case, and we want to know if it is diagonalizable. So, as uh, before, we find its eigenvalues uh, by looking at the determinant of a minus lambda i. Um, we end up with uh, this polynomial, negative lambda times lambda minus 2 squared equals 0. And uh, the um, uh, solutions will be lambda equals 0 and lambda equals 2. Now, lambda equals 0 occurs once, lambda equals 2 occurs twice since it's a squared term, so lambda equals 2 has multiplicity 2. It appears twice as an eigenvalue. Now at this point uh, we know that A has only two distinct eigenvalues, so therefore we don't know if it has three linearly independent eigenvectors or not, so we don't know if A is diagonalizable or not. Just because it doesn't have three distinct eigenvalues doesn't mean that it's not diagonalizable. Okay, that theorem only goes one way. If it has um, n distinct eigenvalues, then it will be diagonalizable. If it doesn't have n distinct eigenvalues, you don't know whether it's diagonalizable or not. You have to actually see if you can compute n linearly independent eigenvectors. So in this case, that's what we've got to try. Um, and actually for this particular problem, the real question is whether lambda equals 2, which occurred with multiplicity 2, will have one or two linearly independent eigenvectors. So let's look at lambda equals 2. We solve a minus 2i times x equals 0. And uh, we end up with, uh, Notice in the matrix here, you can see that we've got two free variables, so therefore we're going to get two linearly independent eigenvectors from this eigenvalue. And uh, so um, at this point, we've got two linearly independent eigenvectors from lambda equals 2. We know we'll get one more from the other uh, eigenvalue. So at this point, we know that A is diagonalizable, and actually we're two-thirds of the way towards producing uh, the P such that A equals P, D, P inverse. So we look at the other eigenvalue of 0 and solve A minus 0i times x equals 0. Then notice we've got one, uh, one free variable, so we end up with one linearly independent uh, eigenvector. And uh, so we know that A is diagonalizable. All right, here's our eigenvectors that we found. Um, so we know that A is equal to P, D, P inverse, where P is uh, this matrix. Now notice that the negative 1, 1, 1 came from lambda equals 0. So that means in the first column of D, I've got 0 here in uh, the diagonal entry. These last two eigenvectors came from lambda equals 2. And so in the second column and the third column of D, I've got 2 on the diagonal. Now, before, in the 2x2 two two example, we actually checked our answer by computing PDP inverse. But for 3x3, uh, three three, it's not so simple to compute an uh, inverse. And uh, if you've got a calculator, uh, that's not that bad. But if you don't, 
um, then then there's an easier way to check your answer. Um, and that is to note that if, if A is equal to PD, P inverse, uh, if we multiply both sides of that equation by P on the right, then we end up with P inverse times P, which goes away, and then we end up uh, on the left-hand side with A times P. So AP would equal PD, and so we can compute both those matrices, uh, since uh, only involves multiplication of matrices, you don't have to find any inverses. So you can check to see if AP is equal to PD. So if we compute both of those, you can see that in this case they are indeed the same, and so we can conclude that uh, our P and D are correct. Alright, let's look at one more example. Uh, here's another 3 by 3, and we want to know if it is diagonalizable. So we find the eigenvalues. Um, I'm expanding about the, the first column here when I take the determinant and uh, end up with lambda minus 4 times lambda plus 2 squared. So again, I, I don't have three distinct eigenvalues. I only have two. Lambda equals 4 occurs with multiplicity 1. Lambda equals negative 2 occurs with multiplicity 2. So we want to know, um, does uh, lambda equal negative 2 have, uh, uh, are we going to get two linearly independent eigenvectors out of it? And uh, when we solve a minus minus 2i times x equals 0, notice that we end up with this matrix in echelon form. And so we only have one free variable, right? x3 is free. And so we don't get two linearly independent eigenvectors out of this eigenvalue. And so we only get one. We're only going to get one uh, linearly independent eigenvector from the other eigenvalue, from lambda equals 4. So that means we're only going to end up with two linearly independent eigenvectors, and that means that A is not diagonalizable in this case. Okay, so we're into chapter 6 now, and uh, section 6.1. And uh, let's start off uh, with inner products. We've um, discussed this before, I believe, but we were talking about how to multiply a matrix uh, by a vector. But uh, let's hit that again here. And so the inner product is defined uh, on two vectors that have to be the same length. So let's suppose that u and v are vectors in Rn. The inner product, also called the dot product of u and v, is given um, by u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2 plus dot 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 un times vn. So we simply uh, match up the elements, corresponding elements, multiply, and then add them all up. The notation is uh, as indicated here, where there's a dot u dot v, and that's where the term dot product came from, just because you normally see it written like that. So for an example, suppose uh, we have these two vectors, u and v, to compute their inner product. Um, we just match up elements again, so 1 times 4 plus 2 times 5 plus 3 times 6. And so we end up with 32. So the inner product of two vectors uh, yields a scalar value. Okay, here's some uh, properties of inner products. Um, the fourth one I, I think is uh, the most interesting because um, uh, it discusses the inner product of a vector with itself. And uh, if we examine that, you see that um, u dot u is just u1 squared plus u2 squared plus dot 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 uh, plus un squared. So um, the um, since we're adding up a bunch of squared terms, then it has to be non-negative. And notice that the only way that it can be zero, and so it's always going to be greater than or equal to zero, but the only way it can equal zero um, is if each of these terms is zero. And since they're all positive or non-negative, um, they all have to be zero for the sum to be zero. Okay, so um, 
So u dot u is always greater than or equal to zero, and it equals zero if and only if um, u, u is the zero vector. Um, okay, on to uh, the length of a vector. The length of a vector, um, also called the norm of a vector, um, although if you go on to take more math courses, you might encounter the idea of a norm uh, later on, and there are different types of norms. This is just one of them. Actually, it's called a two-norm because we're squaring the entries and then taking a square root. Okay, but you see the the notation, the double vertical bars indicates length or norm, and it's just the square root of vector with itself. So um, we know what v dot v is, the sum of these squares, and so then we just take the square root of that. Um, in two dimensions, it's easy to see um, how this works. Um, so we have this vector, the blue one here, let's say it's v1, v2. Then um, we know that this distance here along the x-axis is v1, since that's the first component, and we know that the distance uh, vertically is v2, since that's the second component, and we have a right triangle here. And so by the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the length of the hypotenuse here, which is the length of V, is square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared. So this is clear um, in two dimensions. And actually, this scales, as you see, it scales to n dimensions, still use the same uh, formula. Uh, at times we're interested in finding the distance between two vectors, okay? And so we denote that in this form, dist u and v, and that's equal to the length of the vector u minus v. So let's see how that works. So here we have a vector u, and here's a vector v, and what we'd like to determine is the distance between u and v. So that's the length of this line segment here, the black line segment. Um, so let's examine what u minus v looks like. Well, that's u plus minus v. Okay, so here's minus v down here, u still here. And so if we do the parallelogram method to compute u plus negative v, um, we end up with this vector. So here's u minus v right here. And you can see from the picture that it's the same length as this distance between u and v. And so that's why we compute the distance between u and v as the length of u minus v. All right, um, we say two vectors are orthogonal to each other if their inner product is zero. Um, orthogonal um, is, uh, um, looks like uh, two vectors are orthogonal, means it looks like they're perpendicular. As you see here, um, here's a couple of vectors, 2, 1, and 3, negative 6. If you take the inner product, you end up with 0. And if you look at those plotted, then you see a right uh, angle there, so they are um, uh, orthogonal. Um, we say a set is an orthogonal set if um, you can pull out any two vectors from the set and their inner product is zero. Okay, so if I have this set, v1, v2, v3, and I will want to um, see if it's an orthogonal set, then I need to compute the inner product of each pair of vectors. So start off v1 uh, with v2, and uh, so I get 1 times negative 3 plus 2 times 0 plus 1 times 3, and that's zero. Then I'll do inner product of v1 with v3, and uh, then v2 with v3, and you see that all of those are zero. So that means that um, the set itself is orthogonal because we took all possible pairs and did inner products, and each one of those was zero.